The Iowa football season is over. The Hawkeyes falling in the Citrus Bowl, 35-0. to zero. Goose egg from the Iowa offense. And uh, we got about 500 people on our two channels already wanting to talk about the game. I wonder what y'all have to say. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. We've got Coach Don Patterson going to be joining us. And, and by the way, folks, keep in mind, this is the last, not only the last game of the season, this is the last post game of the season with coach Patterson. Please show your appreciation. Please take a moment to hit the like button, all right? Doesn't cost anything, very simple. Scroll down, hit the thumbs up button. It does help the channel. If you want to ensure that we continue to bring you this type of coverage of Iowa football, Iowa basketball and Iowa men's, uh, women's basketball throughout the seasons ahead, please do that. Simple thing to do. And you can also share the show out on social media. We've got over 500 people who are on right now wanting to talk, talk to Coach Patterson about this one. And uh, please let your friends know, your followers, your Hawkeye comrades out there that we are live taking phone calls, taking video calls, taking chats, comments for at least the next couple of hours. This should be a fun one in spite of the score. I think this is going to be a fun show. <laughs> I, I don't feel as depressed as maybe I should, or maybe I could, and maybe I'll have to explain why I'm explaining this this way. But before I get to myself, let's go to the guy we all care to hear from, former Iowa offensive coordinator, Don Patterson is with us. Coach, you're looking good on uh, January 1st. Welcome. Well, I'm at least uh, dressed appropriately, Corey. I've got my black and gold on. I've got Black and gold uh, pajama pants on, too. But I guess <laughs> you just have to take my word for that. Where do where do we start here, Don? Where do we start? Um, there's so much to unravel. The offense was a total disaster. Again. Yeah. Again. And we've said this so many times over the last three years. Where do you want to start? Because you and I have not talked, uh, but just for a second before we hopped on here, where would you start when you're addressing your team post game after this game? Well, I would certainly thank the, all those players that deserve a lot of credit for for persevering through a lot of difficult situations during the fall, being able to earn ten wins being able to earn the chance to play in a good bowl game on January 1st. And I would remind them that they're, they're certainly uh, a lot better as a group than, than what the score might indicate. Sometimes the score doesn't reflect all of your hard work and all of your commitment to the program. Today was one of those days. The, true freshman quarterback for the Tennessee Vols was really impressive and I'm not surprised in the least Don I know he's a true freshman he's a five-star kid coming out of high school the commentators brought up the point that uh, NIL was a factor in getting him to attend Tennessee in the first place so um, you know the, the kid's the real deal and my guess is that he'll play in the league someday but we this was his first career start I thought he was really good against a really solid Iowa front albeit without the likes of Noah Shannon without um 
Uh, Ethan Herkett, who was out today, uh, apparently due to an injury. Um, he was really impressive. Talk about what you saw from a guy who's six five, six six, but runs like he's six foot. Yeah, he's a, a good athlete. Um, you can tell he's. He, I say he's young. Maybe he's not a teenager anymore. I don't know when he's. I don't know exactly how old he is, but um, it's safe to say he's a good athlete. He moves well. Uh, he's still pretty frail. You know, I was hoping selfishly. Maybe we can bruise him up to the point that he's not able to continue to play. Don't want any, anyone to be seriously injured, but if it was just a a minor injury that might keep him out of the game, that would have been a plus, I guess, to see what the next guy was all about. The next guy, I think, is kind of a veteran quarterback that played for Hypo at Central Florida, the guy that was in the game late. So I give him credit. You know, we did a pretty good job of – putting pressure on him. And, of course, we generated quite a few sacks. Incidentally, uh, hats off to Joe Evans. Joe's got so much to be proud of. That was his last football in the game today, and he certainly um, made us all proud of how he, how he played and the results he got, not just today but over the entire career. And he's the epitome of what that Iowa defense is, just hardworking. Um, size doesn't always matter as it relates to – Iowa defensive ends. You think about some of the really productive guys under Phil Parker's uh, leadership. You talk about Nate Meyer. You talk about Joe Evans. Parker Hesse wasn't all that big. And yet these guys are mainstays. And, you know, I don't know what Joe Evans' future is going to be, but I do feel for him to go out this way. But you're absolutely right. He left everything out there. I thought, honestly, you know, th- in 35 0, we've been here before talking about a score like this. I honestly didn't think the defense played that well. They absolutely got gashed, or excuse me, didn't play that badly. They absolutely got gashed at times, especially in that first quarter. And, you know, you can't be given up. I think they gave up, what, eight yards a carry or eight yards of play in that first quarter, something really bad like that. They had never, they didn't have hardly any tape on this young guy. And we've seen Phil Parker coach defenses start kind of slow and give up some ground early and then kind of bat down the hatchet. And I thought they did that. I thought the defense gave Iowa's offense a chance late in the second through the third quarter to get back in the game. But the offense was completely helpless, completely helpless, completely hopeless. Eventually, you're going to give up more points. I mean, you can't hold on to the football. You're turning the ball over. And let me just say, this is not going to be a show, a rip fest against Deacon Hill. But I just want to make sure we're clear on something, Don. Deacon Hill cost Iowa 21 points. He cost Iowa 21 points. He fumbled the ball at his own goal line. He threw a pick six, and he threw a pick at Tennessee's goal line on a third right. down. So at a minimum, he cost them 17 points. But you can argue he cost them 21 points. Yeah, I would say this. If I had to pick one play that was the play of the game, it was the failed third down on the goal line when he threw the interception. That ball had no business being thrown. Uh, Nico was clearly well covered. All you do is you simply sail it out of the back of the end zone. We take our three points. At least we have momentum. It's 3 nothing Iowa. That's what should have been the case. Uh, the route was covered. Throw it away. It's that simple. That was a horrible decision to try to throw the ball. Uh, not just that interception, but the, the pick six also was – you're just wondering, what does he see? I mean, you, you've got to be able to identify the flat defender. Because he's if he's in a threat to be in the throwing lane, then you can't throw it. It's that simple. You can't guess. You have to see the guy and know whether or not he can get underneath the throw. Didn't you're, a, you're a former quarterback coach, offensive uh, coordinator, play caller. But l- let's take this a step further. If people want to choose to, you're, you're, you give us great insight each and every week on this show. But let's just reflect on the legacy of Hayden Fry. I don't know if there's anybody, with the exception of maybe being Kirk, anybody in the history of Iowa football that people respect more than Hayden Fry. And Hayden Fry was an exceptional play caller, especially through the first two thirds to three quarters of his career. I think you'd agree with that, Don. And I'm just yeah. curious as it relates to evaluating quarterback play. What do you think? And we're just hypothetically throwing this out there. What do you think Hayden Fry would have said after that pass was made in the first quarter by Deacon Hill into double coverage? Well, (laughs) 
uh, he might have, have asked um, me if I was on the other end of the phone, is Deacon trying to throw the game? That might have been what he would have asked. I, I, I laugh about that. That's obviously not the case. I wouldn't suggest that for a second. But I have heard Aiden ask that question of, of coaches before. Is he trying to throw the game? He, he's not serious, of course, when he asked. But his point was, that was a real bonehead play. I can't imagine he did that unless he intended to do it. Uh, and that was one of those plays where, um, you know, Deacon uh, himself, he'll, he'll ask himself a thousand times, what possessed me to th make that throw? Because the ball had no business being anywhere near that defender. And uh, it's just unfortunate that it happened. Um, Hayden would simply – Hayden would have been tempted, based on Deacon's history, to say, he would have been tempted to say, okay, son, you're done for the day because uh, there's no way I can give you a long leash anyway, and you've already fouled it up. You know, we have a oh, chance so to be. That is my point, Don. That is yeah. my point. It's not like Deacon Hill had built up some unbelievable track record and collateral in real estate. Yeah. Why does it take being down 20 Eight zero, costing the team arguably anywhere from seventeen to twenty one points with three horrific turnovers. I mean, horrific. These aren't even like it wasn't like a deflection or just oh you know slightly overthrew a guy. These are like I mean the pick six was almost like it was thrown to the defender. You have a throw into the end zone into double coverage on a third down and goal where you absolutely cannot. That's the last thing you can do is turn the ball over, and then you fumble the ball at your own goal line. Right. Why does it take so long? To give somebody else a shot in a game, explain that. Can you explain it? Well, I believe you told me the other day that the indication from the press conference was that Marco would not see the field. And why, so, would, why would you say that? Why would you say that? Can we just address that? I have not addressed it publicly on here. And this is me speaking, not you, coach. But let me just say this. Uh, and I want to, this is the final game, final. Uh, outtake for coach Brian Ferentz. Um, I want to say this. I, I have no question. Brian Ferentz gave a lot to this program as a player. He's given a lot of sweat and a lot of work and a lot of time to the program as a coach. I have no question that he's brought a good amount of production as it relates to offensive line play, perhaps even tight end play. But I will say this. Um, Iowa has given him a lot. So right. there have been a lot of over the last few weeks, these almost tribute like questions toward Brian and toward Kirk. And I get it. I get it. This is Brian's last game. He's a Hawkeye at heart. You got to love him for that. And it's Kirk Ferentz's son. But this game is the epitome of why this change should have happened a year ago, two years ago. And for anybody that still doubles down on this offense and on Kirk and on the philosophy and on Brian, and I'm not talking about Kirk as a head coach. I, I mean, I've talked about Kirk's job to get this team to 10 wins in spite of this offense and getting the team to eight wins a year ago and getting the team before that to 10 wins. It is incredible. Keeping guys together, not getting them to opt out. I given coach Kirk Ferentz his due, but this, this darn score here, uh, coach, this is a darn travesty. It's a darn travesty. And, I just, I don't understand. And we reflect back on the press conference from Brian um, less than a week ago. He was asked the question, is there a possibility we see even a few plays? That was the question, Don. It wasn't, do we see a quarterback change? It was, do we see a package? Do we see a few plays for Marco Linez? How on earth do you sit there and say no? I had somebody say to me, well, you know, why would he tip his cap? He wasn't, he wasn't trying to be uh, inconspicuous here. He was being completely honest. Marco was not going to see the field if it wasn't for three absolute bonehead plays and a 28-0 deficit. Marco Linez was put in an absolute horrific position in this game, all right, where they're in obvious passing situations every down. And what did Marco do? He went in there and played his butt off. He went in there and played his butt off, all right? And I have no question about it. I'm not going to argue that he through the football effectively, but the sample size is like this much for a kid who's never seen the field. What we saw from him on the ground, Don, on that, the longest drive of the game, 53 yards, the longest drive of the game orchestrated by Marco Linez in a 
in an impossible situation for a young quarterback to come in against a really good, uh, a, a really solid Tennessee defense that was able to tee off on that Iowa offense. For him to do what he did on critical downs and protect the football and become a running back, he showed toughness, he showed leadership, he showed athleticism, he showed a spark at that position that I have not seen as an Iowa fan in years. Uh, uh, maybe I'm just living in the moment too much. Coach, you go ahead and give me your feedback on – just the dynamic with Deacon and with what we saw from Marco. Well, I think even Marco at this point, if we could have him on here right now to talk about his day, I, I, my guess he he would say the way he passed the football was entirely unacceptable by him. Uh, he was a little bit off here and there with his throws. Of course, you could say the same thing about Deacon, uh, off on throws that, that certainly hurt our percentages on the course of the day. But uh, he also confirmed what we've been saying all along, that he is a true dual threat quarterback and that he can extend plays with his legs. He did it too many times to count today. So that's a positive is that we have a guy uh, in Marco that uh, can make something out of nothing, if you will. He can be forced to pull the ball down and still run for first down yardage. He did it any number of times today. So that's, that's um, um, good to see. It's what we thought he would bring to our to our offense, and he certainly presents that kind of option for us going forward. Someone that can be uh, not just able to extend plays, but they can actually be called on uh, as a ball carrier. I'll give you a prime example of the difference. If we were empty with digging in the backfield, there's no chance of a run being called. Um, if I were Tennessee, I would have that mindset. It's not going to be a key draw because they don't run Deacon with the ball. But with Marco in that same formation, you have to be concerned about key draw. That would be a, certainly a good play option when we do go empty with number 11 as our quarterback. And some of these were not like these were not easy runs to make, easy plays to make. He made guys miss. You're talking, I mean, he converted, what, a fourth and 15 on the ground? I think a third and long. And, I mean, we everybody wanted to talk about Joe Labus being an athlete and Alex Padilla was more mobile than Petrus. That's all relative. That is all relative to what we've seen. Yes, Alex Padilla was incredibly mobile compared to Spencer Petrus. Right. And Joe Labus is incredibly mobile compared to Deacon Hill. But Marco Linez is mobile compared to anybody Iowa's had since at least C.J. Beathard, and I could argue Brad Banks, all right? And I've hyped the kid up enough. You're absolutely right. Uh, two, he's not going to like the two of seven performance. Um, but but talk about being in that position, Don, being put in a game at this point for his first career snaps down 28-0 with the defense teeing off on you. How hard is that? That's certainly not an ideal situation to be in. Um you know, if we just had any kind of chance to still reel them in, it would make things a, a little bit easier. Obviously, they could uh, anticipate it's going to be a pass just about on every down. In that regard, the edge rushers could tee off to some degree and have a better chance to make a sack. Uh, so you're right, though. When he pulled the ball down and ran with it, he showed three things. He showed good agility and quickness. He showed good – I'm counting that as one. He showed good ability to change directions. That's two. He actually stuck his foot in the ground and, and made a, a radical change in, in the way he was running from one one stride to the next. And he made some guys miss. And then last but not least, he showed some toughness too because I believe it might have been that, that fourth down play you're talking about where he knew it was going to be close. And I think he got the first down by a couple of yards. Uh, but he had to he had to show a lot of courage to do it because he had to put his put his head down and 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 find a way to get it. And you might recall he ended up being flipped upside down with the tackle, but he he made the first down with a couple of yards to spare. Oh, and by the way, yeah. by the way, Don, by the one of the biggest criteria that we continue to talk about as it relates to this program and what Kirk Ferentz values is protecting the football. And Marco Linez got sent like a helicopter in the air there and guess what he held on to the football so got sacked in the backfield too and, and it, there was a chance for the ball to come out then but it didn't so i, I mean just, he did a good job protecting it. 
it's such a hard conversation to have because I get it from the other perspective. Corey, how can you be so avid about this? You're not there in practice. But Don, you've been on both sides of this as somebody kind of trying to analyze the game and, and performances versus having been in practice and seen the difference between how guys play in practice and guys play in a game. So it's not there's no possibility that we can be perfect in evaluating this situation. But Don, I have to say it, it just seems ludicrous given what we just talked about, given Marco's ability to move his feet, even if he is really struggling throwing the football. And again, this is such a small sample size. I'm not even willing to go that far that he's still really struggling throwing the football. Maybe he is, but Deacon is a turnover machine to quote uh, Des Moines registers, Chad Lystico. He's a turnover machine. And You know, Marco has not shown to turn the ball over, at least not in game action. Again, seven uh, pass attempts, had five, six carries, and never coughed the ball up once in spite of some really aggressive defensive play, given the situation, time and space and and place. I I just can't believe, and and let me go back one more second, and we can get to some of our callers because I know people want to talk to you, Don, but I want to go back to the comments made by Brian Ferentz a few days ago. Can you give me an honest explanation? an explanation as to why you would say to the media pregame that Marco is not expected to play. Deacon is going to go from start to finish. What advantage would that give you saying that to the media? It, 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 besides just trying to uh, undermine the confidence of a young freshman who's undoubtedly worked hard to, since he got here in the summer. What would be the reason for for making that statement to the public? I can't think of any valid reason for doing it. Because I, I had somebody say, "Well, why would he? Why would he uh, show his hand? How hard would it have been to say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll keep you guessing.' Instead well, of saying, "No, you're not going to play." By, by what he did, by what he said, he did show his hand. Right. He gave them every indication that it was all going to be about Deacon and no one else. There is so much that is absolutely dysfunctional about how this offense operates, and on the philosophy. And I just, I don't, there's so much about this offense that is unexplainable to me, completely unexplainable. And it's not just. Here's the disappointment I had. Here's the disappointment I had, Corey, when the game was in doubt. And the the, uh, analyst made comment about it about the same time I was thinking the same thing. Uh, This is when the game was in doubt. It was, of course, we should have been up to begin with, and we weren't. And then they scored to make seven nothing. And long about the time they scored the second touchdown, I found myself saying, maybe before the second touchdown, certainly after the first and before the second, I found myself thinking, why in God's name don't we go after these corners? They mentioned there was a, a young corner uh, that was in single coverage uh, a fair amount of the time, and we simply chose to not go after him. Think of it this way. How many balls were – how many times was our were our outside receivers targeted for the ball? We threw early to um, tried to throw early to Brown and hit on a couple, and 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 of course he dropped a couple. Uh, but we get back, even though the ball was on target, we get back again to making it as catchable as possible. There were balls that were fired, and I give Dickon credit for throwing them with good accuracy. But the point is, if the window's open, if there's a uh, a little margin for error with this particular throw we're about to make. It's okay. A simple example is a slant. I know one of them was a slant that he dropped. Um, it's not easy to run with speed and catch a football coming at you if it's coming at you with a lot of pace. And um, we've already, already established that Caleb does not have great hands. He certainly is an explosive player. If we can get the ball to him and if he can possess the ball, uh, good things can happen. He's he's shown us that in the past. But I guess my point is, yeah, it's a drop. But the point is, if you're in Deacon's shoes, make it as catchable as you can. If you can take a little pace off the ball and still have no threat of an interception, that's a good thing. Uh, and there were there was a time or two where the ball could have been thrown with a little less pace, would have given us a better chance to make the play. And it wasn't thrown... Um, at full velocity because there was a, a defender in close proximity. Our guy was open. We simply – and we got him the ball. And you, I certainly can't argue with calling it a drop because it is a drop. 
But the point is, make it as catchable as you can. And if you can take just a little bit of pace off the ball, that's a good thing. Hope that makes sense. Absolutely. And we've talked about that before. That's not news. We had the same issue. We right. talked about that same issue with Spencer Petrus. Um, at times, we talk about the same issue with Nate Stanley, and we're talking about the same issue with Deacon Hill. So what's the common right. denominator with all these players that came from different backgrounds and, you know, and yet none of them seem to realize the need to uh, reel the ball. And I thought Nate Stanley got away with a little bit more. Nate was Nate was a unique guy because he wasn't most accurate, never threw for over 60% through the air. He was tough. Uh, he could make all the throws. But um, you had really electric skill position players as it relates to TJ Hawkinson, Noah Fant, Akram Wadley, go down the list. And so those offenses were decent. And I thought Brian had some decent decently called games in 2017 and 2019, but uh, boy, these last three years, uh, the deficiencies with personnel have been obvious, glaring, and, um, you know, in addition to quarterback play, development, evaluation, all these things. So uh, let's go to our super chat from Lomansky. He says, to quote Rick Neuheisel, don't blame the players, blame the game or the coaching. Um, and uh, I'll say this, I sure hope that... Uh, during Kirk's press conference, the comment is not made. Well, see, Marco was two for seven, so that's why we haven't been playing him. You know, and I don't think he's going to say that per se. But right. like again, impossible situation to put your young guy in and and go back to the numbers, uh, fifty one total yards. By the way, gained fifty seven. He took a sack. And he didn't have a chance on that play. I mean, you're going to take sacks at time. He projected the football. I give him credit for that. Lemansky appreciate the super chat as well. Coaches ask Deacon to do things he was not capable of. Beth gets validated today. Thanks, Beth. 1,000%. And say what you want. You can go to the grave, you know, pledging your allegiance to Kirk Ferentz and this staff. Uh, I am not going to be missing Brian Ferentz on this staff at any point in the future. There, there is nothing that I'm going to miss as Brian Ferentz co with Brian Ferentz coaching quarterbacks, coaching the offensive, uh, the offensive unit, calling plays. It has been a disaster ever since 2020. Uh, Lemansky, appreciate this super chat. Uh, Double trouble, Dad. Proud to donate to the Swarm like you. Thanks, thank you, Lemansky, for donating not only to this show but to the Swarm. It is much appreciated. Um, Leon, uh, this is probably something I'm, I need to direct to you, Coach. He says, Deacon laughing on the sidelines ticked me off. Uh, it's not the first time we've had a comment like this made on the show. And um, I believe it was last year. Um, something similar happened with Iowa's previous starter, Spencer Petrus. Uh, I didn't notice this. I think he's probably referring to when Deacon was off the field and Linez had come in for him. Um, are we making? Is, is Leon making too much of this, or did you notice the same thing? Maybe the only time I noticed there was a conversation. Uh, Marco just came off the field and Deacon was talking to him. And maybe I'll, I'll give I'll give um, Deacon the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he was simply stating to Marco, um, you know, you're doing the best you can. Don't beat yourself up too much. You know, I've been there. It's a hard job. We both know it's a hard job. And... Um, Neither one of us have, have gotten it done as we need to. I, I interpret it to mean he was just trying to make Marco feel better about the moment. I Marco agree. was upset with himself on a throw or two. And uh, I think Deacon was simply trying to be sure, don't be too hard on yourself here because you haven't, you haven't been the one to put us in this situation. It's been all of us that played the first 50 minutes of the game or 45 minutes Plus, I think Marco came in with 14, 15 on the clock, I believe. Um, it was whenever that 28. How much uh, time was 14, 15? That was when he first came in the game. Right off that, runs for 10, runs for 17, runs for another first down. Um, and then on third and 17, we, we ran a simple dive play or a zone play, if you will. But why at least want to run the ball? That's fine because we're clearly going to go on fourth down. But why not at least maybe run a draw or a cue draw, something that's got a better chance than a simple dive play? If a dive play pops, that's that's great. 
but it didn't. Um, and on fourth down, Marco ran for the first down. Uh, several of those runs were all on critical downs and, and gave us a new set of downs. So that was that was a plus that he was able to get that done. I'll just say this, because uh, if there's any chance that Marco or anybody in his camp is watching this show or listens to this show later, let me just say there are a lot of Hawkeye fans that so profoundly want Marco Linez to stay put. I'm not saying I have any insight to think that he's thinking about leaving. But in this era, you're constantly having to re-recruit your guys. And there are lots of reasons why a quarterback or an offensive player in general may consider leaving Iowa. But I'm just I'm just speaking for a lot of fans that I talk to and engage with. People are excited about this young man. And I'll double down on what I've said so many times leading up to this moment that Marco Linez is a different type of athlete that we have not seen at quarterback at Iowa in years. And I have no doubt about that. All right. So All right. Uh, he's got a great head on his shoulders too. I felt that way about him from watching his high, his uh, high school video. I thought, I like this guy. He is very definitely a combination quarterback. He can run and throw. Incidentally, you see it all the time. I'll give you a prime example. The guy playing for the Baltimore Ravens right now, uh, that guy, he's not the biggest, strongest guy in the world, but he is a runner and he is a thrower. And he will make um, he'll make something out of nothing any number of times. He does. And there, and there are only a few of those guys that are that good in the NFL. He's one of them. Uh, he may very well be the MVP of the league this year. I don't know when they vote, but based on games up until now, he would probably win it. Um, of course, Mahomes may end up being more valuable going forward for the Chiefs, although the Chiefs do not look anywhere near unbeatable this year. I don't know if they can pull it off or not. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna doubt what Mahomes might get be able to get done in a in a key playoff game going forward either. But only a few guys like that. But uh, certainly the guy from the Ravens is that kind of guy. And I can't even think of his name right now, but you know who Mark I'm talking about. What was Lamar that again? Jackson. Yeah, Lamar Jackson. Uh, the guy's he is an athlete through and through. Uh, he he can extend plays. Uh, you know one thing he always does, which is what you should do, even when he's out of the pocket and a threat to run, he's still looking to throw. And he has a good awareness of where that line of scrimmage is. And I bet if you chart him, he'll go back, he'll throw the ball within a yard or two of the line of the line of scrimmage. And by then, of course, you really got a defense in a predicament. Do you defend the runner, who's a really good runner, or do you play, do you play pass defense? Whatever you do, you're going to pay a price. You know, if you if you try to attack attack Jackson, he'll throw the ball to an open receiver. And of course, now the race is really on because there are only maybe one or two guys that even have a chance to make a tackle. And of course, if he if you defend and continue to defend, he'll run down the field on you. And he'll make guys miss, too. So Marco brings that same kind of element to the game, I think. Uh, we were wise to recruit Marco. And um, and I would just reinforce with Marco and the family, uh, what excites me about your future going forward, you have a chance to be a huge part of the solution to the problem that we have. Uh, we have a key element in the solution. And that's to give us that same kind of uh, productivity at quarterback. You're not just, nobody is going to accuse you of being a game manager. Uh, game no. managers can win for you if you're good at all those other positions. But let's face it, if you're only a game manager, you better have talent in other places because you're not going to, you're not going to give us that, that wow play that we need from one time to the next. I think part of the reason why my reaction is so extreme and outward as it relates to what those five, six runs for Marco Linez, which were all really critical runs and several of which moved the chains on critical downs. I think part of the reason why my reaction is so extreme is because as I'm watching, it's just like we have not seen that at Iowa in so long. It has been so long since we've seen a quarterback that can slither his way out of a pocket make right. guys miss like even cj bethard i mean he was a good runner but he was not this 
really agile athlete who could hip and hop and make guys miss. And I think Marco is that. He showed that in a few plays against an athletic defense, albeit some guys were out of this game, certainly a defensive backfield. That's a subject we should probably talk about at some point. I was inability to take advantage of some uh, weaknesses, some uh, lack of development, or I should say lack of depth on the back end of that defense. Uh, Joe with the super chat. Thank you, Joe. Corey, how many balls did uh, Nico Ragini or Ragaini drop this year? Love your show. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate the super chat. I don't have the official number. I'd have to go back and tally. But, um, you know, Nico's struggled with drops throughout his career. Is that fair to say, Don? At times he's been good with his hands, but at times he struggled with drops. But I think it also, we also have to point out the, what you said earlier. He hasn't always been put in the best position by his quarterback. Um, he hasn't always had the easiest ball, most catchable ball, or catchable pass to make. And I acknowledge this. Marco threw one. Marco had pressure in his face on a slant route and he threw it behind Nico. That's not on Nico. And Marco right. wouldn't argue that it's on Nico. Um, just your response to, to Joe's comment, because this is the last that we've seen of, of a really impressive uh, uh, journeyman like career from Nico Ragaini. Well, I think Nico, I've always felt Nico had solid hands. Um, and so the obvious question you might have is, well, why so many drops then? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm recovering from what I thought might be COVID, but I've tested negative on COVID, so it's not COVID. So I, I, I feel better than I sound. Uh, honestly, a lot of those, those, <coughs> I'm sorry, a lot of those drops are tied into fact, Corey. If Nico has a problem, it's sometimes a, a difficulty in separating from a defender. So oftentimes when those balls were what you would count as a drop, it was in part because the ball arrived and a split second later, the defender arrived with contact on Nico. That's how some of those balls came out. Uh, it, it was a ball that was not completed, but it wasn't a pure drop sometimes. It was simply a ball that had not been secured yet. It wasn't caught as clean as it might have been. And with the additional contact that came shortly thereafter, it was enough to lead to an incompletion. That's um, that's some of those drops that you're referring to are in that category. And they're, they're drops. You can still call them drops. But it really tied into inability to separate from the defender. That was part of the problem. And wide receiver play has been a part of the problem with these issues that I, you know, we have said the same thing over and over again, multiple problems require multiple solutions. Right. I'll go on the record and say, I think the biggest problem with the offense over the past three years, the biggest problem has been the person running the offense, Brian Ferentz. That's my opinion, but quarterback play has been a problem. Wide receiver play has been a problem. Protection has been a problem. Yeah. Don, this offensive line, like, at what point do we just say we're not getting it done with developing these kids? Like they've had better games this year at times, but the rush numbers uh, in the FBS, like ranking wise is still 100 plus in the FBS out of 130 teams. As far as rush yards per game. I mean, a couple of years ago, we just kept hearing, well, they're young. They're young guys. This is an inexperienced group of guys. They're not young. They're, they're right. not young at all anymore. How would you evaluate offensive line play right now and where we're at as a program? Well, um, we certainly need better O-line play than what we have right now. Um, easier said than done, of course. So often you do see players that really uh, we don't have to rely on them until the third or fourth year. And I'm suggesting that a lot of them, of course, are going to end up as five-year players. Maybe they're red-shirted as true freshmen. Uh, one of my disappointments today, just to give you an idea of the analytics, and I did that Iowa knew this going into the game for obvious reasons. You know, um, if you um, if you looked at the 20 games that were part of that analytical breakdown, 10 on our part, all nine Big Ten games plus Michigan, and in the case of Tennessee, I picked the 10 most obvious games, eight conference games and then two non-covers that were the most competitive. In those 20 games, the team that had an edge on rushing yardage won 19 out of 20 times. So um, I, when you're going in, it is critical that we outrush Tennessee. I fully expected that we would do that. 
I say that in part because our rush defense is pretty darn good from week to week. And I don't take anything away from Tennessee's rush defense. They're solid as well. But one big difference is that they lost their 1,000-yard rusher and they lost their backup running back, both of which are very explosive backs. The third team guy was good also. I knew that. Um, but he never carried the ball more than eight times in a game or eight times per game. That was the average. So he'd never carried the ball that many times in any particular game. And today, of course, he was forced to carry the ball more. I don't know how many carries he ended up with, probably close to 20. But he had a good average. He was something over 100 yards, as I recall. I haven't seen final stats, so I don't know that. But my point is, I thought we would outrush him and we weren't able to get that done. And there's plenty of blame to go around, of course. Uh, you know, we simply, if we'd done a better job of sustaining drives, we would have been able to run the ball more. If the score hadn't gotten a little bit out of hand or a lot out of hand, we would have been able to stay to our game plan and, and do a good job of mixing in a running pass. In the early stages of the game, we did run the ball okay at times, and it goes back to that first drive that was, um, you know, such a lost opportunity. Uh, I think we ran the ball. We did a good job of mixing up running pass, hit some short passes for gain, I ran the ball effectively at times, I remember a fly sweep on third and three. That was a very good call for another first down. I believe Nico carried that, as I recall. So we did a good job keeping them all balanced, and now we're on the goal line. Uh, and, and here's another thing that you're not aware of, but one thing that was discussed um, in talking about analytics. Uh, looking at their 10 games, uh, the first touchdown in nine of their 10 games belonged to Tennessee. So, you know, my recommendation, if you can find a way to do it, let's score the first touchdown because at that point, we're putting Tennessee in unfamiliar and uncomfortable territory. They're used to scoring the first touchdown. If they did it in nine out of ten games, well, I know they did it against UConn because they beat UConn 59-3. to I suspect they did it against um, Austin P as well. That was the that was those were the eleventh and twelfth games I didn't include in the breakdown, so I'm pretty sure they scored the first touchdown in eleven out of twelve games. Um, so obviously, if we could score the first touchdown, that could make a difference because they're still young guys, and and whether they even realize it or not, this doesn't feel right because somehow the opponent scored the first touchdown. That doesn't happen to us. Well, it did. It, it could have happened today, except we didn't get the job done on the goal line. So that's unfortunate. Uh, here's another disappointment. I'm just going over the things that, that came back to bite us. Um, and I think I touched on this before the game, Corey. Looking at all 12 of their games, they averaged 71 penalty yards a game. Their opponents were only flagged for 40 yards per game. That's a differential per game of 31 yards. Uh, you and I both know uh, it, was, it was a realistic goal that we would have an edge of maybe 50 penalty yards because we don't draw flags typically, and they do. Well, today we didn't even earn much of an edge there, if any edge. The flags were pretty even, as it appeared to me. You have the final stats in front of you, Corey. I don't know if you do or not, but but we didn't gain an edge there either. So, you know, we knew what we needed to do to win the game. We simply didn't get it done. Uh, and then last but not least was explosive plays. Decent job containing them. I think they had one play that was 31 yards, as I recall. That might have been the only uh, super explosive play for the day, but clearly we didn't have any. So I, I, my guess is on super explosive plays, they beat us one nothing there. And that was another indicator of winning. The team that had won, when you looked at all 20 games, the team that had an edge on super explosive plays had won 10 out of 11 games. And I, I explained to Kirk, I said, we don't have to beat them on explosive plays. We just can't allow them to beat us. In the end, it didn't matter, of course, because the spread was too much anyway. But the reality is, I believe they had one and we had none. Yeah, I can tell you here. Um, they had a 31-yard rush by Dylan Sampson, and they had a, uh, let's see, 27-yard catch by Ramel Keaton. So one Explosive play, one super explosive play, and um, we had neither of it. 
yeah, Iowa had a 16-yard run by Marco Linez. That was the largest, the longest play of the game offensively. So um, we lost on both explosive and super explosive. Iceman 57. Thank you for the super chat, Iceman. Appreciate the donation. He says, let the name of Brian Ferentz be stricken from every book and tablet, stricken from all pylons and obelisks, stricken from every monument of college football. Let the name of be Brian of Brian Ferentz be unheard and unspoken, erased from the memory of men for all time. <laughs> okay, uh, there's some some humor in that. Uh, <laughs> you would be a little bit uh, exaggeratory there, uh, hyperbolic. But thank you, Iceman, for the super chat. Do appreciate that. Let's go to our phone line. We got a bunch of people who've been waiting on hold for quite some time. Let's go to our first caller. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach John Patterson. Who's on the line? Uh, this is James. How you doing? I couldn't get my thing to work again. Oh, James. Yeah, we're doing good, James. How are you? I mean, obviously, we're not doing good because we lost 35 to nothing. But, I mean, in general, yep. we're doing better than we could. And uh, Happy New Year to both of y'all, first off, just to Thank start. You. And, uh, Don, I, I appreciate you being on the show this year. It was an honor to have you back again. Thank you, James. Yep, but first off, obviously, it was a struggle. And I, like he said, I think I texted you, messaged you this after – Deacon threw the ball. Like I said, the same thing Don did. Like just throw it out of bounds. Like there's nothing there. Throw it out of bounds. Take eat it and take the points. Like you have three points at least. And yeah, he, and I think he threw it. And I was like, why are you doing that? You know, I've I've never played Division One college football, Don, but I would have to think that in that. I mean, he looks at that on tape. Deacon is an intelligent young man. Every single time he watches that on tape, he's going to say, "Throw it out of bounds." I should have thrown it out of bounds. But yeah. it's that split second, and some quarterbacks really struggle with split second decision making and you've got to be able to make decisions under pressure playing Big 10 football quarterback right Don am I wrong in saying that it's easy to to be critical of it but it's just a matter of in the moment how did he respond and in that case it was a costly response you bring up a very good point Corey it it sounds easier than what it really is uh, believe me it's not easy to always have the right judgment on whether to throw or not throw a football uh, that one appeared to be a pretty easy decision based on the location of the defender. Uh, but but again, it's easy for me to say because, uh, you know, I'm not out there uh, being surrounded by a bunch of Tennessee players and and um, with the pressure of, of breaking a 0-0 game open. Uh, not easy to do, I'll admit that. But that's what you have to develop within your game is that judgment of what to do in any and all situations. And right now, of course, part of the problem is just Diggins' inexperience. Uh, the sound judgment is not there yet. And uh, it takes time to do that. But that's that's one reason, you, incidentally, that's one reason you do make practice more challenging, uh, make it more game-like, you know, because at least maybe you can assimilate some of the situations you're going to run into in a game. My only response to that, Don, and I understand every player is different, but you're talking about Deacon's inexperience. So he has played, started, what, seven, eight games now. That's right. the first thing. Second thing is we saw some of these same issues in 2021 from Spencer Petrus after having started the entire 2020 season and part of 2021. So, like, you're, at, I agree with you. Maybe Deacon will turn the corner, and I hope whoever comes in here, if Deacon sticks around, I hope he does because he's an experienced guy you're bringing back, that, that he can be developed – to a different degree, but I think this is a developmental problem more so than just a young guy who hasn't learned yet. I, I mean, I think every quarterback on this roster, if if there wasn't hope for different staff and people who could develop these kids and teach them the fundamentals and help them to develop those quick strike uh, responses in the moment, I don't think there'd be much hope for the quarterback room, regardless of who's playing, because I don't think they're, they're coached very well. That's my opinion. Uh, I'm not there every day, but they uh, appears to me this is year really year four of really horrendous quarterback play. 2020 was not good. Go look at the numbers from Spencer Peters. They ran the ball really well that year and scored points. It was because of a phenomenal defense that created turnovers and points and because the running game was dominant and the offensive line was really good up front in a COVID year. But the quarterback play has been horrendous since the USC game, the USC yeah. game of 2019 with Nate Stanley, his final game. Yeah, and let's face it, you know, what we're talking about is a learning curve. Uh, some players have a more rapid learning curve than others. And it would behoove you, if you if you want to be a starting quarterback, 
you better demonstrate a, a fast learning curve because we don't have, we can't afford to take the time to give you uh, any more than necessary the chances to learn. If you're a slow learner, then we need to replace you with somebody that learns faster, somebody that can eliminate the mistakes. Instead of taking four games to do it, can eliminate it in one or two games. And maybe it won't cost us because uh, even though you missed an opportunity, at least you didn't turn the ball over, let's say. Uh, another example would be a receiver that is open. You don't throw in the ball. Uh, you ended up pulling the ball down a little bit too early and running with it. Well, that was a mistake, obviously, that you didn't make a throw to a receiver that was coming open. You didn't see him. You should have seen him. But at least it didn't cost us a turnover. Incidentally, part of our problem that shows up, one reason we're so um, so aware of turnover problems on offense is because we have not done a good job of generating turnovers on defense. And as well as we played this year on defense, that's a concern. Because good teams not only prevent others from scoring, they take the ball away from them too. Prime example is Michigan. Uh, Sam Steele is a good example. That guy's not very impressive to look at, but all he does is generate turnovers. He did. He generated two against us, as I recall. Uh, an interception in, um, caused fumble. I come to think of it, uh, he caused the strip sack, didn't he too? So maybe he had all three of them. Maybe uh, a hand on all three of them. So you know, we struggle with. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did they turn the ball over once today? I don't believe so. I don't remember one. No. No, they did not. It's hard to win football games if you lose on turnovers. And and for, for the record, Don, you brought up penalty yardage earlier and, and the drastic difference throughout the year, and that was one category. You almost feel like, hey, you're going to have a chance to win this game. You better take care of business where you're really good, and that's in uh, limiting penalties and penalty yardage. And Tennessee has been vulnerable in that regard. And, and you mentioned it uh, a little bit ago, five penalties for Iowa for 41 yards. And I give Tennessee credit with a true freshman quarterback that hadn't played much, three penalties for 30 yards. Don, how about this for a second? And, and we talked about the horrendous decision-making by uh, Deacon Hill down at the goal line at his own goal line, fumbling the football, then the, the pick six. But how about um, on the uh, – following i think it was a falling possession after the interception iowa gets the ball back and we get a delay of game coming out of a uh off a kickoff first play of the of the series first play of the drive and you get a delay of game how does that happen well it shouldn't and you saw on the sideline um i, I think both kirk and brian had suggested to the officials that the clock was wound too early uh, and that may be true but here's the bottom line if you're the guy taking snaps it doesn't matter when the clock was wound. You have to have an awareness of what the clock's saying. So if they wound it a little bit too early, you still got to snap the ball in time to avoid delay. Um, right. it, you know, it's unfortunate. I mean, it shouldn't happen. That's that's an unforced error. That's a five-yard penalty. And, and let's face it, even a five-yard delay, well, if we're having trouble making a first down needing 10 yards, what kind of chance do we have needing 15? It's even more likely to be – a three and out with that five yard penalty before we've ever even snapped it on first down. Uh, yeah. James, any yeah. final words? I got, I got Tom Caker got, here about to jump on. Yeah. Well, one, one more thing, real quick. Uh, a couple, one more thing, and that gets to my point. First off, you talked about uh, what Brian Farron said. I don't know if you also talked about him saying that, like, when they asked, like, why I know too, he said something about Deacon gives us the best chance to win. So that's why they left him at quarterback. I don't know if you heard that part. Well, he didn't but say, no, hold on a second. Hold get, on a second. If you're, talking about to play. Words, he, if, you, if you're talking oh, about Brian Kirk's said words, that. he said Brian best. Said that. Okay, well, Kirk said best chance to play. Maybe Brian said best chance to win, but uh, Kirk said best, ha best chance to play. Go ahead. Yeah, but one more thing, too. I was going to say we gave up, and then it's not on the defense, obviously. I know they're out there trying their hardest, but we also gave up 232 yards on the ground, and we only had 100 and what? Let me count to 73 yards. And of those 173 yards, that was 51 rushing yards by Marco Linez, and we only had 60 passing yards altogether. So Marco came in on one drive and almost beat our passing total on one on one rush on one drive. And I think that's kind of how he shows you a sign to where it's like it, maybe if he's in the whole game and maybe it's not different, but you don't know what he could have done if you like gave him more chance or more opportunity to play. Yeah, and by the way, Nico, Tennessee's quarterback, had uh, 
gained 51 yards and ended up being a net of 27 with some sacks. But, uh, you know, that's the other part. He brings a, a multi-faceted dimension to, to quarterback play. And I made the comment pregame, you know, having not really seen Nico play, but given his the hype out of high school and his five-star status and, and just kind of all the hype around him, I wasn't a bit surprised that we saw probably an uppage in quarterback play in general from the young man. And Joe Milton's an experienced guy, uh, has got a lot of Division One, Big Ten, and SEC experience. So I'm not surprised that Nico played well. But James, appreciate the phone call, sir, and uh, we'll we'll yeah. chat with you later. I'll let you get to your, if I let you get to your car, uh, and obviously it's not the way you want to go out. And Michigan already down seven nothing, just so y'all know. But I'll talk to y'all later, and uh, thank you for this season at least, and hopefully we can be better next year. Thank you, James. Appreciate your support, sir. All right. Well, we are here with Coach Don Patterson. I'm Corey Bratta talking about Iowa's uh, 35 nothing loss at the hands of the Tennessee Volunteers in the Cheese at Citrus Bowl. We add Mr. Tom Kaker of HawkeyeReport.com. Tom. There I am. I, I, it, always shocked, it always shocks me when I see my my head pop up there all of a sudden. <laughs> How's the tan going, Tom? Are you? Uh... Uh, I, I, did, I did sit out in the sun yesterday for about an hour and got okay. some vitamin D, so... It was finally sunny. It it rained down here a little bit, and uh, it was cloudy. Today was gorgeous. I mean, just perfect, except for the outcome, obviously. Not great. But uh, by the way, Happy New Year to you guys, and Happy New Year to everybody who's tuning in. I uh, appreciate everybody listening and tuning in. Appreciate that, Tom. And uh, I, I know people are anxious to hear what Kirk said post game, and I yeah. don't know where to start. I mean, obviously, quarterback play is going to be something people want to talk about. James yeah. brought up the uh, defensive struggles against the the rushing attack you know top two rushers were down for Tennessee they still ran the ball effectively behind yeah. Dylan Sampson what did Kirk talk about at least at the outset well I, let me start at the end because I talked to um, Jay Higgins about the the, the run issues because I, I I asked him specifically what was the struggle with the run fits because it it just seemed like they were off kilter there and he basically said there's and, and Don can speak to this um, their splits are just um, larger and it's just harder to get those run fits. And then you have to bring guy, uh, another guy down in the box because they're blocking seven. And then that's when they start hitting slants. And that's when they start hitting other routes. And, um, and, and that's where they said that, you know, it's kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul at, at times with that. So he said that that was a, that was a struggle for him to, to kind of adjust to those. It's a, it's a cat and mouse game that you play. And um, that's what they were doing there. Don, would you oh, agree? With that? Coach, coach, go ahead. Yeah, and and Samson is a good back. You know, even though he was yeah. third, uh, he had a, a better average per carry than the number two back did. Yeah. So he's he's above average as a runner too. Yeah. Um, quarterback Kirk really didn't. Um, you know, he was asked why he didn't go to Marco earlier. If they thought about going to him earlier, he really didn't. Um, say anything specific about that, other than just you know they they felt like it was time to make a change when they made the change. So, um, and, you know, I thought Marco gave him a little bit of a spark. The passing game wasn't there. Passing game wasn't there with, with Deacon. To me, I thought the game, I, that that first drive or the, the drive where Iowa had a chance to score was where the game was decided because um, Iowa just has such a small margin for, for error in terms of scoring points right now. And when he threw that interception, uh, I was like, well, oh, that's probably about ball game because they they just <laughs> not going to have that many chances to score. You know, it's just, that's, yeah, it's Tom, you're not aware, but I identified that as the play of the game early yeah. in the career. <laughs> well, see, yeah, great minds think alike, coach. Play was more significant than any other single play. Yep, yep, it was because it's just that they we knew they were probably at, only going to score at, at tops three touchdowns, and you lose one of those right there, and it's. That's kind of ball game for you. And then when they march down and score and um, and Nico runs it in, and I was just like, well, this is just – this is where the, the swings happen, you know. Um, and it goes from a p possible 7-0 Iowa lead to a Tennessee lead, and then they just kept building on it. And Iowa just – you know, it was funny. I'm sitting next to um, Scott Dockerman today, and just – before they start the play where where Deacon has the the strip sack, uh, his eleventh fumble of the year in nine games, I, I said to Scott, 
he's due for a strip sack here. And sure enough, there it happens. I was like, oh, you know, it's just it because it, that's what happened against Michigan. Those plays inside the five where he just kind of loses. He loses a sense of where people are around him. Um, you know, um, I thought Lainez did a nice job when he came in there. At least he gave him a spark of some sort. Um, you know, passing wise, there wasn't anything there. But there wasn't anything really from Deacon either. So Deacon did have some drops. Caleb Brown dropped a couple of passes early. Um, Turk was asked uh, about the offensive coordinator stuff too, and he just kind of talked about trying to find the right guy, the right fit for the program, and not necessarily rushing to find somebody. He doesn't believe in that, but he just thinks maybe you take your time and – you're you're going to find the right person and it's it's a person who fits with that staff. And he talked and and coach, you can speak to this because he, he said that pit staff that he was on that did really well uh, before he came there. um, It was uh, kind of a, the staff was all about themselves at times, different staff members. And he said, when he got to Iowa city, it was totally different. It was, everybody was kind of for the players, for the team working together, um, and there wasn't uh, as much individuality within the coaching staff, and that reflected onto the field. So I thought that was interesting, and maybe you can speak to that, uh, those those early Hayden staffs and, and what that was like. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it all started with Hayden, of course. Hayden made it understood this is not about any of you. It's all about our team. It's not about any particular player either. It's all about the team. And so everything we do has got to be good and – and answer the question, what what's in the best interest of the team? So for that reason, there was no no issue at all with, uh, I'll say it this way, um, and you've heard this before, it's amazing how much you can accomplish when no one is concerned about who gets the credit. And that's the way it was back in 1981. Uh, truthfully, it was that way in 1979. We weren't good enough to take advantage of it. <laughs> 79, but in 81, that was Kirk's first year. He's exactly correct. Uh, it was not about any individual on staff. Everybody understood that you had to do your job and do it well because you didn't want to let down any of these issues either, not to mention the players, not to mention your boss. So it was a great spirit of cooperation. And uh, and I do recall Kirk saying, because Pitt was a very, very talented team when Kirk was there as a GA uh, incidentally, Joe Moore was their offensive line coach, as I recall. Yes. Yep. His old yep. head coach, high school yep. head coach, I should say. And um, yep. Pitt won, but I think there was a lot of drama. I think Kirk, as a GA, was surprised maybe um, about mm-hmm. different coaches having different um, different priorities, maybe some yep. of which were a little bit selfish. And Jackie Shiro was that kind of guy, maybe, compared yeah. to Hayden. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Hayden was an old Marine, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, you definitely felt the team concept when you coached for Hayden Fry. Yeah, and that team, that pit team, Dan Marino, um, you know, Hugh Green, I think, was on that team. Uh, they had some uh, really good players. Was Dorsett on any of those teams, I wonder? He might have he he been right around then, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, he probably Dorsett, was. Dorsett was around then, and, um, and and for those who don't know, Joe Moore is, was was Kirk's high school coach and his mentor. I mean, it's, it's a, the yeah. number one football influence in the life of Kirk Ferentz was Joe Moore. Um, you know, it's, and he was a legend. I mean, he coached at Notre Dame with uh, uh, for Lou Holtz, and uh, just great. It's it, they named an award after him for a reason, right, Coach? That's right. Yeah, the, the award for the best offensive line happens to have Joe Moore's name attached to it. Yeah, yeah. Manski, appreciate this super chat. Uh, thank you for feeling Hawkeye's pain. Yes, played his blank off, his butt off. Uh, if he's referring to Marco Alinez in that fourth. Oh, quarter. Marco, yeah. Okay. I'm just curious, Tom, like, so, I mean, obviously, you know what the chatter is on social media and people sure. you know, pandering for him to play earlier. I certainly mm-hmm. was because, you know, I I'm in the same – position that everyone else is you're watching a guy in deacon hill who's turned the ball over and i think deacon i mean i i've had very limited i think i've talked to deacon once at media day he seems like a really good kid and it seems Great like guy. his teammates love him 
yeah. think he brings a, a good toughness to the game. He's gotten hit a few times, gets right back up on his feet, has made some heads-up plays. I think about a couple of uh, trips, whether you call them uh, yeah. his fault or the fault of his offensive lineman in the Big Ten Championship game where he gets the ball off to his tailback. So he's made some heads-up plays. The fact of the matter is right now he's just not very good. He doesn't protect yeah. the football very well. He fumbles the ball left and right. So, like, what we saw from Marco in the fourth quarter, albeit two for seven through the air, not great, and there's no question. He's a true freshman. He's going to need to get better with his accuracy and, and his passing. But with what he gave them on the ground, we haven't seen that sort of athleticism and um, just kind of that slithery type of escapability out of a quarterback since at least C.J. Beathard, if not Brad Banks. C.J. Beathard. Yeah, CJ Beathard was who I thought of too. Um, and and Marco's a big kid too. He's much bigger, physically stronger than um than Beathard was. So uh, yeah, I really liked what Marco did. I thought it gave him a, a spark at least. And um you know, the thing that I'll never quite figure out about this year with with um with Deacon is Kirk is allergic to turnovers. He does not, you know, that's the number one thing. Don't turn over. In Deacon, nine games, 11 fumbles, eight interceptions. Um, I would have thought he might have, you know, jumped at least in this bowl game. I mean, I know he's playing for 11 wins and that hasn't happened much in Iowa history, but after that strip sack, I would have, I would have pulled the plug. I, I really would have. I would have just said, you know what, it's let's just see what this kid can do and and go from there. Right. I would admit this. You know, I knew he was going to be able to extend plays. Talking about Marco, of course, but after seeing him in a real game against college players, he's a little more elusive than what I even expected him to be. Yep. Same. I found myself thinking, honestly, if. If you had to play Marco in an emergency as a running back, he would actually do okay as a running back. <laughs> yeah. He really would. He'd be able, he'd yeah. be able to be respectable as a running back. Now that's, that's what a, I don't understand. And just explain this to me, Tom. Explain the logic behind Brian Ferentz making the statement he did less than a week ago. Oh, that I know. There was no plan to even put him in for a few plays. Why I say that? And then Kirk kind of hinted that maybe they they did toy with the idea of doing it. So today he did in the post game that they kind of thought about doing something. Well, what's the logic I, in saying that to the media, if you're Brian? To just make it, make sure that um, we don't destroy take your, no destroy play. The confident, destroy the confidence of your freshman quarterback? Like, like it's or, been or done. Just, or just to stop stop the, the discussion, just to say, don't even talk about it. All that's going to do is light the fire on the discussion, Tom. You and I, I know. That. I know. Oh, I know. It is, and it has, and it, it will continue. So, <laughs> um yeah, that's how it works. But um, uh, I, I'm curious, Coach, I, I want to ask you a question. I could pick your brain a little bit. Based okay. on what you saw from Marco, what you've seen from Deacon, what you know about Cade McNamara, would you think about going in the portal and trying to find a better backup? Uh, because, let's be honest, Cade's been hurt the majority of the last two seasons. You know, he'll he'll be ready to play certainly by the start of fall. Um, you know, he's moving around pretty well right now from the ACL, but you have a portal available where you could go out and potentially upgrade your, your backup position. Would you do that? I kind of think I would. You know, I'm not sure I would. What I would do is let Marco know you're going to start the spring as number two. That's assuming that Kate's healthy. Kate's our starter, at least for spring ball. Let's just give Marco the one reps in the spring. But I'm going to give you because, reps yeah. uh, as a two. And I'm sorry, Deacon, we've seen enough to give yeah. Marco the edge over you. I would be okay mm -hmm. with that. And I would okay. explain to Deacon, it's still open competition. If you got a problem with it, then prove me wrong. Uh, but I really yeah. think that if you give Marco the opportunity – to excel this spring, he's going to take advantage of it. Okay. And in that regard, Tom, I wouldn't worry about if if Marco had to be our number two and Kate goes down in the early fall, I'm not worried about that because I think by then he'll be more than ready to do that. Or you can find out in the spring, you know, because Kate's not going to be doing anything in the spring. He's not going to be practicing really because well, he's coming back from the point. ACL. I think we so need to give, you get, give you Marco, Marco every chance Marco. to take the ball and run with it. That's what I think. All, we the, need to all the one reps, and then if and then you can make a determination at the end of the spring, 
hey, maybe we do need to go on the portal. There'll be somebody available. There always is. Right. And you could upgrade that backup position if you need to, if you don't see what you like from Marco. Yeah, the reality, because of Cade's um, history, it's going to be very difficult to attract um, a transfer because the typical transfer, of course, has only a year or two remaining. Uh, yeah. The ones that you really want that have proven themselves somewhere else. And in that regard, they'll know, I'm not going to really get an opportunity because this is Cade's team for another year. I'll be frank. I would not be shocked if Marco ends up being the starter in 2024. I would say, I agree. I say the, the only hesitancy with that, Don, is, and it's got nothing to do with injury necessarily to Cade, but uh, the only hesitancy I would have would be the fact that uh, that's not typically Iowa's very concerned with experience and Cade would be the epitome of experience as a super senior next year. But, um, you know, new offensive coordinator, Tom, do you have any insight on, I know you brought up the question yeah. to Kirk about the OC hire. Has there been any, I mean, we've, we've obviously he heard rumors here and there. Uh, a couple of rumors have just been bizarre and how they've started. Scott but, Frost. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that one was the most bizarre, but, but clearly Paul, Chris, Joe Philbin have been in the mix. Is there anybody else that currently you've, heard of that you can share that that uh, is in the mix right now or do you want to guess uh those have been the two most prominent names that i have heard uh and uh everything else seems like it's just kind of fizzled out so but he's talking to some i think he's going to be talking to somebody this week so i i don't know who that is um but um at least in the next week or so but it makes me kind of wonder if he's holding out maybe there's an nfl guy or somebody that perhaps he's looking at that um, that's piqued his interest maybe. So um, I, I do think he wants to get something done second or third week in January. And I think that's fair because then, um, you know, the players won't be back until, you know, after Martin Luther King day. So um, there's really no urgency right now to find somebody, but you, if you can get somebody by the time the players come back, I think that's a perfect time. I would say Paul Christ is the leader in the clubhouse right now, but does he get the uh, offer? Time will tell. Yeah, and, and if that's a fallback offer, I think it's a great fallback offer. I mean, a guy yeah, who I, understands uh, quarterback play, who has a history with run first offenses. I I like I like Joe Philbin a lot. I think he would be a very competent hire, but I think it would benefit Iowa football to have somebody who's kind of outside the Ferentz zone that could bring in some different ideas and different looks and different thinking um, about how you run an offense. And I think Paul Christ would would do that, but he could dovetail into the way that Kirk likes to play football. And I, I think there's a there's a good mesh there. There's a good marriage there that could could uh, could be very fruitful. And here's the other thing, um, you know, Paul Christ is a competitor. He is. And wouldn't he just love to stick it to Wisconsin and Minnesota and everybody else? Of course he would. Of course he would. He doesn't like the way that thing ended at, at Wisconsin. I'm sure he doesn't. So um, you got, you got to have a guy who's motivated, who knows the conference. If he comes to uh, back to, if he comes back to the big 10 and to Iowa, and Tom, my last question, and I've asked Don sure. this question privately, if Joe Philbin happened to be the guy, and based on what I've heard and what you just said, uh, it's been consistent. It's, it sounds like Chris is probably the favorite at this point, but but the race is not over. But if Philbin was somehow the guy, who coaches quarterbacks? That's a, um, Then maybe you have to make some adjustments to your, um, your staffing, I think. Maybe ha have to hire John Budmeyer as the quarterback's coach, and then uh, Philbin coaches a different position. I don't know what he would coach, but you move some chess pieces around, and um, you, you have to do something. You'd have yep. to do something. And and the, the only concerns I would have with that is I, I do think they need somebody who can give a jolt to the quarterback room. And let's mm -hmm. face it, we have not seen some drastic improvement out of this room since John Budmeyer took over those duties. That's 100% true. That's 100% so that would be a concern true. of mine in, in hiring yeah. Joe. I got Mine a lot of respect too. for Joe. Yeah. And Joe may have Joe may have a quarterback coach that he wants to bring in. You know, he may have somebody on his on his mind. He may coach call Coach Patterson. <laughs> <I don't think laughs> so. a, new, a, 
Last I knew, Aaron <laughs> Rodgers had quite a bit of respect for Joe Feldman. Maybe Aaron is ready to hang it up and bring his uh, his philosophy. That'd be all right. <laughs> That'd be all right. Well, uh, hey, guys, I'm going to get running if okay, you don't Tom, have any other questions, Corey. Safe travels back to Iowa. We'll talk safe. to you during, right. uh, during a basketball game, after a basketball game. That Stay sounds safe, great. Tom. Okay. Thanks. Take care, guys. Good to see you, Coach. Appreciate Tom Caker. HawkeyeReport.com over at the On3 Network. So uh, thank you to him. And um, again, we're rolling along here. Before we get to our, our callers, we've had a bunch of people wanting to talk to you, Coach. We're going to get to everybody. Go ahead, Don. You got something to say? I have one point to make talking about spring ball. Uh, let me ask it this way. Um, does Marco remind you a little bit of another Michigan quarterback other than Cade McNamara? And I think about Cade versus J.J. McCarthy. I think Marco reminds me a little bit of J.J. McCarthy. Um, not that Marco would beat him out this fall. I don't know that. But my point is I could certainly see him is a very worthy backup next fall. See, you because you uh, <laughs> you uh, you think that I'm trying to go get Michigan fans. You're the one who gets them all riled up, Don. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any Michigan fans who, for some odd reason, are still on this show as the semifinals are going on, they're not going to like that comment. But uh, I, I'm going to go – I'll tell you this right now. A 35-0 lot, I'm going to go back just to watch those Marco Linez run plays. Because I cannot express enough how excited I was to watch those plays happen. Um, I just, uh, I'm exceptionally excited about the future with Marco Linez. Yeah. And I hope it's a wide open competition. I hope what happens is exactly what you said. Whether Deacon wants to stick around or not, Marco, you're our quarterback heading into the spring. And then once He's our quarterback of the future. Absolutely. Yeah. And one, if once Cade gets healthy, hey, it's going to be a total op open competition when we hit fall camp. But Marco's our number one until Cade gets healthy, uh, unless Deacon somehow wins the job mid-spring. I think he earned that base just solely on his ability to make plays with his feet. And, you know, I had a back and forth with someone over text, a friend of mine, and I kind of called him out. I'm just like, you know, you, you know, he's talking about how, well, Marco hasn't made any throws. Well, first of all, he had seven attempts compared to Deacon's 18, plus every game that Deacon got to play in prior to today. And of all those games, Don, of all those games, minus the game against Michigan, that this might have been the next best team on the schedule. Probably was the next best team um, that Deacon has played against, with the exception being Michigan. And so, like my response to this person when we make this comment is you're really going to rip on Marco Lanez for, you know, again, five incompletions. I'd say at least three of those, he had immediate pressure in his face. And, you know, you're going to take a guy who's not throwing the ball. Well, not running, can't run in, in Deacon and who turns a ball over or over a guy who has not shown himself to be turnover prone and who can run and escape has proven he's above average with his feet. And we go back to 2002, Brad Banks. What's crazy is the first time I talked to Marco Linez, the very first time I talked to Marco Linez, Don, he made the comment that, crazily enough, I didn't grow up as an Iowa Hawkeye fan, but I modeled my game after Brad Banks. Right. I mean, that was the strangest thing to hear from a, not, from a New Jersey kid who did not grow up as a Hawkeye fan, but he made that comparison. So, not saying he's the next Brad Banks, but think about the success Iowa's offense had in 2002 with a guy who could create with his feet. And for some reason, we have been married to quarterbacks that resemble the Statue of Liberty back there. So uh, I, I just hope we don't. And, and what will Cade's ability be to run? Now, this is his second serious knee injury. You know, he comes back. Uh, how immobile will he be in his final season? Uh, not that I'm ready to give up on Cade McNamara, but boy, I, I just hope there's a, some healthy competition. And if Deacon leaves, I'm all for what Tom said. Go to the portal, go get a quarterback, and maybe make that clear to Deacon now, Don, that, hey, Marco's our guy. That way we give him an opportunity to leave before the portal window closes. Give him that opportunity to make a fair assessment, understand where he's at with this program. He got, boy, he, he got an exceptional opportunity to showcase his talents for seven, eight games. Give him an opportunity to go somewhere else, and then we'd know, okay, we got an opportunity to go somewhere. And even if we don't get a potential starter, we've got somebody who can help us in this room. And here's the other part of that, Don. 
If you get a hire, whether it's Paul Chris or someone else in the next couple of weeks, they can be a part of that recruitment. They can be a part of, of recruiting the next quarterback to Iowa and sell the changes that we hope will come that they will be preaching um, leading up to spring. That would be my two cents on the quarterback battle. Yeah, that all makes sense. All right, let's go back to um, our phone line. Let's see. We've got uh, Ryan on hold. Ryan, welcome. Uh, Ryan, I can't hear you. You're muted. I will say we're we're gonna kind of keep kind of keep calls right. relatively short. So uh, here, I got you, Ryan. Um, so I don't. We don't know just how much uh, Brian has a say in the decision for quarterback, but if uh, if if Deacon plays another game that I see, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I mean. It, 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 the quarterback decisions in this program have been extremely subpar for a long, long time. And um, I guess I don't know what I'm, what else to say about that. You know, why also didn't we uh, pick on that true freshman corner where I think, half their defensive backfield was extremely inexperienced and we didn't even try it. Um, that that's just inexplicable. It's called bad. It's, I think this is what it's called. It's called bad schematics and bad game planning. Frankly, that's, that's how I view it. And I, I go back to the same issues we saw in the big 10 championship game. When you don't take a single shot down the field in your last chance on the national stage as the offensive coordinator and, Guess what, uh, Ryan? Brian Ferentz, in his last two attempts as the Iowa offensive coordinator against two of the best three teams on the schedule. I'm sorry. Let's go three. back. We've three. scored zero points three against three the three best teams. teams. On the schedule, they've scored zero points against the three best teams on the schedule. And up to this year, what was the last time we have scored zero points in a single game? Kirk's second year, 2000. Coming those into are, this year. Those are mind-boggling numbers. Mind-boggling how bad three, the offense was. Three. And by the way, the Penn State game was played with Cade McNamara. That wasn't Deacon Hill. That was Cade McNamara. Now, he was dinged up. I get it. But the offense has been abysmal regardless of who's playing quarterback. And the other part about it is not playing the best player is going to hurt you know, existing quarterbacks like possibly Marco, or maybe it's a message to James Reeser that you don't necessarily have to be the best to play. Uh, when, when it's a mandate, and Coach, please comment on this, when it's a mandate that you have to protect the ball, and I'm sorry, I don't want to rip on Deacon as a person by any means, but as a quarterback, the sample size of what eight, nine games now shows that he can be a turnover machine. He is a turnover machine. Yeah, he doesn't have great pocket awareness. The good ones, they feel the heat and then they escape. You know, that's what good quarterbacks do, but it's it's not it's hard to teach that. You know, it's just a sensation that you have. You know, I'm feeling pressure off the right side. I've got to step up and move left. You know, I have to be sure. And for that matter, if I feel pressure off my right shoulder, I got to drop that shoulder and, and put the ball away from that from that pressure because I got to find a way to hang on to the football. You can always take the sack and punt the ball. Let's face it, we have a good punting game. If we have to punt, that's fine. We just can't afford to cough it up. And I guess where I get frustrated, gentlemen, is – I guess I, I got to call it gaslighting. You know, um, I heard the Brian Ferentz press conference that he, you know, to his credit did, but he said something along the lines of Deacon is going to play the whole game. He's our best chance to win, yada, yada. At this point, this is total gaslighting, guys. I mean, you, you know, two of seven, I don't care. Marco showed so much promise, and it it, it kind of feels a little bit like 
they're afraid to be embarrassed that they made the wrong decision and are maybe hoping for the best. I just don't feel that Coach Ferentz has shown that he has enough quarterback equity to die on, and I'm not trying to make a pun here, die on the hill of the given quarterback. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that, Ryan. And furthermore, furthermore, let me just say this. Uh, this is a quote. First of all, Kevin, thank you for the super chat, Kevin. He says, thank you, Corey. Thank you, Coach. Thank you to all the kids in the field. Maybe most of all, thank you, Beth Getz. Uh, I would definitely echo that. I have no animosity. Why, why would anybody have animosity toward Beth Getz for making a decision that she was forced to make by her administrator, her supervisor, her boss? Right. It was the right decision. I'm not mad at at Barbara, whatever her name is, Wilson. I'm not mad at her. This is ridiculous. These numbers are insane. And, and the scary part is, Ryan, if Beth hadn't made that decision when she did and Kirk was allowed to, to make the decision again, evaluating his staff, would it be any surprise to you if Brian returned for 2024? Well, I would bet my house <laughs> on it, to be honest with you. That's yes, and that's a big part of my frustration, Corey. It, I, too many That's decisions don't reflect what's best for the program, i.e. Ken O'Keefe retires and we make a tight end or offensive line coach a quarterback coach when you already struggle at the quarterback play. You know, you can say Nate Stanley, great. Nate Stanley as a sophomore was every bit as good as Nate Stanley as a senior. I didn't see a whole lot of improvement. I saw a lot of steady play. He beat the bad teams well and he struggled against the elite defenses or the very good competitive defenses. The three best defenses we played this year, we scored er, teams for sure. We scored zero points. We haven't scored zero points since 2000 coming into this year. Uh, at what point do we just say, hey, we got a big problem here? And I, I would actually not – and I'm – I would be fine with Brian staying on strictly as offensive line coach. Nope. Nope. Not anymore. Not I'm, anymore. I'm just, okay. Not I anymore. get what you're saying, but I'm just saying he's not a bad offensive line coach. Yeah, but that's but, not how this but, works. But Brian is not the full problem. What we don't know is did Brian ever lobby maybe for Marco Lyonez behind closed doors with Kirk and maybe he got Kirk's the CEO. What Kirk. Nothing gets past Kirk, and if Deacon Hill is the choice, we can blame Brian all we want, but Kirk makes the ultimate yes or no. But, but Ryan, nobody, I guarantee you, Kirk is not mandating that Brian go in front of the media three days ago and say, Marco's not getting any snaps. We're playing Deacon from start to finish. That's just a bonehead thing to say to the media. That's just stupid. It's all totally that agree. Totally agree. I'm talking more about decisions on – you know, who's know, taking the Ryan, snaps. My point is him saying that to the media three days ago is an indicator of his judgment. That's what I'm saying. Couldn't agree more, Corey. I'm just saying that it might be more than just him. Hey, Brian leaving is a plus for the program. Don't get me wrong. I would just love a situation where Copeland's gone. Barnett's gone. Obviously, Brian's gone. Paul Chris comes in as quarterback coach, co-offensive coordinator. Joe Philbin comes in, offensive line coach, co-offensive coordinator. We go find ourselves a wide receiver coach and see what happens next year. I really think that's the dream scenario. Am I going to bet the house on it? No. What, I, what I'm really hoping to God is that what we saw today, even though it was way, way, way too little too late, is an indicator that if something happens to Kate, it's the Marco show from here on out. Those legs alone would have given us some respectability in the final score against the really good teams. I don't really care about barely beating Nebraska, Illinois, or Northwestern. Northwestern. I mean, 10 wins. This was a 6-7 win team. Well, it really was. It was. It was. We game. played a weak schedule. Wait. This team in the SEC wouldn't be close. 
Tennessee was lower ranked than us, and they smoked us and then some. And I think it was poor planning. Um, obviously, the outside of Joe Evans and Higgins, we weren't real good on defense today, granted. But um, when the offense can't can't do its part, it's going to affect the defense. You saw that at Penn State. You know, to a lesser degree, I think you saw that with the Michigan game. So that's my thought. Last thought, Coach Patterson, and I hate to bring up a bad memory, but the, and I'm a big Hayden Fry guy, as you know, I've said many times. But it reminded today reminded me a little I bit. Lost you. Today, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Um. Today reminded me a little bit when we were talking about um, maybe bad quarterback decisions at, at that time. In 1997, we were crushing eventual co-national champion Michigan at halftime. I believe Matt Sherman broke his hand, couldn't Lucas throw, Trump. stayed in the game. We should have gone to Driscoll, to be honest with you. But uh, we, you, you stuck with Sherman. He threw the interception, the sword, and we were done. We couldn't run. We couldn't do anything in the second half because of our quarterback's broken hand. And that was my one big criticism of Hayden. You know, it, it, I guess it's that's just a reminder of how I don't understand how sometimes coaches, even though you might be the guy, can't make a temporary switch when, yeah. when let me take you back to the end of, end of that game um that was a great michigan team obviously they won the national title that year i believe our game was 24 21 as i recall it was a one score game for sure tim dwight played an exceptional game that day returned the punt for a touchdown on the last play of the first half returned the second half kicker off about 75 yards as i recall uh, they had um, Brian Greasy as their quarterback. Of course, they had an outstanding team all around. I talked to the defense coordinator years later who was coaching at the time for the New York Giants, and I had a player from Western Illinois that was playing for the Giants, starting party for the team, and uh, that defensive coordinator from his Michigan days, he said, Coach, I always wanted to talk to you about that last drive you had. In that game, we had a chance to win the game at the end. We were down by three, as I recall. <clears throat> and he said, uh, I warned my linebacker that I can guarantee you they're going to throw a wheel route to uh, Tavian Banks. And he said, sure enough, you did. And you hit it anyway. I warned the guy that you were going to throw it. And I said, well, he still didn't know exactly when we were going to throw it. You just mentioned that's one of the plays we were going to use to get down the field. And that's all true. We did. Uh, but on that on that previous play to the interception, on that play, uh, Matt Sherman's hand slammed into the ground really, really hard. And on that play, he broke his thumb. Matt Sherman didn't even realize he broke his thumb. In the excitement of the game, all he knew is he, you know, his hand slammed into the ground. He got up. Let's go to the next play. And to my knowledge, I think Matt Sherman would confirm this if you talk to him today. Uh, we're 99% we're certain that's when he broke his thumb, was on the play that required his hand to be slammed hard into the ground. And he, the point is he didn't know he had a broken thumb. He dropped back on the next play. The thumb was broken. Now he realizes it because the ball just flutters out in space. Linebacker picks it off, game over. So we simply didn't know that Matt had a broken thumb. And to my knowledge, he broke it on the previous play. I'd be curious if you go back and look at the video all over again, I think it'll confirm what I just mentioned, that it appears Matt broke his thumb on the previous play. I want to just share uh, my screen real quick. This is a, a chat, or excuse me, a, a Twitter post, a tweet, uh, whatever you call them now on X, uh, from uh, Sam Cooper. Appreciate Tom Kaker retweeting this and bringing it to my attention. Sam Cooper tweets out, he says, Iowa finishes Brian Ferentz's final season as offensive coordinator, averaging 3.94 yards per play, the worst in the nation, and the third worst yards per play by a Power 5 team in the last 15 seasons. 
incredible. Absolutely incredible numbers um, from uh, Brian Ferentz's offense. And, of course, he has now coached his final game at Iowa. Um, super chat here from, um, again, Kevin, thank you for this super chat. We, we hit this earlier. Bobby, thank you for the super chat. He says, thank you, Coach and Corey, for hosting and sharing your insight. If we were able to keep Marco at Iowa, he brings a dynamic not seen in some time. Thank you, Bobby. I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with you. Leon says the same thing. Marco gave me some hope today. And that's what I take away from uh, this game. Uh, Bellator De, uh, De Veritas, thank you being, for being a uh, premium subscriber. Marco was uh, definitely expecting to watch, and yet he came in. I think he meant exciting. Exciting to watch. He came in. Played his tail off. And how about this, uh, Don? Let me find the comment. This is a familiar name. Um, I believe this is Marco's grandmother who's in the chat. So, Maria, welcome. Good to see you here. And she says, uh, echoes the same thing. She says, what a thrill to finally see Marco Linez in. A little too late, but he has so much to offer. And we're excited to see your grandson uh, finally getting on the field. Uh, finally, you know, he's only been here a few months. And yet, boy, you see through his athleticism, uh, not to to bring up old memories, but the upside, right? The uh, the ceiling that playing a young man like this that has the athleticism and the ability to make guys miss can bring to a position that sorely needed mobility and toughness for a long time. And I think Deacon filled some of that need as far as toughness, but again, just too many turnovers uh, and, and just completely immobile back there. And, you know, the other thing about this is we don't know what Deacon will be like once he slims down. Uh, Kirk talked about that recently, that they're trying to get him in on a program to slim him down. But uh, Maria Linez, uh, you're absolutely right. Your, son, your, uh, your grandson has got the uh, the physicality, the athleticism, and the talent to do great things as a Hawkeye. Um, Charles says, Linez had speed. Would love to see him get utilized and get the proper coaching, 100%. Uh, Bob, thank you, Bob. Love this show. You think we will see changes to our offense next year? I would sure hope so. You're getting a new sure. offensive coordinator and maybe more than one uh, new assistant in there in 2024, Don. I know some fans believe that this is Kirk's offense and things aren't going to change. I think that's foolish to think that. I think the question is how drastic will the changes be? And some of that will depend on who they hire, right? Who Kirk hires. Right. No doubt about it. Uh, go ahead, Don. I was simply going to state one of the things I like about, about Marco, uh, I couldn't help but notice the, the announcers got excited. They were trying to, of course, uh, energize the listeners a little bit for the way the game might still be played out. But Marco, uh, you know, that kind of enthusiasm is contagious. In my mind, it seemed like the Iowa fans, all of a sudden they were energized because for, all, for once we had an offense that appeared to be difficult to defend. You know, we had a guy taking snaps and, it wasn't easy to guarantee you you're going to be able to rein him in. You know, he's he's even though he didn't throw that effectively today, and we understand those are his first seven pass attempts in college football, he still demonstrated a capacity to throw, and he clearly demonstrated a capacity to run. Uh, and it's you know that kind of that kind of playmaking is contagious. You know, the players on the field can't help but feel somehow, some way, Mark is going to make something happen. Um, you know, that's the difference in having a so-called game manager and somebody that can that can make plays when there's hardly anything there to be made. They can make a difference in that regard. Um, so that's encouraging to me. Uh, I, I can honestly see uh, him um, being so much more difficult to defend. You ask any defensive coordinator, would you rather play against a guy that uh, is a good thrower but not a very good runner? as a quarterback, or would you rather play against a guy uh, that's a double threat, maybe not the world's greatest passer, but also is a danger to run and throw? They would rather have the one-dimensional quarterback. They would rather play against a guy that is um, uh, a little bit of a liability with how he can run and how he can escape because you can gear your pass rush to find a way to get to him. Or at other times, of course, you can just – uh, drop eight and defend. Uh, it just depends on the situation, of course. But the bottom line, you don't worry about him being able to beat you with his feet. Marco has already demonstrated he's capable of beating you with his arm. He didn't really show that today, but I think I think he will show it over time. He's clearly capable of beating you with his feet, too. 
Yeah. By the way, the ignorant comment from someone that says uh, Marco's passing was not a pretty sight. He threw seven balls his first his first seven attempts of his career down twenty eight zero when the defense is completely teeing off on him. Give me a break. All right. Give me a break. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to describe that. I just don't agree uh, to her. I won't even put the comment up on the screen, but I, I, calm down. Let's calm down and give the kid a chance. We've waited through how many games of Deacon Hill turning the ball over on a regular basis and not being able to complete passes as a guy who's completely immobile back there. Plus the three years we saw Spencer Petrus doing the same thing for three years. And you're really going to sit and complain about, ah, I wasn't impressed by those seven throws. And even though he, you know, ran like a back, let's, let's just, I mean, I know you lost 35 zero, but that wasn't because of Marco Lenez. Um, D Hollywood. Appreciate the super chat. Thanks for the great coverage this season. Thank you, D. Appreciate you being here and appreciate the super chat. Do appreciate the support, Bob. Thank you for becoming a premium member. If people want to do that, they can hit the little join button next to the channel name. Let's go uh, back to our call line. We've got Andrew on our line. Andrew, welcome to the show. Hey, uh, long time listener, first time caller. Uh, I just wanted to uh, bring up a question in that I do have a lot of excitement for next season, but I have a lot of anxieties and fears with the changing Big Ten. We have a lot of, this is the first time in a season I can see a five or six loss season before anything's even been seen out, really. You know what I mean? Like previous years, if we've had a good offensive coordinator or a clicking offense, I could see an undefeated year. Heck, in the past decade, we've had an undefeated regular season. And with the changing Big Ten, do you think we're going to be able to adapt with that and our culture and everything? I know defensively we can, but offensively, do you think we'll be able to click in just one year? Well, um, on my comments on that, Don, and I'm anxious to get your thoughts, um, I think part of the big transition as it relates to competing with some of these high-flying offenses and I, I'm not saying that USC and Oregon and Washington are going to come into this conference and dominate, but no longer playing in the West, playing more spread offenses. Of course, uh, I'm pleased with the adjustments and the um, flexibility of Phil Parker's defense, you know, sending in the 4 2 5 and, and showing more versatility as it relates to personnel defensively. That's going to help, especially as you go to more uh, pass heavy offenses like what we see out West. But, uh, I do think having a guy like Marco, you know, I'm not saying that he's everybody else who's on this roster moving forward and in that room moving forward shouldn't have a look at the job. But I think having somebody that can move his feet is almost a must in this day and age of college football. I just I dread the idea of going into 2024 against a much more difficult schedule and the teams that await with a statuesque quarterback who can't move. I, I don't know. Is that am I taking too much out of the whole mobility conversation, Don? No, we've we've proven it's not easy to protect a quarterback, uh, and it does help if he can extend plays. It does help if he has the feet uh, to avoid sacks here and there. It's hard to play with a guy that doesn't have some escapability, and uh, Marco demonstrates that he does have that capacity to to get out of some tough situations and to andrew's point do you foresee iowa being able to figure out a way to continue to have similar success moving forward with the changes in the conference well i think we need to be sure that we have uh, a playmaker at quarterback i'm talking about a guy that can run and throw i think going forward and that's what most teams are interested in let's face it look at the four teams that are playing for the national title I believe all four of those quarterbacks have demonstrated they can run. Great point. Yeah, and the two, the the team that won last year, um, and likely will be the team this week. There aren't teams winning on the big stage that don't have palpable offenses, and most of these offenses are explosive. They they score a ton of points. Don, how many of the last few national champions? We've seen a lot of national championship games in recent time. Be 
you know, accumulate 50 to 70 points in a game. That's kind of the name of the game. Not that you can't win defensively. Kirk Ferentz and Philip Parker have proven that. But it's also been against a very favorable division, very favorable schedule. And like Andrew said, all that changes. Yeah, let's just talk about a team that's not in the Final Four, but that has been so effective here recently, Georgia. You know, you think of Georgia as being a muscle football team. Maybe that's been their history, but the reality is they also pass the ball very, very effectively. Uh, you know, they're a, a really good two-dimensional offense. They run and throw with great effect. Anything else, Andrew? Uh, nothing else to add. Uh, just uh, nice to finally call in and uh, been watching a long time and very much appreciate what you do for the Iowa Hawkeye community here. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you for the calling in. Appreciate Andrew being a part of the show and for uh, being a part of the show even before calling in. If people are hesitant about calling in, take Andrew for an example. Uh, don't be afraid to call in. Even if you got just a comment to make or one question to make, that's that's just fine. Uh, we got plenty of callers to get to, so the shorter calls are absolutely fine. And if I have to cut you off, please don't take personal offense. I've, I've got everybody in order here, so I've got you all lined up. Uh, I promise I'm not going to skip over you. We are going to get to your call. Uh, please be patient. Uh, before we get to our next call, I do want to give a shout out to RTI Threads. Talked about them. We've got a decision coming up from this man, Cooper DeGene, who was on the sidelines today, no doubt helping uh, Deshaun Lee and a young group of defensive backs. But uh, he'll be somewhere next year playing, whether it be back in Iowa City or in the NFL. Perhaps you can help the cause. Visit cd3lacesup.com and buy some Cooper DeGene apparel. Help his NIL revenue. Also, Aaron Graves, Carson Shire, Aiden Hall, Zach Lutmer have all entered into agreements with RTI Threads and some unique logos and merchandise slash apparel. Check it all out. The full roster of talent, rtithreads.com. Again, cd3lacesup.com for Cooper DeGene apparel. That's cd3lacesup.com and rtithreads.com for original apparel. All right, let's go back to our phone line. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach Don Patterson. Who's on the line? You hear me, Corey? I got gotcha. you. Who is this? Are you still with us? Yep, I'm there. Can you hear me? I got you now. Yeah, Trent. Hey, Trent. Hey, what's up, Corey? How are you doing, Coach Patterson? I'm doing well, Trent. How are you? Oh, man. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I've been better. Um, <laughs> well... I don't want to harp on this game too much just because this was a, a complete travesty and a joke of a football game. Um, what I do want to say is that I hope that when Kirk makes his decision on the next offensive coordinator that they get to get to make their choices for position coaches because as far as I'm concerned, only Abdul Hodge and Liddell Betts are the only two that should be able to keep their jobs going into next year. Um, it's this is more than a Brian Ferentz problem. This is this watching this offense is a complete freaking joke. And I'm usually optimistic, guys, but after watching this game today, uh, oh, Iowa football is a lot more than just football in a game to me. Um, I, I, I don't know where this team goes. I, I really don't. Uh, we might win six games next year, and that's being optimistic. Uh, we've let this program get out of hand. Uh, you won 10 games this year because the schedule was so soft. Um, guys, Iowa football is in bad shape. Well, um, I know some people would, would argue with you, Trent. I'm not just saying I I'm going to argue with you, but some people would say, well, how can you say that when Iowa's won 26 games over the last three seasons? But, you know, the argument can be made on the other side as well. Like I said to Ryan earlier, there are three games against top 25 teams this year. They've gotten absolutely smacked. They lost 26-0 to Michigan, 35-0 to Tennessee, and what was the Penn State game, Don? Was it 
Thirty one. <laughs> add, add that up. That's uh, let's see, sixty six plus twenty six. What is that? Uh, uh, you're putting me on the spot. Ninety two points. Ninety two to zero in in three games. So Trent, that's an indicator that uh, they're a ways off from being able to compete with the big dogs on a national say. That's a big enough sample size. But are you at all, Trent? Are you at all optimistic, or at least cautiously optimistic, about the fact that we are getting a new offensive coordinator? It, it, it depends who it is. Uh, I, well, it's going to be someone, whoever it is, is going to be much more qualified than who they've had for the last six, seven years. They, they, there's no question about that. I no, I understand that, and you're you're not wrong, right? I mean, but. Here, let me ask Coach Patterson this. You tell me who the one dynamic player is that we have on offense that a defense has to fear because we don't have one. Caleb Brown is good in space. He's not going to take the top off a of defense, at least until the offensive line gets better to give the quarterback time to make some reads and get the ball downfield. But I, we don't have that guy. Well, maybe one of the fr- – I'm not just – I know this is just – optimistic thinking and i don't want to cut you off don you can go ahead and comment as well but they did bring three freshman receivers in this past class uh jared Bowie, alex moda and um dayton howard dayton howard is a your big prototypical x at six five six six he looks like a tight end playing receiver alex moda was a star as a mobile quarterback in high school and as a tr- track and field guy so i'm not saying those are going to be the guys that that answer the cause down the field iowa does need to to uh verticalize their defense if that's the right word don but uh do you, do you have thoughts on that don as far as playmaking there's no question they need better skill position production well talking about caleb brown we've we're in agreement that uh he at least um has the potential to make plays uh, he's still got to be able to improve his catching ability obviously he's not a great receiver yet but we can give him the ball on sweeps and on reverses and um, by sweeps, I mean fly sweeps, and um, still have ways to get in, get the ball under his hands and give him a chance to do something. Uh, I honestly don't know. I haven't seen him on enough go routes to know. Can he just beat the defense over the top? I'd like to find out. What's amazing to me is that we really didn't attack down the field. I mean, we have a hard time sustaining drives. Well, that might suggest to you that you need to take more shots. You know, because if you can't generate an 80-yard drive over 12 plays very often, then maybe you need to make an attempt to make a home run, to throw the ball up and see if you – maybe there's an element of luck there that you actually come down with the ball. Uh, Or better yet, just pick receivers that can get – that can stretch the field, that also understand high-pointing the football and making plays. That's what a guy like Marvin Harrison can do. I realize those receivers are hard to find. But that needs to be our goal. And you've heard me say before, Corey, yeah, ideally they are 6'3". But the reality is if you're fast enough, it doesn't matter how tall you are. Uh, You know, some of those receivers that are only 5'10 that do have better speed are not so highly recruited. It gives you a better chance to recruit them, obviously. So my point is you can't find the perfect player. Maybe you can't attract him. Uh, there's something wrong with every receiver out there, but I would I would place a high value on speed and quickness, uh, and not worry quite so much about their height. I've said that before, and I still feel that way. Uh, Robert Smith did not have great hands. I don't think Robert would mind me saying that, but it's not as difficult to catch a ball with your thumbs out, like a go route, than it is to. Catch a curl route with your thumbs in when the ball's coming right into your face. Obviously, if you can cradle the ball on, on a deeper throw, then maybe your hands don't have to be quite as good. Robert Smith, if I'm not mistaken, had 16 touchdown passes when he left Iowa, not to mention any number of punt returns and kick returns for touchdowns or big plays, not to mention he was a great push man. And that's one reason we threw so many intermediate routes to guys like Dana Hughes and – who else comes to mind? Marv Cook. We had good push men when Marv Cook was playing. Marv became an All-American with the square out concept. It was a three-level pass to the outside of the field. Marv was the intermediate, intermediate receiver. 
Mark would be the first to tell you one reason I was able to be open is because our push men did a great job of pushing those deep zone defenders down the field. And it gave me more room to operate between the deep defender and the short defender. Uh, they have two defenders to defend the outside of the field. We simply flooded that part of the field with three receivers. And if they defend the deep one, then we move down to the intermediate route. The worst case scenario, if the flat defender defends that intermediate route, which didn't happen very often with a guy like Marv, because Marv understood, we talked about it as going to the hole. The hole is 18 yards downfield. He's going to catch the ball 18 yard depth. Good luck on a flat defender playing to that hole. If he does it, we're going to throw the ball to that third level. And now that poor guy's going to have to come react up and tackle the other receiver. Three on two. It's not fair. We had it down to a science. We did it in so many ways. Good teams do it. You see teams playing in the NFL. You'll see these four teams uh, playing in the semifinals. You'll see them use those same three-level concepts versus two defenders. It's just smart football. That's what you do. But it all starts with having a guy that can – push the top off the defense. Robert Smith could do that. And he had value even if he was only 5'10". He was explosive. He could run. And he had great courage and great heart. And, yes, you can win with guys like Robert Smith. We did it back in the day, and we'll do it again with those same kind of players. Anything else, Trent? Uh I yeah no I don't think so. Um, keep keep your head up, Trent. Let's let's see who this offensive hire is, and let's see what happens with the portal. There's going to be player announcements happening here over the next few days and next few weeks. So this should be a busy January, even though we're done with games. I know it. And the only other thing I I hope is that if we don't go in to the off season and just tell Cade McNamara he's the starter. I I agree. I. I just don't want that to happen. Uh, Marco showed enough today. I mean, in a, just a minute sample size, right? I mean, and a terrible position to be in. Terrible position yeah, to be in, down 28 ab- Absolutely. Um, I don't know. I Every year I'm, I'm overly optimistic, I think, and going into this offseason, uh, I feel the worst I have and, I don't know, 20 years, probably. I just, uh, with the new big 10 landscape, we're a year short or, you know, we should have had a new offensive coordinator last year, the year before, whatever the case is. But I, I think that Iowa now is so far behind the eight ball in this new big 10 landscape and this new whole college football landscape where let's be honest outside. If you're not one of the top 12 teams, there's no national relevance there anymore. Start next season. Um, I thought we could get there. I, uh, <laughs> a lot more changes need to be na- made than just Brian Ferentz going bye bye. So I don't know, guys. Uh, I love the show. Love what you guys do, Coach Patterson. Thank you so much for being on here, taking time out of your life to uh, to do this. It is appreciated. And uh, Corey, like I said, man, love your show. I think it's the best one out there. And uh, Go Hawks, man. I don't know. We'll see what happens this offseason, but yeah, we'll see. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the call, Trent. That man loves- I understand Trent's frustrations and his concerns. No no question about it. Um, like I said, I'll I'll uh, I'll still double down on everything I had to say uh, about Marco Linez. Uh, Lonnie, appreciate the super chat. Great work all season, Coach and Corey. Thanks. Uh, it's amazing how you get like an hour and a half or two hours into a show and people just immediately just start trying to be negative and, and find anything they can say. Even after we've had something that we can at least place some hope on as it relates to quarterback play and, and the passing game. You know, I see these people like Mark. Ah, Linez struggled to throw the football. Ah. You know, maybe maybe it would have been smart or wise to give the kids some snaps before being down 28-0 in a bowl game in the fourth quarter of an SEC versus Big Ten game. Maybe that would have been wise, Mark. Maybe that would have been wise. So, uh, and and to Seth's comment here in the chat as well, uh, Marco ran well, but do you think Tennessee was really prepared for a mobile quarterback when uh, they knew we were going to play against a statue and also had backups playing and were tired? I'm not saying Mark, I was disappointed to see Marco in, but he might not be as wonderful as you think. Seth, I've been talking about Marco Linez 
well before he ever played today. So I, I really, I don't need the lecture, but Don, do you have anything, any way to respond to that? Well, I think Tennessee had a good idea of Marco's abilities. They're not stupid. I'm sure they had some idea of what his strengths and weaknesses were. And I'm pretty sure they recognized he's a much more mobile quarterback than Deacon. Um, and they still had to find a way to contain him, and they struggled to do that. And by the way, Mark, nobody knows what you're talking about. Marco Light Hands. Nobody knows what you're talking about. Nobody knows what you're talking about. So you, you've said it a couple times in the chat. Move along, move along, move along. Don't care. And yes, uh, if people think I'm being kind of defensive about Marco Linez, I have no vested interest in Marco Linez. I'm a big fan of Marco Linez. I've said that before. Uh, I know Marco personally. He's a really nice young guy who's really talented, has been, I don't think, treated fairly this year as it relates to opportunity. That's my feeling. I'm not there every day in practice. But, boy, I'm, I am, for one, regardless of what everybody else wants to say, I'm extremely encouraged by what I saw in a game situation in a very difficult position um, from Marco today. And I wouldn't mind, even if, if uh, you know, Cade wins the job in the fall, Maybe the new OC can breathe some uh, new thinking into the Kirk Ferentz philosophy about playing multiple quarterbacks. There might be times where you could play both Marco and Cade. And, and Joe says that in the Super Chat. Thank you, Joe. Cade and Marco in a Wildcat would be interesting. What would you say on that, Don? Is that uh, a bizarre idea? I mean, Cade's not really a mobile threat. I don't think moving forward, I'd have to think that he's going to be limited because of his injury history, but uh, you you brought up the idea earlier about Marco and his ability to uh, run the football and make guys miss. Are you at all? Uh, I mean, is that is that an idea that you think is feasible? Utilizing him in a wildcat set. Well, the point is, if you have a mobile quarterback, you don't even need to substitute to have a wildcat formation. The quarterback brings you that that aspect to play anyway. You follow me? Uh, it makes no sense to have Kate and Marco on the field at one time, not really, unless we can demonstrate that Marco can be an asset to us as a receiver. I guess you could argue at that point that personnel grouping would make some sense. You know, Marco's given us productive play wide receiver, Kate's taking snaps, and obviously if we want to uh, maybe a, a more dangerous component as a Wildcat quarterback, then we could put Kate outside, and then Marco could take snaps as a Wildcat quarterback and clearly still be able to throw. The negative is that Cade might not project as well as a receiver. So in that regard, I don't think it makes much sense at all for both quarterbacks to be on the field at once. How about this idea, Don? You want to get real creative? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. What, what about the idea of uh, next year? Cooper DeGene comes back and you play Marco alongside Cooper in the backfield. I like it. <laughs> uh, I like the idea. That if, you were the, if you were the play designer and the play caller, could you work with that tandem in the backfield? Let's go back to the Michigan guy that won the Heisman. And he was a defensive player. But correct me if I'm wrong. I can't think of his name. I'd know it if I heard it. Our listeners will be able to – one of Michigan fans be able to give us that name. He won the Heisman. He was an outstanding defensive back, and I'm pretty sure he's. They spotted him on offense the year he won the Heisman. What Tom is his Charles name? Woodson? Charles Woodson. Didn't okay. he play? I believe he played some offense. Go back and check. I'm, I could I be wrong. I could be wrong, but I think he did. I think they spotted him on offense. We could do the same thing with Cooper. Yeah, I just it's an innovative idea, and uh, anyways. Um, let's go back to our uh, phone line. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach Don Patterson. Who's on the line? Uh, this is Brian. Hey, Brian. Hey. Yeah, I just got a, just a few comments. Um, yeah, I didn't agree with your last caller. I, I got always have optimism, you know, optimism going into a new year, new season. You know, you know, making the right changes, and you know big players get older and, get, you know, work and get better. So I always have optimism. I don't think that, you know, we're going to be as bad what everybody's thinking that we're going to be because of what they see. So if it's a new year, new things, everything's, everything's different. Everything starts fresh. So that's why I, way I, way I look at it. So. Long off season, a lot of time in spring and, and fall for things to change. And especially with, with new staff members. Yeah. You just forget what happened the previous, 
I mean, in a way, put kind of put in the back there, work on what you need to work on. But yeah, um, basically, my comments is yeah, with with Deacon, um, he had you know what eight nine games as a starter, and and my my philosophy is you either got it or you don't got it as a quarterback. I mean, the low intangibles that you, I mean, coaches say this over and over that that they can't coach, and he doesn't have that. You know, with the fumbling. You know, with the fumbles like we had today, you know, at the, you know, near the goal line. I mean, that's not a coachable thing. That's that's all on him. You know, you can teach him how to hold on, but it's up to the individual to not prevent that to happen. Either you either you got it or you don't got it. Is that true, Don? You coached a lot of quarterbacks. I'm sorry, I was focused on the chat. I didn't hear the statement. He basically just said, it, it, you know. It seems like uh, quarterbacks either have it or they don't, and we've gotten a big enough sample size with Deacon. Well, there's some truth to what he says. Some guys seem to have a knack for playing the position. You always hear me talk about being able to process really quickly. If you're not able to do that, it's hard to play. You can improve over time, but as I've also mentioned, everybody has a learning curve, and no two curves are the same, and you may not be able to afford to have a guy playing – that position simply because his learning curve is not nearly fast enough. You got to be able to learn from your mistakes and that, that would include mistakes in practice, of course. And that's why you hear me say, Corey, that's why you need to make an effort to make practice more game-like so that the learning can go on more during the week than on game day. Uh, learning on game day can be an expensive proposition. Of course, might result in another loss. Yeah, just just what I see. I mean, it's like they transition, you know, like coming out of high school. You know, there are four or five star recruits. They get into college, you know, Division One, Power Five conferences, and they just can't translate. Or they're top in college, you know, one of the top quarterbacks or everything else, and they get drafted high in the NFL. And they, you know, they get plenty of opportunity, got great coaches, and they just don't materialize in, in, in the NFL. That's why I mean either you got it or you don't there's certain people either have it will extra intangibles or they don't. It's just you see so many, you know, top guys with the, where they were before and they go to the next level and they just doesn't don't pan out. Then you got the guys that super on the radar like Iowa does great with, you know, and they turn them into five stars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's uh and I think maybe the biggest divide we have with Iowa football as it relates to what you're talking about, Brian, is the fact that we have not seen anything close to that level of development at wide receiver or at quarterback. And I think that's those are the two biggest positions of concern. If I'm talking about potential staff changes moving forward for Iowa, um, you know, they're going to presumably get a new quarterbacks coach. If John Budmeyer just gets promoted, I'll be very concerned because – he has not proven anything to me at his time at Colorado State as an OC, his time as Iowa's de facto C, uh, OC, or I shouldn't say OC, de facto quarterback coach. Um, and frankly, Kelton Copeland, his unit, Don, they had a bunch of drops today. Drops have been a problem since he got here as a wide receiver coach. He's a great guy. I think he, he his job should absolutely be – uh, scrutinized and he should be on the hot seat. Now, whether he gets let go or not, that's up for Kirk to decide, but you can't just keep guys in the staff because you like them as people and they're nice guys. They're good guys. I think George Barnett's a really good guy, but he's under some fire. I don't know that. Uh, I don't think Kirk's going to let George Barnett go, but, but these position coaches, um, some of these guys are not getting the job done. And I think you got to look at Kelton probably first and foremost. Well, one thing we do know is, it's hard to be really effective as an offense unless you're um, more than capable of running the ball and also more than capable of throwing it. And, of course, uh, part of the component to throwing it well is to be able to protect well. And, of course, the quarterback has to be able to deliver the, the ball to the right guy too. But um, And for that matter, the receiver needs to learn how to separate from defenders and needs to understand how to find the soft spot in zone coverages. It's complicated because it involves a lot of different, a lot of different uh, qualities and traits. Let's face it; part of the equation is uh, the play caller getting them into the right play at the right time. Uh, but the really good players 
even if it's not a great call, they can still make it work. Um, you know, the great quarterbacks can do that. And um, and the great players, of course, even if the defense is loaded to, to stop that particular play, they can sometimes make it work anyway. Bob, thank you for the super chat. Do appreciate that donation. And, and Brian, I don't know if we're kind of ranting on you, but th those are just my two cents. I agree with you that uh, there are times when guys just don't have it or can't translate their game to the next level. But I also think there has been a clear deficiency with recruiting, with development at a couple of very key spots because we've seen, um, you know, adequate recruiting, but average to below average recruiting at some other positions in which I was produced NFL guys that have just steadily gotten better throughout their careers. Yeah, I agree. And, and no, I, no, I, I know you now, but yeah, I mean, well, like, People are you're you made several comments. They were saying about Marco with his past. It's like I don't read. I don't. I, I didn't read too much. And you know what he went for? Yeah, he went two for seven. But like you said, the, the time he went in and everything else was against him. And I'm sure he was like super super juiced. So it, he didn't get towards to get comfortable with the passing. You know to get his passes. You know that. And he'll move forward. And be fine with that. If he had a lot more reps under his belt, he probably would, you know, would have been better past. But, but the, like you said, with the legs, what he creates so much, you know, extra, and that will help out everything. I think in the offense will help, you know, the line, you know, with a mobile quarterback that, you know, he's going to escape and, and, and move the, you know, try to move the chain. So even might improve the line play a little bit with this mobility. Yeah. One of the many you reasons know, why it made no sense to go into this game without the plan to use, utilize or utilize Marco in some spots um, that just made no sense at all. But uh, I'm glad Brian, we got to see him today and uh, let's hope we see a, a bump up in development um, out of everybody. If Deacon sticks around, you hope Deacon's a better player in the spring and in the fall. Um, because you never know, even if Marco and Kate are numbers one and two, um, injuries happen, and at least you have a quarterback with experience, but now the the real job here moving forward the next few months is just getting better, uh, getting better, getting stronger, and for Deacon's, on, on Deacon's part, getting slimmer. Yeah, <laughs> I totally agree with that, and definitely for him, definitely need to be slimmer, and then he might be, who knows, he might be more mobile if he gets slimmer, sure. so. But yeah, I, I agree. It's this time, but you know, it goes to when I'm confident that Kurt will hire the, the right fit for the offensive coordinator and has definitely the quarterback ex coach experience because the announcer even said, you know, with, you know, Tennessee still, it's a former quarterback and that's, you know, they got a good quarterback for it. Look at Ohio State. They, Kyle McCord left and they had a new quarterback and they, they look like Iowa's offense in the, their bold game. So yeah, they're, they're quarterback playing important. Playing a pretty good Missouri team, but uh, point taken. Yep. Brian, uh, appreciate you calling in, sir, and uh, we'll talk to you hopefully soon. Yep. Okay. Thanks for taking Thank my you, call. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Decker with the Super Chat. Thank you, Jeff. 15.2 points a game. Dead horse, but uh, 10 under contract. Dead horse, but 10 under contract. What does that mean, Don? Dead horse. Uh, I don't know. Ten under uh, contract. Oh, dead last, oh. maybe. Um, um, ten under the the necessary oh, twenty five points a game. Saying we're beating a dead horse. Yeah, ten under yeah. the contract. The firing was justified. Happened when needed. Brian was not qualified. Worse, not capable of play calling. Kirk put him there, and uh, President and Beth did what needed to be done last year. Couldn't agree more, Jeffrey. I have no issue at all anymore. I mean, at the, at the time, I thought it was a little bit of an odd timing move. <laughs> But I, I, anymore, I don't care, man. I just am so I am so thankful that they're moving on from Brian Ferentz. I'll just I have no shame in saying that. I, I just no shame at all in saying that. I just think it's a a move that's long uh, overdue. So thank you, Jeffrey, for the uh, for the super chat. And let me just see here. Uh, Mark Rogers, the voice of college football, uh, threw in a chat. Iowa's gone 163 minutes now of game time without scoring a touchdown. And um, think about this, Don. We talked about the three best teams in the schedule. Iowa getting beat, what, 92-0 in those three games. But how about postseason play? If you're counting the Big Ten championship game, which I consider to be postseason play, 26-0, 35-0. That's good for 61 to nothing in postseason play. 
you know, that's if you're if you're the head coach, if you're Kirk Ferentz, you you got to be able. I'm sure he is. You got to be sitting back and saying this is completely unacceptable. I mean, completely unacceptable. Right. It is. Um, you know, talking about Cooper as a possible three way three way player. Uh, Jeff Decker again. Notice on the on the um, comment, Corey um, Woodson in 1997. 11 receptions for a 21-yard average, two touchdowns. So that's 252 yards of receptions. Um, obviously, all 11 of them, I'm sure, came at a key time, two of which were touchdowns. Ran three times for another touchdown, 33 punt returns for another touchdown, and seven interceptions. If I'm not mistaken, that one in the Heisman. I know it did. So that gives you an idea. It can be done. Uh, I know people would say, well, Cooper got injured practicing on offense too. Well, that could happen practicing defense as well. And we're not talking about being stupid with Cooper, and we don't even know that Cooper's coming back. And, Cooper, I don't want this to count as a, a plea for you to return. But I'm simply stating if your goal is to be a candidate for the Heisman, uh, you have the capacity to do that based on – your excellence as a punt returner. Maybe we don't want to risk him on kick returns. Defender, of course, and not to mention as an offensive player, as a skill player. I do want to take a moment to uh, thank RTI Threads, their Cooper Gene Apparel, available at cd3lacesup.com. You can check out their stuff from Aaron Graves, Carson Shire, and <laughs> are all part of the future for Hawkeye football. Visit rtithreads.com. That's www.rtithreads.com and cd3lacesup.com. I wear my uh, CD3 Laces Up uh, hoodie all the time. Wore it up to Madison for the game on the road and uh, had some people come up to me and uh, as kind of a shout out to the brand and do appreciate whenever people do that. But uh, be sure to support the cause, the NIL cause for some of Iowa's great athletes and all these guys. Uh, we'll see on Cooper, but uh, the rest of these guys are all anticipated to be returning in 2024 and uh, i'd say at least two maybe three or more of these guys will have an opportunity to have a big impact with some of the potential departures we still haven't heard from guys like nick jackson that'll make a difference with how much we see carson shire aiden hall but uh, you know zach lutmer's got a chance to play especially if cooper leaves or jamari harris leaves so anyways rti threads.com and cd3 laces up.com by the way our rti threads player of the game don who do you think it is uh, I, you and I don't consult on this prior, but I, I'd like to get your take on this before we. Well, defensively, I would say uh, Joe Evans, and offensively, I don't know who I would pick. I guess you might tell me you're gonna you're gonna pick our backup quarterback. No, I but there, there is no offense defense. It's Joe Evans with the four sacks, off five tackles. I, Marco, I, I thought about that. I'm like his. Again, coming in in the moment he did and doing what he did, I just couldn't be more impressed. But Joe Evans, what a career. And this is a nice final tribute to him. He's our RTI Threads player of the game. Five tackles, four sacks on the day. You know, he's an undersized guy, former quarterback from Ames. He's an Iowa kid. He's one of the stories you love to follow. Took an extra year here. And I would not be surprised, Don, if he finds a spot in the league. I know he's undersized, but just with his motor – and his work ethic, I don't know where he would fit in, but it's kind of like Parker Hesse has found a spot as a tight end in the league. I don't know yeah. where Joe Evans – what What do you think about his pro prospects? Well, I wonder if Joe has any capacity to deep snap because I could certainly see him uh, – knowing him, he could learn how to do it. After all, he was a high school quarterback, so he should be able to spin the ball back okay. Just the thought, maybe that's a way to make a team. I do remember, I don't think Jay Hugenberg would have made a team years ago as a rookie. I shouldn't say Jay. That's not true. Joel Hugenberg. Joe was very undersized as a college center, but he was an outstanding deep snapper. And I think Joel would even indicate maybe he would have never made his first team were it not for the fact that he could deep snap. Uh, and uh, then over time, he became a starter as, an op as a center on offense. Uh, so... Uh, especially teams would help you to make a team. And obviously if, if Joe Evans could become a deep snapper, maybe that's a way to make the league because he's certainly proven he can make tackles. 
again, congratulations to Joe Evans for a strong performance, and he is our RTI Threads player of the game. And Reed in the chat says, Corey, who are the people you were referring to who would disagree with Trent? What what was Trent saying? I don't even remember the conversation. I don't remember two minutes ago what we were talking about, Reed. We're two and a half hours into this thing. But if you want to bring it up, I'll try to address it uh, as quickly as possible. Um, let's go back to our uh, call in line. We've got uh, college football fanatic Jackson was with us. Jackson, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right. How are you gents doing? Just um, just talking with y'all a little bit about Iowa football, what happened today, and keeping an eye on the Rose Bowl on my phone as well. Yeah, it looks like we got a 13 to 10 halftime score. The Wolverines up on the tide right now, so we got a game. Yeah, especially in the granddaddy of them all in the 2024 edition in Pasadena. You got but, it. Oh, yeah. But I do have a couple questions. One is for Coach Patterson, and one is for you, Corey. Uh, my question for Coach Patterson is, what were the signs that you knew that Hayden Fry was retiring after 1998? And are we seeing, and are we going to see those same signs with Kurt Ferentz after or during 2024? Well, I, one thing that comes to mind with Coach Fry, it wasn't widely known, of course, but Coach Fry had some health issues in 98. He was having to spend some time going over to the hospital. Nobody knew about it, but he was. And uh, it's just difficult as you get older. It's a, it's a grueling schedule. And Coach Fry coached until he was 69, I believe, and had a wonderful career, but I can relate to that because I retired at 65 and the only way I knew to do it is to work really, really long hours and go into every game confident that you've done more to help your team than what your counterpart had done to help his team. And um, Coach Fry had a great work ethic as well, uh, as did Bill Snyder, incidentally. And um, the fact that Coach Fry had some health issues, I knew – the end wasn't very far away. And also, it makes sense, as, as Coach Fry got older, uh, coaches were a little more likely to leave Iowa for another place. Of course, you remember um, Barry Alvarez left to be the coordinator at Notre Dame. The reasons are obvious. Barry was ready to be a, a coordinator, and yet Bill Brazier was not going to be replaced. But did a great job for years and years, just as just – as, uh, Phil Parker has, and Barry knew to be a coordinator at that moment. He had to go somewhere else. So off he went to Notre Dame and then, of course, to Nebraska and then, I'm sorry, to Wisconsin. And then when he got to Wisconsin, he was able to recruit Dan McCarney and Bernie Wyatt. So we lost other good coaches. Uh, guys like Kirk, of course, uh, left. And um, those are just a few of the outstanding coaches we had that left us for other opportunities. And uh, we didn't fault any of them for leaving because in every case, they bettered their family situation than what they had. So um, we haven't lost many coaches at all in recent years. Uh, you might argue one reason we haven't is because we we paid them a really competitive salary uh, compared to opportunities they might have somewhere else. It's hard, they're hard-pressed to go somewhere else just for more money because maybe they can't qualify for a job that'll pay them any better than the one they have right here in Iowa. Obviously, one reason they stay is because they have great loyalty to Kirk, to Kirk because Kirk's a, a wonderful man to work for and to work with. And um, for those kind of reasons, we haven't seen uh, an exodus of coaches, an exit of coaches. Um, but, uh, you know, Kirk's getting a little bit advanced in his years. The one thing I'm sure of is that some of them programs we recruit against are quick to acknowledge, just as they did with Hayden. You know, Hayden Fry's a Hall of Fame coach, but how long do you think Hayden Fry can coach? My gosh, he's almost 70 already. What makes you think he's going to be there to coach you for the next few years? I do recall Coach Fry promising Tim Dwight, Tim, I'm going to be right there throughout your career. Uh, and he was. He, stu he stuck to his word. Uh, but obviously, as you get older, Players recognize it, the coach may want to be there, but 
his own health may do him in. You know, he might not be able to continue coaching because it's a a very uh, challenging occupation in that regard. You have to put in a lot of time to do it really well. Yeah, and um, I, I will be keeping an eye on the Kurt Ferentz uh, situation because he will be turning 69 on August 1st. So that is something to keep an eye on. And my question for Corey is, is Joe Philbin still going to be the OC at Iowa, or are we just kind of in wait and see mode? What do you mean, still going to be the OC? Well, because I thought he was going to be like the next offensive coordinator at Iowa. Well, that yeah, that was never that was never the case. That okay. was never factual information. That was being reported, and that was non-factual information. So. Is Joe Philbin in the mix? Yes. Is he um, the guy that I'm guessing gets the job? No. Would I be well, shocked if he gets hired? No. But he's Kirk hasn't even made a decision yet, and Kirk is. Tom alluded to it earlier. Kirk has got at least one, I think, two visits with coaches coming up. You know, the rest of either this week or I'm, I'm guessing this week for both of them. But uh, he hasn't even made a decision yet. So, so maybe Philbin, but I would guess it's going to be someone else. Maybe Chris or maybe someone else that we haven't talked about yet. Well, I do I do have a suggestion for Nets head coach when that day comes when Kurt Ferentz decides he's going to hang it up at Iowa. Okay. Chris Kleiman at Kansas State because he always knows how to adjust. I mean, I, I saw what he did in 2022. No Adrian Martinez. Not, not Adrian Mar uh, Martinez. I yep. forget his first name. But yeah, no Adrian. Martinez, no problem. Will Howard it is. Yep. And as we saw in the Pop-Tarts Bowl, no Howard, no problem. We, we got our Nets man up at QB. I, I would have no issue with Chris Kleiman. Don, I know you got a lot of respect for what he's done at Kansas State as well. Excellent, Coach. And it goes back beyond K-State, of course. Great yep. things at North Dakota State, too. Yep. Yeah, well, Jackson, he was born in the state of Iowa, so that's another bonus there. Strong connections. There are a lot of guys that have strong connections to the state of Iowa. He's one. Dana Holmgren's another. I'm not saying Dana Holmgren's a great option. Um, you know, he runs ran a totally different style of offense down at West Virginia and at uh, Houston, but he's from Davenport originally. So, Jackson, I appreciate the phone call, sir. Enjoy the second half. Uh, roll Tide. <laughs> roll Tide at Go Hawkeyes. I'm sorry that you guys lost to Tennessee today. And I'll be honest with you, I, I wasn't too happy when I saw Tennessee beating up on you guys. But Coach Patterson, it was an honor getting to talk with you, man. And Connor, I mean, uh, Corey, it's great talk with you. And Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you, sir. We'll talk to you soon. Appreciate Jackson being here. He's very, very prevalent over at the uh, Mark Rogers channel. And I appreciate Jackson also very uh, earnestly and uh, loyally promoting Mark's stuff over on Twitter. So uh, more people did that. Uh, boy, Mark could really, Mark and I could really uh, do great things. Uh, Mark's already doing great things. But anyways, appreciate Jackson promoting things. Reed responded to my question. He says the offensive problems go far beyond having a mobile quarterback. The scheme is terrible. There is no offensive identity. When did I ever argue that? I I've never said that it all comes down to a, having a mobile quarterback. Uh, you're, you're right. I, I don't know that I ever argued with anybody on that, but yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Mike says, uh, when I called into Hawkeye of the Storm, by the way, it's from the Hawkeye of the Storm. We'll make that very clear. From the Hawkeye of the Storm. It's not H-O-T-S. It's not HOTS. It's F-T HOTS. Uh, from, from the Hawkeye of the Storm. When he called in about the 2024 Big Ten schedule, he said that Troy was probably a loss. I got raked over the coals for it. Mike, if you called in and said it this time, I'd rake you over the coals for it. Because it's a ridiculous take to say that Troy is going to be Troy. I expect Troy to be coming to beat Iowa next year. Maybe they will, but I mean, can you imagine if Troy Kate was the favorite early in 2024 against Iowa in Kinnick, Don? Can you imagine? Uh, Mike, I, I recommend you do this. Why don't you go ahead and bet your farm? Because you may <laughs> well, lose your farm. If Mike had a farm to bet, um, he's probably already betted on the national champ or the uh, national semifinal game, and his Michigan Wolverines right now at halftime are up by three. So uh, he's going to be actually just started the second half. Alabama with the ball. Or Mike, uh, let me say this about Mike. With all due respect, Mike, you don't know your butt from third base. 
Uh, all right. Well, that was appreciate that. Jay uh, says Corey show will help us through these dark days. Unfortunately, there will be much more with new conference alignments. <laughs> all right. Now I'm, I'm done with the sadness and the tears. We're back, Don. So uh, even though we're, we're looking towards a dark and dismal future, we're still here. So at least he complimented the show, right, Don? He's acknowledging that this show is going to help us through these dark times ahead. Uh, Chad wants to know if Eric all can come back, if he's eligible, he's absolutely eligible to come back. I don't expect him to come back. I expect him to declare for the draft. Those decisions have still not been made. We're awaiting decisions, announcements from Quinn Schulte, Sebastian Castro, Eric, all uh, Cooper DeGene, And uh, I mentioned Quinn Schulte, who am I missing there? I believe that's all right. Um, of course, Tory Taylor's gone. Joe Evans is gone. Nico Rakaini is gone. Uh, I'm sure there's other people. Spencer Petrus is gone. I did see Spencer on the sidelines today, Don. Did you see him down there? I didn't, but I have to admit I wasn't looking for him. Well, good for him, though, because he's already transferred to Utah State, but it's good to see he's on the sidelines still uh, braving out his time as, as, Iowa's, as Iowa's leader. Um, M. Finn says, uh, let's see here. How great would it have been if Marco had gotten in a couple games during the season, get his feet wet, give him a chance to shake off the jitters? I know you agree with that, Don. <laughs> yeah, that was when we made the comment before the game. I said, think of it this way. Their rookie quarterback, their freshman quarterback, has actually played in four games. He's had 26 pass attempts. Uh, I believe he had 54. I saw some smart Tennessee writers say, no, it's 52. Well, what, what that fan doesn't realize 52 plays does not mean 52 snaps. A couple of plays involving penalties, the play might not count as a play, of course. It was a penalty, and that's how you end up with maybe two more snaps. Uh, but anyway, we studied all those snaps. My point is, he got his feet wet in four different games. Imagine, is it hard to imagine that if Marco had played four games and gotten his feet wet in those four games, that he might not play better today than what he did? Um, not hard for me to imagine that it might have translated into better play today. Brandon, is the Cooper DeGene hoodie still available at cd3lacesup.com? It absolutely is. In fact, you can see it on my screen. I'll throw it up here. Um, here is one of the uh, many CD3 Laces Up um, apparel items, the official licensed, officially licensed Cooper DeGene, a Nike thermal, Thermafit pullover fleece hoodie. Get all that out in one, one sentence, one shot. Uh, again, cd3lacesup.com. You can select your size. And I've got one that I, again, I wear all the time. Um, great stuff. And then you can see all the uh, merchandise for Cooper. He's got golf balls as well if you're a golfer. Uh, he's got the It Wasn't a Fair Catch shirt. I've seen a lot of those. So all available at cd3lacesup.com. Um, okay, let's go back to our next caller. We have got uh, Erica on, and then we've got Doug Let's go to Erica first. Erica, welcome. Hi. How are you guys doing? Doing good. How are you? Uh, <laughs> you calmed down I think, a little bit? I'm guessing you were a little bit upset during the game at times. You know, it's funny. Um, the first half, I was like, I don't know if anyone saw me on Twitter, but I created this hashtag, let my news play. And I was trying to get everybody to, t to tweet it or exit or whatever the verb is now. And uh, I got some people to do it, but... So I was mad the first half, and then by the time they were about to let Marco in, like a few a few plays before they let Marco in, I was like, okay, it's over, whatever, like <laughs> whatever. I, and and it's sad to me because that's kind of how I feel about it now in general. I'm just not having that spark about Iowa because I feel like some hard discussions need to be had, and I don't feel like those are going to happen. I just honestly, my faith in Kirk and his decisions is a little bit shaken up right now. Um, I feel like Brian should have been gone last year. I've said that ad nauseum here and on, on Mark's channels as well. We don't I need agree. to go into that again. I know you agree with it, but let's not beat, you know, dead horse, whatever. I but, think you should have been gone two years ago, by the way, Erica. Well, yeah, me too, actually. Me too. But I mean, I mean you knew it was going to be a disaster when they announced he was the QB's coach. And he's like, oh, I don't even know anything about QB's or however he said it. You know, that was yeah, a he disaster. That. He just said he, he, he really doesn't know anything about throwing a football. 
That's what he said. Oh, is that how he said it? I don't remember anymore. But he pretty much admitted without admitting it, he knows no, nothing about QBs. Hey, so real I mean, quick, Erica, can we go through the – just because I'm feeling spicy here for a minute. Can we go through some of our top BF uh, hits, our top Brian Ferentz hits over the last few years? Like what would you rank as – like there's – what uh, when when the question was asked, what would be the downside of playing Alex Padilla? His response was, "What would be the upside?" Right. right. Um, you got the backyard quarterback. We don't want a backyard quarterback uh, playing in our system. Yeah, we don't want to play backyard football, Mar- right? Yeah, b- backyard football. Uh, that's kind of like what Marco Ilanez did for a while, and he created the biggest drive of the game today. Um, you right. know, you think about the comments here made a few days ago that uh, <laughs> Deacon has great. This is what he said. Deacon has great some played some great football for us. Somebody, please show me the tape of when Deacon has played some great football for us, Don. Please, yeah. that, that's what Ryan said. Please, someone show me the tape of that. And you know how many blunders have? It seems like every single year, either Kirk or Brian make a statement that I think is somewhat deflating and disrespectful to the backup. Whether you talk about the comment made by Kirk two years ago regarding Deuce Hogan, where uh, you know the the flu bug had hit the players and. You know, they win against Nebraska and the, the media asks him, hey, you know, was Deuce potentially in the mix? And he said, hey, if that had happened, I'd have probably stayed home. Oh, you know, I could not believe when he said that. Oh. That was disrespectful to Deuce Hogan. And, you know, Deuce is back in the portal, by the way. So I'm not saying Deuce was the answer, but like you don't say that. And he apologized for it later. Brian last year made the comment about Alex Padilla. What's the upside? Um, and then you have the the comment from Brian here a few days ago. PR is not Brian Ferentz's specialty. I'll tell you that. And then also you forgot the great hit about the waist downs. I can't believe you forgot about that one. That's your favorite, isn't it? The, way, the waist downs. Yeah. Well, he did make the comment. One of my favorite quotes from that conversation is when he said, I have a hard time ever imagining third and one being a waist down. That yeah. was just like almost the most incredible. Don, can you just comment on that statement that third <laughs> and one, you can't imagine third and one ever being a waist down. How can you possibly say that? Is that just because you just don't believe in waist downs? Is that, that the uh, consensus? I just, I guess the only way I can explain it is a failure to consider that you might already have made up your mind to use four downs. But that's what I'm saying. That that doesn't even that defies logic, right? Caller, doesn't it? Because as soon as you decide we're going to use four down if we need to, at that point, third down becomes the equivalent of second down. Right, exactly, and that takes right. some pressure off, you know. And like the Lions, look at the Lions, what they're doing in the NFL. They do, they go on fourth all the time. So that's that helps things. It makes things less pressure for quarterback and otherwise, you know. Um, but yeah, I just I just have a hard time seeing where this is gonna go because like Kirk just in you know the press conferences, like you guys said, not his forte and Brian, it's not his forte. And like he gets away with it because I feel partially there's a lot of reasons for that, but partially because he has so much tenure at Iowa, he can get away with more than maybe some other coaches could. I don't know. Maybe you could possibly say that the media sometimes isn't hard enough on him. I don't know. There's a million different scenarios there. Right. But it's just, it just feels like either he's totally disconnected from reality of what the game is becoming, or he doesn't want to admit it. I know he doesn't like it, but he doesn't want to admit it. Or he just, I don't know. I mean, it almost feels like he's mocking us in a way sometimes. And I hate saying that because I think he's a great motivator. He's He really is good at developing young men and all that type of stuff. I'm not saying he's a complete, insert the word here or anything like that. But I just, I don't understand why he just refuses to modernize and why he's so stubborn. And like, and we all know, by the way, the reason he waited on getting Marco in there today is because he didn't want to agree with the narrative that, you know, oh, with his narrative that he created that Deacon is the best quarterback that we have right now. I'm sorry. I just, it's like he's doubling and quadrupling. And how do you say it higher than quadruple? I don't even know, but that's what he does. Quintupling. Quintupling six, six, whatever in, I don't know. Yeah. You get my point. He just doubled down times like 15,000. So I just don't, it just feels like an unwillingness to change with the times and unwillingness to change his system that he's comfortable with. And I get change is hard for people. I understand that. But if we want to be competitive, like that's what we need to do. And I just don't understand why he won't have those tough conversations with his staff. And he needs to tell Deacon to go to the portal. I'm sorry. Like they need to say, sorry, you didn't perform up to par. If you're not willing to, you know, be QB three, kind of like what I can't remember if it was coach or you, Corey, who said it, but if you're not willing to be that third quarterback, you need to hit the portal. Cause I just, I, I, 
don't see how he can tolerate another season of this because Cade is not going to be healthy enough to be a good quarterback at this point. I just, he's too injury prone. Well, we don't know that. We don't know that. But, but we can't trust on it. We can't trust there, it. There's reason for concern. And by the way, Mitch in the chat, Erica, he says, gosh, you guys just complain. Well, if you don't like it, Mitch, you don't have to be here. That's fine. I, I, I love... Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love I love throwing these comments to you, Erica, and then just letting you attack. I just well, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be totally. Oh, no. I'm doing. I'm setting you up. I'm just. It's like I'm the setter in volleyball, and you're spiking it. So. <laughs> no, no, but I mean honestly, like. And by the way, Mitch, have you called in here, or are you just a keyboard warrior? Because if you're gonna say we complain too much, call in and tell us something optimistic. And I'm not being smart. I'm being serious because I feel like so many people make those comments and complain about callers, not only on your show but in Mark's show too that they're just like, oh, this caller knows nothing. Oh, this caller doesn't know ball. Oh, this caller complains too much. Well, why don't you stop being a hypocrite and stop complaining about me complaining and call in? That's well, my question hard. to that person. I mean, we're being critical. They just lost 35-0 against a team. Right. Like, and why can't people, it, I mean, just, it just feels like people can't handle the truth. Like, just like what's his name says, the actor, um, Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> I... Yeah, I understand. And and listen, nobody's I'm not calling for Kirk to be fired. I know, Erica, you've you've made comments before about, you know, you wouldn't be upset if Kirk retired. But I, I mean, I think it's fair to be critical and be frustrated, given some of the struggles we've seen over recent time. And 35 zero. I mean, these last two games have been 61 nothing. That's what are we going to sell? We're going to celebrate 10 wins for that reason. I mean, I, I don't. Oh, I'm, I'm tired of that narrative, too. That. I mean, let's be honest, like. Every time someone tries to criticize Kirk, it's just, oh, well, we won 10 games. Oh, well, that's football. That, I think that's going to win my award for favorite. That's football because that's, that's his excuse. That's, that's his excuse. And I just, I'm, I, I don't know. I think ultimately the reason I'm so harsh on whoever it was, whoever it was that said, I always complain. The reason I'm so harsh is because I'm a passionate fan who wants better for this football program and who sees potential. And that potential is not being realized as things stand today. And if you argue with me that it is just because we have 10 wins, okay, well, what happened today with Tennessee? What happened at the Big Ten Championship? Okay? Like, you can't – how can anyone defend that? I'm sorry. How can anyone – and you can't even say, like, with Michigan, you could defend it sort of by saying, well, our defense really got to them. They only got, you know, 3.3 yards per carry or whatever the statistic was. So, yeah, all of the points didn't look good. That's not the full story. You can say that. But for this game, you, I mean – it, it's just inexcusable, these losses. It's inexcusable. Yeah. I get you, Erica. Um, we're going to have months to talk about this. And uh, like I said, there's going to be some announcements here over the next couple of days and weeks that uh, that will create talking points. So, you know, I understand the discouragement. There's a lot of change coming, though, at least as it relates to, um, you know, positive retention with players, but also – we know a, a new offensive coordinator and potential for more personnel changes coming. Um, there's no question that change needs to happen. And I don't know if Kirk Ferentz would have made that decision had his hand not before had been has had been forced, but thankfully someone stepped up to the plate and made a decision and we'll just see how much of a difference it makes. Cause it wasn't the only problem. Brian Ferentz is not the only problem. With oh this no. Offense. And anyone who says that, I mean, they're totally off. That's not true at all. He's part of the problem. Yes. But he's not the only problem when you have this many problems. It's not just one cause you know, or one person. It's it's multiple, multiple things. And I just hope that Kirk makes the right hire because honestly, if he doesn't make the right hire, that's going to be a huge problem. And, you know, I feel like he's also, I saw someone on Twitter say this and I agree with it a hundred percent. Like he's playing off the good faith he's built over the years with the fans. And eventually it's going to run out. Eventually he's going to out, out stay his welcome. Yeah. I think he already has with some people. You know. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of on that list a little bit, you know, depending on my mood, I'm on that list sometimes. But I did also have a reminder, um, everyone needs to like this video. That helps out a lot. If you can't um, contribute monetarily, please just like the video. It costs you nothing, but it helps Corey a lot. And I know that he would appreciate it. So if you could like the video, I think last I looked, we were 600 something people and I don't think we have nearly that many likes. So please, if you could help out in that way, that would be fantastic. And then I have a reminder for Coach too. Remember last time you said you'd give us a Hayden story. So start thinking about it so that when the end comes, you can tell us one. Start thinking. Get the I better start thinking because, uh, Erica, did you hear the, the pregame show? Uh, pregame show. Because there was a – Oh, you mean the Hawkeye hangout with – yeah, yeah, I heard – yes, I know where you're going now. Yes, yes, yes. 
the Hawkeye hangout last week, right? No, no, no. Uh, yes, yeah. Hawkeye hangout. Yep. yep, I saw it. Yeah, that was a good story. I like that one. That was funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but anyway, I just I just hope that during the off season, um, some discussions are had, and I hope some difficult conversations are going to happen. And you know, I was going to say as well, you have a limit on how many scholarships and how many players you can have on your roster. And some people just, I mean, I I already made it clear how I feel about Deacon. I feel like he should hit the portal. Like he he should not be in this program. Like, and I appreciate like yeah, he helped lead us to ten wins, but we have to be honest, he's not the reason we got the ten wins. So. <laughs> I don't want to sound mean, but I'm just being honest like I always am. They do need to have some attrition so that we can attract better talent to put us in a winning position with the new offensive coordinator, whoever that ends up being. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, no argument there. I mean, they, they need to recruit better and develop better. Hopefully yeah. they can take advantage of some guys that have not been developed at certain key positions with whoever comes in. And, and that development process is going to have to kind of go into um, hyperspeed because – there are changes coming this next year that make things a lot difficult in the field. Yeah. I feel like too, you know, the other thing I wanted to say is although I'm sitting here complaining on the other side of the argument, like we've talked about before these defeatist attitudes that some fans have. I mean, obviously we're right after a game where we got a whooping. So obviously I'm not happy right now, but you know, there's so many defeatist attitudes like, Oh, well we have the PAC 12 schools coming, you know, West coast schools coming in. Oh, well, I was going to be a six and six team. Well, why is that a foregone conclusion? And why is it also a foregone conclusion that whenever Kirk leaves, we're going to be a crappy team? I just, I don't buy into that at all. I think we need to see what happens and what changes are made. And I just, like I said, although I feel a little doubtful, I'm hoping for the best ultimately because I want my team to be a good winning team. And I want for the narrative to stop that we're so horrible at offense. And, you know, the right now it's merited. It's merited right now that we get that reputation. But I feel like it's going to take years to break that. It's going to take years to break that bad reputation that we've gotten now. It's not just within the Big Ten, it's national. I agree, Eric, and I appreciate you calling in. Um, I know we'll talk during the off season, but uh, maybe we'll all be a little bit more optimistic here in a few days, a few weeks. Yeah, let's let the, I don't know what word to use, the disappointment burn off, I guess, and then try again. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Erica. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. You as well. Thank you very much. And uh, Don, I want you to, you, you're a great promoter. I could picture you in the middle of a ring with the microphone hanging down and, you know, you talking into it. That's uh, how I view you. So give me your best uh, reading of this banner that we have here on the screen right now, Don. Can you uh, read that big banner on the screen? <laughs> I believe you could probably be more effective than I could, Corey, us with you. I think you'll do a great job. Man. You're my promoter. Okay, we'll give it a try. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Aura. There you go. Hey, you. There you go. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Support the show by signing up for a free Aura trial. www.aura.com slash Hawkeyes. It's like you've done it a million times, Don. www.aura.com slash Hawkeyes. So uh, protect your information. Make sure your information is secure and safe. The information that uh, is most important. So again, that's www.aura.com slash Hawkeyes. And uh, you will get uh, a free trial, totally free trial. You'll need to give them some personal information. Aura is a, a company that uh, needs to know your information to be able to protect it. So uh, understand that. Uh, but you'll get a totally free trial. won't cost you a thing. And you're supporting the show when you do so. Aura.com slash Hawkeyes. Uh, Brandon, appreciate you supporting the RTI Threads cause. Thank you for that. And we go to Doug, who's been waiting on hold. Doug, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing, Coach? Hi, Doug. How are you? I'm I'm good. Life is good. Hawkeyes don't have an offense. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think they. What? Uh, <laughs> maybe they got fifty yards, hundred yards, two hundred yards. Uh, yeah, they got one seventy three. I think it was. How much? One seventy three. One seventy three. Oh, that's not the, that's not very good. Uh, I'm sure, <laughs> coach thought. No, I'm sure, it's not. <laughs> I'm sure, coach thought he is. Uh, Post coaching days, this would be how it would work, but uh, yeah. Um, but it was quite a few people ago, as Ryan, and I always want to be the smartest person in the room for some reason. 
I'm probably the dumbest person in every room, but uh, yeah, Matt Sherman injured his hand on like the second to last play. Cause I always remember him having his hands over his head down the ground after that interception. Uh, that was a uh, eighth grade, both basketball and football. We were predicted to win the big 10 and both and uh, didn't quite happen. And those were the second to last years for both Fry and Davis. And um, there was rumors then that if we would have won the – and Don, I don't know, because those are just rumors when I'm 14, that if we would have won the Big Ten Championship that year when Tim Dwight was uh, turning pro, that Hayden was going to retire that year. There was rumors of that. I don't know. And, you know, people always people always rumored Hayden Fry's retirement from mid-'90s on. But um, that actually is one of my questions dealing with Tim Dwight. Uh, I, Corey probably doesn't know much about Tim Dwight's career, but Tim Dwight started as, out as your third string running back, right? And you moved him to receiver. How did you know he'd be a good receiver? Did he play receiver before or just, you just go, he's well, really fast? I still remember one of the best high school games I ever saw was, was uh, Bettendorf at City High uh, during Tim's junior year. And I can't remember if Tavian was a junior or senior, Maybe he was also – was he also a junior that year? Were yeah. They, in the same, they were in the same class. Same and you class. Had, uh, Cedric Shaw was a year above them. One year older. You're right. You're right. Well, I, I remember vividly watching the game, and and I came back and I said, Coach, uh, Tim's playing running back, but I'll take him as a receiver right now. <laughs> and he said, why do you feel that way? And I said, well, because he's explosive like no one else. He's fearless. Uh, and he's actually got good hands. He feels punched without any problem. He'll he'll make a really nice conversion. But he was a receiver. He wasn't traditional size for a receiver, was he? Like he was no, pretty- but <laughs> as Hayden always said, you never weigh your measure a man when he crosses the goal line. <laughs> you know, that's a good thing. Uh, yeah, I don't know where Corey went here, but um, yeah, that like- was a great football game. Incidentally, I, I forget who won it even, but it was a really. Close, hard-fought game, and both Tavian and Tim uh, mm-hmm. took full advantage of the opportunity. It was one of the best high school football games I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Some City High fan or or some Bettendorf fan will be able to text in and remind me what the score was. I can't even remember who won the game. Yeah, but I, I, do re- that, I do recall being impressed off the charts with both of them for how they played. Yeah. Well, I don't know where Corey went to, but uh, I guess like – I'm not, I'm pretty optimistic. People are talking about the divisions, but still, we only play nine games. We don't play Michigan, Penn State, Oregon, or USC next year. And um, so, I'm I'm very optimistic that even even with the new arrangement in the Big Ten, you're not playing Michigan State, Ohio State, Penn State, USC. You're not playing all because we're every year we're gonna be playing Nebraska, um, Nebraska, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. We're playing every year, no matter what. Um, right. And we, we we traditionally like I think Hayden had like a 15 game winning streak on Wisconsin at one point, so you know it wasn't until Barry Alvarez got there that they got good. And so you know right. they sort of struggled over the last few years, and you know Nebraska struggled over the last few years. So you know um, yeah, so I don't look at the change as being that much different. We're playing six of the same teams that we played this year in the Big Ten next year. I think I could be wrong. Uh, we play Ohio State instead of Michigan, but you know West Washington's pretty tough. But I think anyone that's looking at, I would rather win a championship because I played the best teams than have a backdoor championship. Does that make any sense, Corey? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. Uh, it does. I mean, you're gonna we're gonna look back at this season and say accomplishment. Won the West. Won ten games. Mm-hmm but didn't really beat anybody like yeah. the two best teams they beat were Wisconsin and Northwestern. Yeah. And you know, those two teams were Northwestern was kind of in a weird situation, given, given the loss of Pat Fitzgerald and they were covered and finished their season yeah. on a phenomenal note, but you know, Wisconsin was going through some, uh, you know, head coaching adjustments with Luke fickle, the Luke fickle era beginning and, and they looked pretty good today against LSU. I think he's going to get it done there, but uh, the schedule was just so unbelievably soft. Yeah. It is not soft next year. Yeah, but there's there's six six win six very I don't think very hard games, probably three that are questionable. There's only two like really like Ohio State, I don't know how good Washington will be next year. There's not like 
again, we're, we're going to have to play those teams anyway. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it, Doug, can I say something to you? Because this is, I need to get this off my chest and you know, I'm an avid Iowa basketball fan. Yeah. This is the first year where I would rather watch the Dallas Mavericks play basketball than the Iowa men. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm at with Iowa men's basketball right now. Okay. I just want to be candid with you because you're a, you're a big basketball fan. Um, I desperately need Big Ten play to start or resume, I should say, uh -huh. because I, I, I to me it's just been boring to watch. Yeah, just to be honest, I think the Iowa men are boring to watch, and part of it's the lackadaisical environment, and part of it is the no defense, and part of it is I don't think they're very good. But okay. uh, anyways, you're still doing a show tomorrow, right, with Coach Close? <laughs> of course, and we've got a it's going to be a double show. We're going to wait till after the women because it's a back to back doubleheader. But yes. <laughs> like I said, I, I well, well, tomorrow we'll see what happens. And I said those next three games are very important, but I don't usually call my own football. I'm, I don't, like I said, personally, I don't like Brian. Um, you know, I've gotten an opportunity to meet him a few times, things he's done off the field, uh, even when he was younger, even when he was a student, I really disagree with. Um, I, I don't want to get into those because those things happened 20 years ago, but you know, he did some things. He, he's nepotism, he's one of those guys that was born on on third and thought he hit a triple. And I don't like that. He's one of those guys that anytime you meet him, he lets you know who he is. I, you know, like, like I said, I, I don't like those type of things. And, you know, the few times I've gotten to meet him, he's always showed me an attitude. Even when we were younger, I'm only a year younger than he is. And um, like I said, I, I, I don't think those three years at, Again, I didn't really want to go on here and just start bashing Brian. Those three years at New England didn't make him uh, – didn't give him the resume to become Iowa's OC. I didn't think so at the time. Um, you know, I don't, th I don't think any responsible Division One or FCS – I don't think you – I don't think you would hire him at Western Illinois to be your offensive coordinator, Coach. I, I, I couldn't see that. I couldn't see some school in the Missouri Valley hire him to be the offensive coordinator. Like what, what? I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know where he'll go. Probably be a position coach at some lower level. Maybe he will go be an NFL position coach. But again, if his name was Brian Smith, he would never even gotten the OC job, let alone gotten the offensive line job. You know, and I'm really, and I'm serious about that. And um, you know, people can say whatever they want. Um, Corey, I hope that you know basketball season at least gives you some enjoyment. Um, I get enjoyment watching the basketball team. Um, I did not get watch them. What? I'm going to watch them. I'm just saying like. Well, I'll tell you this. I did not get enjoyment watching this game today and watching the Michigan game and watching the Penn State game. I got no enjoyment out of it. Wasn't there some enjoyment seeing Marco come in and make athletic yes. plays? Yes, that was extremely enjoyable, actually. Yeah. we uh, my, my dad was watching with at Buffalo or one of one of his friends, I don't care. And he called me and didn't he, didn't Deacon Hill have like back to back turnovers? And we we're like, he has to play the backup now. Like, well, he I, has to. Like, I was watching the game with a family member of mine. I was watching the game with actually had his phone going. He was recording. He wanted to get my reaction out of the commercial. <laughs> if, if, if somehow Deacon trotted back onto the, <laughs> I think he thought I was going to like throw the footstool through the window or something, but, but no, to, to Iowa's credit, Marco finally came in and it was overdue. But uh, just to see him make some plays was enjoyable. Um, I guess I'll because I want to get Coach involved. Uh, question for Coach: what what do you what do you think they should look for in a new offensive scheme or differences? I know they won't make huge adjustments, but what would a new coordinator need to do to improve this offense, other than get better players or? What what would be something that a new OC needs to do day one? Day one, or just in that first couple of weeks, other than maybe recruit players, evaluate. I don't know. Yeah, we need to be um, we need to be a bigger a bigger threat offensively with the passing game than what we've been in recent years. We need to demonstrate. Our coaches before we hire our co our OC before we hire him needs to demonstrate that he's able to think outside the box a little bit in terms of schemes. Mm -hmm. You've heard me say if you want to be more difficult to defend, you have to demonstrate that you have a wider variety of plays that you might run. 
and yeah. you have to be able to think outside the box and and come up with that really do a simple way to say it you need to be able to ch challenge the defense for the full width of the field that's 160 feet 53 and third yards and for that matter you need to be able to challenge them 40 or 50 yards downfield yeah deep um, unless of course you're already across midfield and you don't have so many yards to deal with but you need to be able to challenge them in terms of the width of the field and the and the distance to the goal line uh, and if you can't scare them um, with your ability to, to hit them in all those areas, then you're not as good as you need to be. All right. Well, uh, I give well, Washington's a good example. Washington really threatens you over the top. Oregon's a good example of another team that does it well. Um, Ohio State, of course, comes to mind. Uh, Michigan this year has really gone a little more of the Iowa route. They've been more concerned. I don't know about tonight. I am taping that game, of course. I haven't had a chance to watch any of it, but I'll watch it later tonight. And, um, um, but, you know, Michigan to be able to beat um, tonight's opponent and next week's opponent, if they're lucky enough to play next week, they're going to have to be able to threaten over the top two. You know, they're going to have to be able to make some big plays. It's hard to win consistently. Corey, you touched on it. I made the comment, all four teams have mobile quarterbacks. All four teams scare you with their big playability. Uh, they all play defense to some degree, uh, but they're not necessarily the best defenses in the country. So, you like it or not, football has become a little more of an offensive game. And uh, you have to play good defense, no doubt about that. But if you're going to be elite, um, it seems like, well, there's two ways to go. You can be elite on defense, you know, proving that. Uh, but you can also be a lead in offense and still um, maybe win it all. A good example of a team that couldn't do it was Ohio State. They mm -hmm. were absolutely a lead on offense some years, but they were a little too pedestrian on defense. The irony there, of course, is that Ohio State was better this year on defense, but their offense couldn't quite couldn't quite uh, fill them the bill. Well, so, I will I will talk to you tomorrow, Corey. Hopefully, after a good what. Well, Wisconsin win, or I went over Wisconsin. Hopefully, hopefully you get some enjoyment out of our basketball team. Uh, I'll, I'll keep going in after every game, and uh, okay. I'll try to smile. So, hey, um, yeah, go Hawks. Happy New Year. Take it easy, everyone. Thank you, sir. We'll talk to you tomorrow. And uh, Thor says it all starts up front. O-line needs to get tougher and smarter. Absolutely. Jet, pilot, coach, uh, how likely is it the new OC will dictate terms to Kirk in the hiring process? So much depends on what other job opportunities he has. Obviously, if if Kirk's going to have to recruit him to come here because of other opportunities that, that he's also able to consider, he'll have a little more bargaining power with Kirk. And uh, I'd like to think that uh, the one thing I'm sure of, you know, Kirk wants to lead this football program in the best possible place. So if it's the right guy uh, that Kirk is convinced um, will give us the best chance uh, to upgrade the program from what it's ever been, then obviously he's probably more inclined to make some concessions in terms of in terms of decision making on offense. Kirk's not going to try to run the show on offense. Uh, Kirk will make all the big decisions. He'll be the one deciding whether to go for it or not. Um, you know, whether to use a, utilize a waste down or not, those type of things. But I'm sure he'll hire someone that he can have complete trust in to make all the necessary calls over the course of the game. That's a, the best we can hope for, I think, is to get someone. And the beauty of hiring someone with that kind of clout is uh, it also shouldn't show up in your recruiting. Let's face it, these young men, when they're picking a school, they want to play a coach that they feel gives them a chance to perform better than other people might imagine too. Uh, the kind of coach that will do a better job in plays than anybody else they can find at any other school. That's the person we need to hire. Um, hopefully we can find someone like that. I realize a lot of people would argue that doesn't include 
a couple of guys that we know are finalists. I've, I've publicly stated um, Paul Crest is a, an excellent football coach and a good man. Joe Feldman is absolutely an outstanding coach and a fine man. Are they the most dynamic coaches we could find for that job? You might argue that a younger coach that's accomplished great things here just in recent months and years might even have a bigger impact on the program. I can't argue with that. Maybe they would. Uh, I've always made a comment from time to time that coaching is a young man's game, and I do think uh, a younger coach with uh, great credibility uh, can maybe maybe inspire players to accomplish great things, even a little more so than an older coach. An older coach has the advantage of, of being highly respected. That's true, but but it's hard for him maybe to bring the same energy to the job that a younger coach might be able to bring. It's difficult to say that. Some guys are very charismatic until the day they die. Uh, others not so much. Parker Townsend, uh, could I hop on, answer some uh, UT questions? By all means, uh, Parker, I think I see him in our queue. So we'll get to Parker here in just a minute. Reed says, uh, you mentioned people who would say that Iowa football is not in rough shape. There are plenty of people, Reed, who would say they won 10 games two years ago, 10 games this year, eight games last year, quit complaining. We have them on the show sometimes. So, so it's, it's not like everybody is – you know, pitchforks and torches. I think that's pretty clear. BJ says, does Beth have the power to veto a potential OC hire so Kirk doesn't blow this huge decision in the next couple of weeks? I would say, uh, does she have the power to? I, I, I don't know if that's the right word. I don't think she's going to unless Kirk comes back with Steve Ferentz or James Ferentz or Mary <laughs> Ferentz. I don't think that's going to happen. I think he's going to hire who he wants to hire. I think so. I think... Uh, I think Beth probably has made that point with Kirk. I've got complete faith in your ability to pick the right guy. Absolutely. And um, I saw the question here from Barbara earlier. Barbara threw it up here a couple of times. I just uh, was I had it in the line here, Barbara. She says, Coach, if quarterbacks have to process very quickly, how would you change practice? My understanding is that they don't hit the quarterback in practice. Right. I'm not talking about taking taking physical shots on the quarterback. I'm simply talking about scripting into practice. Um, instead of um, – I think I've mentioned before, Chuck Harley asked me uh, – I asked Chuck rather one time. I said, Chuck, would it have helped you as a player to script in um, the practice script plays that would be more, more game-like? In other words – change the defense every play, from one play to the next. Uh, he said, absolutely, that would help. And one other thing I realized is this is a play we know is a good play. So it's fine that you practice it against the defense that you would expect, but there's an argument for putting it in against a bad defense. In other words, a defense that doesn't give you a great chance just to see how the quarterback reacts. Uh, maybe you even game plan it so that – he understands, do not waste this play. This play is designed for this particular scheme. If we get something other than that, you have to get out of the play. We would script that kind of stuff. We'd practice that stuff just to be sure they would not foul it up on game day. Uh, so uh, that's an example of making practice more difficult. Uh, it's easy to script in a bunch of defenses that can be easily beaten. What you need to find out, if you're really committed to running plays, you better spend some time practicing those plays against the defense that's the most difficult to, to go against and that you might still see on game day. To not do that is is to um, really to be ignoring the fact that that the practice is not at all like the game. The practice needs to be more like the game. That's how you find out more about how players respond on game day is by making practice more. Uh, Casey says, I hope Don returns next year, too. So, in other words, um, we've got, what, three or four player decisions awaiting, plus Coach Don Patterson. His, uh, um, I don't know if Don will be doing a live show to announce his decision on coming back for 2024, but uh, we'll certainly make the platform available to Don if he wants to hold a ceremony uh, and uh, make that announcement, Don. <laughs> well, in the, uh, 
in the unlikely event that the Dallas Cowboys want me to help them next year, <laughs> I'll probably be available. Okay. Um, hey, I heard an OC position is open in your backyard, Don. So, uh, anyways. Hey, where's yeah. that? Right there in Iowa City. Oh, that was. Then <laughs> says, would you rather have Cade start next year, go eight and four, seven and five, or Marco start next year and go six and six? Well, I don't know that if Marco starts, that makes that big of a difference. I mean, how do we know that uh, they'd go six and six? I mean, I guess I'd rather go with eight and four, seven and five, right? Well, that's I, that's a dumb, a dumb pr proposition. I clearly want to take the quarterback that produces the better record. So if you will guarantee right. me that Cade will go eight and four and you will guarantee that Marco will only go six and six, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. I'll go with the quarterback that produces an eight and four, but I'm pretty sure you're not able to to make that kind of prediction with any kind of um, any kind of honest opinion. Uh, Michigan just gave up a touchdown. Alabama up 17-13 early fourth quarter. Um, Esther, I'm doing good. How are you? Good to see you here. Appreciate you supporting the show. I see you in the chat a lot, so thank you for that. Martin says, what would today's game look like if Linez had started the last eight games instead of Hill? That'll keep you awake at night trying to figure that. <laughs> you, you, we won't know, right? Uh, but it's a fair question to ask, I guess. Um, Ryan wants to know, Coach Patterson, how much does practice win over when Saturday game time shows results and picking who plays? It's a question I asked uh, Josh uh, Heupel in uh, pre, pre bowl media availability, and, and he gave an interesting answer. The reason I wanted to ask Coach Heupel the question and I don't know if the press conference ever got published, but uh, he gave a, a good answer. He's a former quarterback, though, so he's a QB's right. guru. Um, I made the comment that uh, if he suddenly lost his job, I'd love to get him on as Iowa's OC because he understands a passing attack. But, uh, you know, they're actually a run-first team. They were a run-first team last year, but they're really good with everything, and they've got a really talented QB. If he could, they could bring Nico over to Iowa City, that'd be great, replacing one Nico with another. But uh, anyways, how would you answer that question, Don, about evaluating players' practice versus in-game? Well, the bottom line, before you've played a game with any particular player, you, all you have is practice to go on. But I would always add more value to what they do in front of a crowd. Some guys seem to um, respond in, in a surprising direction. Some tend to, with uh, additional pressure, others seem to respond in a really positive way. You've heard that expression, that guy's a gamer. You want guys that respond in the right way, that, that embrace the pressure of a game because it is, it is a lot of pressure. And uh, that's why you need to put some pressure on them in practice too. Uh, the most obvious example would be a live scrimmage. Now we're going to find out a lot because we're going to be playing our best on both sides of the ball. And now we're back to the best way to evaluate equal reps, equal opportunity for players at one position in which you're not sure who's better than who. That's the way to find out. Equal reps against equal opposition. Bobby Hansen, uh, Bobby Hansen, uh, not the former Iowa basketball player, Bobby Hansen. He says, uh, Don is coming back. At least I don't think that looks like Bobby. <laughs> no. Um, Lemansky, thank you for the super chat, Lemansky. NIL dollars to keep coach playing for the Hawkeye of the storm. So the swarm needs to start raising money just to keep you here, Don. Well, that would be a real sick proposition on my part. <laughs> start, start having the Swarm raise money so that I can keep Don on my show. But uh, I do appreciate the, the Super Chat, Lemansky, and uh, a very, very uh, generous con contributions always from Lemansky. Appreciate that. And uh, please follow in Lemansky's footsteps. It always makes the load lighter for everybody if everybody can give a little as opposed to one person having to give a lot. But uh, thank you for your donations, Lemansky. They are very much appreciated. Parker says, guy on the left. I think that's me. A lot of Tennessee's backups were great players. We played a lot of older guys because of loyalty more than talent this season. Very deep team. There's no question about it. I still don't think Iowa took advantage of the defensive backfield as well as they could have potentially, but uh, that's, I guess, neither here nor there. Erica says, uh, Drew Tate as a coach at Iowa. Thoughts? I heard him say he'd go back to Iowa City to coach if asked. Also, Corey, should I send another email? Uh, Erica, yes, you're asking about uh, the whole uh, moderating thing. Um, I know, Erica, you are a big women's basketball fan, so uh, hopefully you'll be a part of that. No, I, I 
Um, thank you for reminding me. Please keep reminding me. I'll try to get to that. I promise I'm not putting you off intentionally. Thank you for the super chat. I don't love the idea of Drew Tate coming in and coaching at Iowa. Now, maybe he could get by as a quarterback's coach. He obviously is a former quarterback and understands the game, Don, but he doesn't have some sparkling resume besides the fact that he's coached at a couple FCS schools. I think he's up at the CFL now coaching, and he's a former Iowa quarterback. Other than that, I think there are people with better resumes. Right. I would be concerned about his his ability to game plan, um, his ability to put together a call sheet, uh, his ability to call a, a game himself. I want to know for sure that he's done all those things and done them well. And I don't honestly know how much time he spent as a play caller yet. Maybe you have a better idea than I do, Corey. Has he called plays? And if so, on what level? Perhaps not. I don't know. I know he was at UT Martin. I was thinking as a quarterback's coach, not as an OC. Yeah. If you've never called plays, your first play calling experience should not be in the Big Ten. Well, because and I think maybe, maybe, Eric is just talking about him coming in and coaching quarterbacks. Not oh, just coach quarterbacks? Yeah. Maybe he's really, really good at that. I don't know. I'd want to know that he's done it somewhere else, and I'd want to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that he'd done it well. Right. Um, Joe says, uh, if Don had transferred out, he would have been done. Done with the show, done watching this show, done commenting. So, uh, Don, I appreciate you sticking around because we, we kept Joe here. Um, yeah, let's, go to our, hanging in there. let's go to our next caller. We've got uh, your uh, Don, your latex salesman, Art Vandalay, is on the line. Art, uh, welcome. Yes, sir. I've got some latex to sell you after the questions. Uh, <laughs> I will take calls and orders later. Anybody um, that's a Seinfeld fan is a friend of mine. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I appreciate all the quarterback talk. I really do. However. I believe everything funnels through that offensive line. And until that gets addressed, I can't properly grade Marco. I can't properly grade even Deacon. And I probably won't even grade Cade until we have a sense of stability and normalcy on that line where we don't try to plug holes. And so is it getting to the point to where – Kirk has to maybe lose the nice guy act a little bit, bring in those players that have the possibility of coming back. And he actually says to them, I think it'd be a good idea. You leave. We, we need that scholarship because we need somebody in there who can block. For example, Nick DeYoung. I think that is a poor, poor decision to bring him back. And I'm sure the coach has probably asked him back. That's very disconcerting knowing that that's the level of talent that we have that we need to operate and want this quarterback position and offense to flourish if we just don't have the right cats. Hold on a second. I, I just want to, you know, I disagree with that take, right? Yep. Yep. You, you heard my reaction, Nick DeYoung coming back. Yes. Um, I think what happened last year with, you know, they got a kid that was wanted by power fives in Parker. You know, he comes from Saginaw Valley State, was wanted by Virginia, actually decommit from Virginia, had some other Power Five uh, offers, some interest. He didn't work into the rotation. So, I mean, I don't know that it's all a personnel issue. I think they've got, they've had good prospects come through here. They've had guys who are regarded as four star players that have not broken through. Um, you know, I think about Tyler Endress, four star kid, never really succeeded here. Um, they were close on Caden Proctor. You know, he's starting as a freshman at Alabama. Um, I mean, go down the list. They've had guys that have just not panned out here. Don, the offensive line's not good. I'm not arguing that it is. I still believe getting a, a extra year out of a guy like Nick DeYoung is a good thing. I know he's very polarizing with the fan base. I think people feel like he's forever doomed to fail as an Iowa offensive lineman. I just have a hard time thinking that a better, like you, you can guarantee yourself a better option going to the portal or going with a young guy when you've been trying to gain and garnish experience out of your young guys for the last two to three years. When you have an opportunity to bring a guy like Nick Young back, bring him back. That's just my take, but I'm the old line guy. Don, you're a former coordinator. How would you approach the O line situation? And do you think it's more of a personnel issue or just lack of development and coaching? 
that's difficult um, to pinpoint. I'll say this. One problem with um, bringing in a transfer, well, first off, Parker had a minor injury along the way. I remember after I looked at his video from um, Division Two, Division Two or Division Three, I can't remember. I remember saying he's athletic enough, uh, but I don't know. He's not facing the athletes he'll face in the Big Ten. I don't know how he's going to – my only concern is I don't know how he's going to compete against guys that are as athletic or even more athletic than he is. That's what I didn't know. We'll never know really how it would have played out because in his defense, I think he was injured and lost some valuable practice time and wasn't able to quite get over the hump. I don't doubt for a minute he's still a great young man, a wonderful young man. But Rust, Rust, hold on real quick. Rusty Fifth came in as an all-Mac guy, um, sir, and I'm not talking to Coach. I'm talking to Art Vandele, uh, the B, with us. Um, but he came in and worked his way into the lineup. But, I mean – was Rusty Feth some all Big Ten level lineman? I don't think so. Not even. Uh, you know, how much of this? I don't know. I, I mean, that's kind of why I'm deferring. Like, I, I don't know where the fix is. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. He, he cracked our starting lineup in part because of injuries, what, midseason or so, I think. Yeah, but I mean, again, would you have you broken down the tape on Rusty Feth to, to prove that he's some all Big Ten caliber player. I mean, he's one guy, I get it. But I'm just saying, like, what do you do besides either get a new offensive line coach or just keep putting your head down and working? I mean, it's pretty hard to get freshmen who are ready to play up front. And they've tried in the portal. So right. you're hoping that some of these older guys, it, it clicks for them eventually. It never really clicked for Levi or Landon Paulson. Never has never really clicked for Jack Plum. Maybe it won't click for Nick DeYoung next year. But, Don, what, what do you think about the news that Nick DeYoung is coming back for an extra year? Is that – I mean, like, is there ever a time where that would be negative in your mind? Or would you say that's always a positive? You can get a guy like who's been a starter for several years coming back for an extra season. He is taking up a scholarship, and that's the one argument against it. I'm simply not in good enough position to know which way is the best course of action. Uh, I think in general, without getting into actually evaluating someone for how well they block and how well they, they uh, dominate an opponent, is simply uh, to acknowledge part of, the, part of the success of an offensive line ties into the fact that they've been able to play together as a unit for a long time. In that regard, bringing in a guy for one year, uh, sometimes there are some growing pains simply because – uh, he's simply not that aware of his adjacent players and how they impact what he's doing. You know, in other words, if you're a right guard, you're adjacent to the center and adjacent to the right tackle. And let's face it, um, uh, you three players need to work together, work together in concert to be sure that nothing gets left at the line of scrimmage. You know, your job is to understand exactly what's going to be happening on that of you too. So there's a, a learning curve there too. Uh, it's it's complicated in the offensive line because uh, you've heard me say if you've got four guys that won based on execution and one guy that lost on execution, that may be enough to blow up the play. It just depends on who that guy was that was beaten and, and where the ball was going in relation to where that defender was going. So it doesn't take much to mess up. All five linemen need to be working together, though, is the point to be able to do a good job across the front. I, I, I would be in favor of Iowa using their swarm moment money to get great offensive line talent versus skill positions at this point. Once that is built up, I think we can just build off that. That's the biggest frustration for me. And then the final question for you guys on this, and this, this trampolines into that question, do these swarm deals – with these skill position players, whether it was Cade, whether it was Caleb, whoever gets this money, do that is the money contingent on, are we getting to the point where the kids are going to say, I will go there X amount of money, but I have to get X amount of touches. Are we at that point yet? And is it going to get to that point? It, it can't legally. Okay. By rule, I should say by rule, it cannot, right? Because they're coming 
not to play or not to, to even be on the field. As long as they're in good standing and they complete whatever nonprofit or fundraising task they're, ta they're given, they're entitled to that money. Because remember, it's, it's not supposed to be pay for play. So now what happens behind closed doors with other programs, I don't think that's happening with Iowa. I don't think touches are ever going to be part of the NIL discussion as it relates to getting players to come to Iowa in any sport. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, by the way, uh, on that last touchdown, if you guys saw Alabama, you will see they moved Caden Proctor to the right in a bunch formation and ran the ball right behind him into the end zone. That dude is a dude. <laughs> it's, it's, he would have been awesome for Iowa. And yeah. that kind of kid right there, and he may whiff a few times, but he has the athleticism to recover and move those feet to get back to where he needs to be. And that kid's a gamer. And, oh, man, that's that's one I wish we wouldn't have lost. But he is a pleasure to watch and, you know, root for. Uh, so, anyway, I hate to leave us on a bad note. On the good note, uh, uh, my latex sale will be going on for an extended period of time through the end of January. So make sure you guys check that out. And I love you guys, of course. And Happy New Year to you both. Thank you, sir. And he wants to be my latex salesman. <laughs> all right. Um, appreciate uh, all the comments here. Uh, Don, you got 20, 25 more minutes here to sure. finish off the season. We got some more callers here who want to chat. If you need to take a break, Don, I can throw you out and bring I'm you good. back. Are you sure? Okay. Yep. Don't want any trips to the emergency room later. <laughs> I'm good. All right. Um, let's go back to our uh, our call line. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach Don Patterson. Who's on the line? Harlan Garvin. Who is it? I'm sorry. Harlan Garvin. Hey, Harlan. How are you? Not too bad. Harlan, it's great to hear from you. Hey, how you doing? Corey's not aware that we have a history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a long time ago. Hey, I was watching the game. I was pretty disappointed, uh, like everybody else. But, you know, I remember when you you and uh, Coach Snyder and uh, Coach uh, uh, Carl were here, I could always depend on an offense. You sure you, you sure you don't have it in you to come back as offensive coordinator? No, I don't believe I don't believe that's an option. Um, Corey, you're, not, you're not aware of this, but Harlan is the is the, the brain that gave us a chance to be ahead of our time with computer scouting back in the early 80s. Okay. <laughs> that, that's being generous. That's being generous, Donnie. Hey, you know, I remember when when Hayden got here, I always looked for a bell cow. You know, I said he wanted a bell cow. Well, we've had some bell cows, like Tyler Linderbaum a couple of years ago. He was a bell cow. Pat, Pat Anger a couple of years ago was a bell cow. We got one this year in our little uh, – the Cooper DeGene, he's our bell cow, but we ain't riding him. We ought to be riding that sucker as long as he'll ride, you know, <laughs> but he, they're not letting him play. I would be putting him on, I wouldn't put him in too much, as much danger, but I'd put him at, I'd put him at a little bit of wildcat. I'd put him at wide receiver. I'd put him at D back, of course, and as much as he could handle and try to keep him out of too much danger as, as much as you could. But man, that guy would make a difference, but I'll tell you what, in today's game that we had there, when he threw that interception when we're down in the 40 yard line, I'm thinking, come on, we just, we need points. You don't, and then there's, he's double covered front and back. And, and then the one that really blew my stack was when he was rolling out to the right and he had Caleb Johnson. Caleb Johnson would have at least kept us from having a loss, okay, of yardage, because he was right in front of him. He tried to throw over, well, he didn't even throw it, he just took the loss took a five-yard loss. I'm thinking, come on, the guy's right in front of you. Throw him the ball, see what he can do. And I, I'm just telling you, I'm just so so frustrated because I'm used to seeing offenses that you guys had back then with uh, Coach Knight. He was a genius. You guys were genius. When it could, you could figure out an offense, you had something. You could always get guys open pass plays, and then you'd have guys doing counters, coming back and going, you know, pitch it wide, and all of a sudden the guy would be coming back to through the middle. <laughs> I enjoyed watching that, but boy, this, this offense is hard to watch, but we got one bell cow and by golly, we didn't use him like we should have, I don't think, but, well, and, and we should have had, we, we should have been using the running quarterback 
even if he couldn't throw. <laughs> I tell you, yeah. we're better off just having a running quarterback that didn't get losses as opposed to, you know, fumbling the ball away and throwing interceptions, letting our punter, you know, take care of business as much as he could. So, with, Marco Linez's at- wins. with Marco yeah, Linez's athleticism, Harlan, I absolutely agree with you. I, I, regardless of his ability to throw the football as a true freshman, it's inexcusable that they have not schemed to get him the ball. Um, given yeah. his threat as a runner. It's absolutely incredulous and ridiculous. Well, the guys in my coffee club, they're worried about McNamara. They don't think he can last a year. They think he's too fragile. You know, that kind of, and I, I'm almost inclined to agree with it. So you better have somebody in there ready to go, whoever's the next offensive coordinator. I'll tell you that because they just don't think that he'll, he can, they can make, he can make the season, you know, without getting hurt. I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but uh, you know they they take a lot of punishment. So, but I think our, another big thing is our line is just we used to have lines. We could bulldoze people. We don't have a line anymore, and and I guess you know you have to give Deacon a little bit of credit that it's not all his fault. I mean, you know it's not all his fault, but the offensive line just it just stunk uh, basically, and I, you can't do nothing unless you got. And so, whose fault is that? I don't know, but you know. Uh, the game of football kind of is pretty simple, blocking and tackling. And we we didn't do much blocking. <laughs> Take that. So, Donnie, how you doing? Doing okay, Arlen. I, I really uh, – it's fun to reminisce about the good old days. Corey's heard me say this before, Harlan, but I think you can appreciate this. Uh, I always like to think about play calling. Uh, it's a little bit like – Uh, a game of chess, and I don't even know anything at all about chess, but I do know this much. The best play callers, they not only know the way you're going to line up and how to attack you, but they also have an idea of what your adjustment's going to be. So you're able to stay one step ahead of the defense. Whatever they do, you're anticipating their next move, and you know what to go to as soon as they make that move. Yeah. Well, you guys were good at it, man. That was that was fun watching that offense. I mean, I like watching the defense this year, but you know, we don't, that's only half the team. We had a good defense back when you were uh, you were coaching at Iowa too, even with the offense. But you know, uh, the offense was fun to watch because you knew they were you were going to come up with something. It was always it was amazing. So I'm hoping they can find somebody like that. Maybe they can get a clone of you or clone of Bill Snyder or somebody like that, Carl. Uh, because those are fun times to watch a, to watch a game. So I hope you had a happy uh, Merry Christmas and a happy New Year, uh, Donnie. We and did. Give, the golf. Give, my, give my best to Connie also. You, yeah, you, you do with Lisa. Hey, and maybe we can uh, get together. On, you know, I played a half a round of golf with you. Well, actually a quarter round. I played pretty good the first five holes, and then then I played uh, like Iowa's offense in the last five, last four. <laughs> <laughs> but so maybe next time, maybe next year I can finish it off. So <laughs> well, I lost Charlie. Anyway, it was fun. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Harlan. I lost you there for the last ten seconds. Okay. Anyway, uh, I was saying uh, maybe the next maybe the next time we play golf, I can finish the finish the nine holes with you instead of you know stinking up the course. <laughs> that sounds good. Anyway, uh, take care. Forward to it. Stay healthy. Stay healthy Thanks. and um, uh, keep in touch. Thanks. You do the same. Thanks, Thanks. Harlan. You betcha. You betcha. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Well, that was fun. So uh, appreciate that. Let's uh, let's get to our next caller. We've got um, Vincent on hold. Vincent, welcome. Hey, Corey. How we doing? Good, man. You've been on hold a long time. Well, I. <laughs> I started out the show, and but my my phone died twice, so I had to find a charger to get plugged in. But um, I'll be brief, uh, gentlemen. Happy New Year, and uh, as always, thanks for taking the time. Um, I just want to start out with, I know obviously we're going through the OC um, position search, but and this is for both you and Don. Do you feel, given Kirk's philosophy, that he's going to kind of handcuff the next OC candidate um, that's going to be coming in, or do you think he's going to give him enough leeway to, to bring in or implement the offensive scheme that he wants to bring in? Don, you want to address that? 
Well, you've heard me say already, I, I think more than anything, Kirk wants to lead this program in the best possible shape that he can. And in that regard, uh, I think he wants to hire somebody that he can trust to run the defense, run the offense rather, and run it with great efficiency. And as soon as that, I'll say it this way, the more that person demonstrates that he can do so, the more freedom Kirk will give him. And in that regard, yes, I, I do think he would like to hire someone that can absolutely run the offense without a lot of input on his part. Um, I guess I'll revert to a quote. I know I've heard Kirk say, you know, you have a lot of offensive um, or OCs or offensive coaches that have the um, Texas Tech air raid offense or just high scoring prolific offenses, but that, he doesn't feel that it works, um, you know, across the board for college football. And he's right to an extent. But do you guys think a high-profile offense would still gel well with Kirk's foundation of philosophy and what we do on defense? How How is he right when you're saying he's right to an extent about not – about a high-flying offense not working? I mean, there's a lots of – Washington's in no, the college he, football playoff. No, he. What he's saying is not for every team. And every he, I think he referenced Army and Navy when he made that quote. But his saying is you can't have a high-powered offense and still play great defense. And I, I don't agree with that statement at all. I think it's actually the exact opposite. You can do both. You can bring in a prolific offense, even if it's a spread or a, a dynamic offense by any sort, and still play the style of defense that uh, Iowa runs and that. Uh, or Phil Parker runs and still be successful, and you're not going to hinder your total game plan um, for how Kirk wants his his football team ran. I don't think it's going to have any impact whatsoever. But you don't need to, flying. The thing is, is you don't. This is the divide we have with Kirk Ferentz. You do not need Iowa. Does not need to have a high flying offense. They just need to not be hot, 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 hot garbage. Right, right, and and I'm I'm just quoting him. I'm not saying you need it either. Yeah, they, they have been blistering garbage for years. Uh, look at Michigan. Look at um, Bama. Look at even Washington's defense hasn't been great, but it's not, um, you know, wet yourself level. It's, right. it's you know, hold your own. That, that's all they got to do. That's all this offense needs to do is hold its own. And but, they can't. Sorry. They don't. Right. right, but the interpretation I have based off of Kirk's, or Kirk's quotes are I can't bring in an offense that's tailored to be, I hate to use the term high octane, but just a higher scoring offense. If I bring it in here, it's not going to fit our, our philosophy as, as a team altogether. And that's the part I don't agree with, but that's what we've heard from Kirk. So for me as a fan, I'm sure other fans out there, we're saying, okay, it's great that we're looking for a new OC and much respect to Brian, but you know, today's another example of why, I was decided to move on, but in, in our search for new OC is Kirk only going to go out there and have a select list or a shortened list of guys that he feels fits his philosophy versus what the landscape of college football is doing. Well, what I just want to know, Vincent, and I know you're quoting, you're, you're referencing what Kirk has said. Why is Iowa not able to get a high flying offensive coordinator or a guy who has that reputation? Why does that go against Kirk Ferentz's beliefs? He feels it doesn't – Kirk looks at the game not just in offense and defense, but ball control, uh, not creating – or not having turnovers, creating turnovers. So for him – They the turn game, the ball over all the time. Deacon, Deacon is a turnover machine. No, I, I'm again, I'm just quoting Kirk here. I'm just telling you what I've heard him say. He doesn't feel that – he's like, look, this is how I view um, our team and how we can be successful. It's – you know, you hate to use the term QB managers, but, you know, quarterbacks that manage the game, not turning the ball over, creating turnovers, field of position, all these elements are what Kirk puts into his winning analytics, and he doesn't feel that a higher-profile offense fits his mold. And it's like, okay, because we, we keep bringing up Paul Christ. I, I As much respect as I have for Christ as a, a football coach, I don't think we should be anywhere near looking at Paul Chris for an OC. And I know Don has much respect for, for Paul Chris, but he runs the same kind of style offense 
that Iowa does, and that's not what is successful in college football today because it's becoming a dinosaur when it comes to college offenses. There's not many people besides the military academies that still run it. But to get back to my point, Kirk says this is not – it doesn't fit my mold and what I want to do here at Iowa. Okay, well, why not? But if when you're out there looking for an OC, then who the heck are you going to be looking for? Well, that's what I'm saying. If if the criteria is running a certain way and, and a certain type of offense, then Paul Christ is one of the best candidates for the job. That's the only reason I've been pro Paul Christ because I don't think Kirk is going to overhaul things. And I, even though I think there's no reason not to, I think the argument that we have to stay conservative and, and go with playmaking or play managing quarterbacks that, uh, or game managing quarterbacks that uh, are immobile and, you know, don't really create with their feet is such a defeatist mindset as it relates to that position. Um, Don, do you believe that uh, the way Iowa wins games, that it needs to maintain a conservative approach on offense or can, can they get creative and hire someone who spreads the field out more and brings a different offense to this program? Is that still possible and it's still possible to, to keep the level of defensive and special teams play that we've had. I don't think, um, I don't think that the, um, the formations you put on the field necessarily are as important as the plays you run out of the formations. I'll give you a simple example. We go empty all the time, but we don't do much out of empty. If they get in the game, we're not running the ball at all. Uh, typically, we're throwing flat routes to inside receivers trying to make the first down. Incidentally, that was a flat route that was intercepted for the touchdown today. It was an inside receiver breaking outside into the flat. So my, my point is we just need to be more imaginative in running some of these same formations that we've been running. We don't have to ch change up formations necessarily. Uh, you know, we don't even have to – there's nothing wrong with two-back offense. I'd like to think two-back offense is part of something we did. How many times do we even use a fullback today? Maybe not once. I didn't maybe see a fullback in the game. Not once. Maybe in some, some kind of short yardage situation maybe. I can't remember. But the bottom line is we're almost exclusively a one-back team now. Now we're a one-back team with a tight end on the field for sure, if not a couple of tight ends. Incidentally, you didn't see much at all of the tight ends today. Uh, you know, we tried to get on the ball a few times, but with not much success. So I guess my point is, let's just be sure we hire someone that's got, that understands what Kirk's looking for. Not going to be a radical change. We're not going to throw 40 passes a game. We're not going to do that. We don't have to do that. But the 20 or 25 that we do throw, let's just be sure that they do a better job of attacking the defense in more diverse ways. Not too many of the same thing over and over again. You know, we just need more diversity within the offense to keep people off balance better than what we've had. Don, this offense looks like a high school offense. JV offense. It does. It looks well, like that's not even, I'm not even exaggerating. It looks like you know, everybody talks about how complex this offense is, Don. Do you think you're a former coordinator? Does this offense looks com look complex to you? No. It looks like a high school offense. <laughs> Not cut at all. It does. It, it, no, it does. It's 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 laughable. And I'm sorry not to just jump in, but um, I, I as much as I know, or as much respect as mo uh, all of us have for Kirk, we also know Kirk because he's been here for 25 years. We know he's going to have his type of coordinator that he wants that's still going to run the Kirk kind of ball. Does that make sense? Because Kirk has the philosophy. Don would probably attest to that. Every coach has their philosophy when it comes to how they want their program ran. And Kirk's been successful with it. But is that sustainable going forward? And I know, Corey, you alluded to, you'd be okay with the Paul Crest hire, right? Well, I'd be okay because I don't think Kirk's going to uh, be willing to do anything radical. That's the only reason I'm okay with it. I think he's one of the better options with Kirk's parameters. And I, I don't disagree. Now, am I a huge fan of myself, of, of Paul Crist as an OC candidate? Not off the bat, no. Now, let's say he does come in, and I know that there's rumors that he's not being considered, but let's say he did come in and didn't make radical changes, but were successful, great. But I just don't see 
I look at Wisconsin, if Wisconsin's going to let him go because of the same offensive philosophy that Chris had, yet um, and go in a different direction, and the landscape of college football is changing, is Chris' philosophy and Kirk with old school ball, is it sustainable going forward in college football? I just don't feel that it is. Sorry, I know I'm rambling here, but. You're good. Um, Don, what, what, do you have a response to that? Well, I'll say this. I think there are a certain coaches out there that are veteran offensive coordinators. If they, if they understand Kirk wants to run the ball 60% of the time and throw only 40% of the time, and Kirk would feel most comfortable if you always had a tight end on the field. I think any any competent offensive coordinator would say, "Yeah, I can I can operate under those parameters. We can get that done. I can come up with any number of plays that involve an attached tight end uh, that involve you know what we call eleven one by one tight end, three wideouts on the field at all times. You can line up uh, with the two by two formation. Of course, we've Utilize tight ends like Sam Laporta and flex alignments. Even you know you can do a lot of things out of those that same personnel grouping. Um, my point is, uh, a veteran offensive coordinator uh, he has got a lot of access to a lot of plays that are in his in the back of his mind. You've heard me say before, Corey. We would run a play in week three. We might not run it again until week eight. Why would we not run it in games four, five, six, and seven? It's because it didn't apply to the situation that we're facing in game eight. So imagine you're trying to defend Iowa in game eight, and you're seeing plays that haven't even been run this month. Good luck being prepared for that because you haven't run it. I just heard uh, yesterday when the when the Chiefs were playing, uh, and I forget who the – was that Tony Romo that was on that game? I can't remember who it was, but somebody yeah. com- somebody commented. They, they commented that Andy Reid just used a play that he hadn't used since last season. It's a play that they ran a year ago, and it just occurred to them, why don't we come back to that play? That's the, that's the advantage of an, an experienced coach. You've got, you've got a, a, a mountain of information available to you just in your own recall. And it's not like you have to remember details. You can go back. You can say, we ran it last year against against Buffalo in the case of the NFL. So you just go back to the Buffalo game to, re- to refresh your memory of exactly how you did it. Remember the play I'm talking about? It's for the touchdown. It was a flood scheme to the strong side of the formation. And, and the back came out of the backfield as the fourth receiver on that side of the formation. And the semi split was in between the first and third the first and original second receivers. Uh, so he just simply worked down the seam for an easy touchdown. Was that? Am I confused about who ran the play? I think it was – I'm almost sure it was Kansas City because it didn't surprise me that Andy Reid might do something like that. So that's the advantage of, of having a guy in charge uh, that really has a wealth of knowledge because he can go back and think about, yeah, we've done things like that before. I may need to go back and look at the video just to refresh my memory but because I don't remember – all the details behind it, but that's why coaches always archive all their own game plans. You can pull out the game plan and refresh your memory about exactly what you told the players to get it done. And Don, you're right. Um, I'm a KC fan as well as an Iowa fan. So I watched yesterday's game. Uh, conceptually, you're hundred percent right. I think the player might've been Rasheed Rice, that um, wide receiver at SMU, but yes, you are correct. They just, from what my understanding is, is, Andy Reid went back to condensing the playbook and keeping it or and going back to things they used that were successful last year and even the year prior. So yes, you are you are correct in that. That's but what my, good coaches do. They they you know, they reference old other games to, to put together the best possible plan. The only thing I was saying, gentlemen, is or I guess the point I'm trying to make is what scares me as a fan is giving Kirk's nature, even as successful as that as that's been. When he's out there looking for a new OC, are we still going to get the same product? That's what I hope I don't see. And, Corey, I'm sure you can attest to the same thing. You don't want to see just a different face but the same product because of the brand of football that Kirk wants to utilize. And I realize it's successful. Yes, it wins more games than he loses. But when you go on the major platforms and you're, you're playing top-tier Power 5 schools, you don't want to keep having results like you saw today. Does that make sense? 
Yep, I get you, Vincent. That's that's all I was alluding to. And then um, I know, lastly, Joel Philbin's been brought up. Um, I don't know. I, I just I'm, I guess I'm not too. Um, I wouldn't be a fan of that hire, and I don't want to bring it up, but I know he had his issues in Miami with the scandal with uh, that offensive lineman Martin. I can't think of the the kid out of Stanford. Yeah, I, I don't I, think that. I don't think that was Joe Philbin's fault. Not that it didn't happen over uh, under his oversight, but I, he, he uh, I believe he was pretty firm with his um, discipline when it came out that it was occurring. You're talking about Richie Incarg- uh, Incognito, right? Um, well, the quote the quote that doesn't sit well with me is we've already got kind of the the dark cloud we're trying to get out of with Chris Doyle and with Joe Philbin. He was quoted telling Richie Incognito to go in and toughen up the other offensive linemen. Now, is that is that really outside the realm of what a coach does? No, but I just wouldn't want that to be looked at from an outsider's perspective outside of the University of Iowa circle or the Iowa fan base. Is oh, okay, here's a guy that we're bringing in that has you know these issues back with Miami, and every coach deserves an opportunity to rectify themselves. I don't want that to be one of those headlines that comes up if it's Joe Feldman, which I doubt it. I just don't want that coming up. And then I've heard also the Pat Fitzgerald thing. And just, I just don't want any of those clouds looming over the Iowa program. That's, that's all. Yeah. I appreciate the call, Vincent. Thank you Thanks, for being patient. Have a good night, Don. Yeah. And Pat Fitzgerald's not an offensive guy. He's not getting hired as the OC. And I can, I'm pretty confident that uh, Joe Philbin's not getting hired as the OC. Uh, bonehead play by Michigan. So, uh, Alabama had extended the lead to 20 to 13. Michigan comes down the field, scores a touchdown with about a minute and a half to go. Uh, Alabama then forced to punt here under a minute to go. And for some reason, Michigan tries to field the punt inside their own five. He fumbles the ball, recovers it at his own one. Michigan now with 44 seconds left in regulation. It's 2020. First down and 10 and a handoff up the middle to the two. But uh, I'm guessing Alabama will use that last time out and force Michigan to snap it again. Maybe they won't. It does not look like Saban's pulling out that last time out. I don't know why you wouldn't make them snap it again down here. Michigan's got both timeouts. Nick Saban not using this last time out, Don. Uh, they're at their own two-yard line, Michigan is. Why would you not make them snap the ball? Why would you concede to, to overtime here? Well, there's certainly a ch- – let's face it, 22-20 to 20 would be a great win. You know, there's a chance for a safety. They're they're at, they're actually slightly inside their own two, and Alabama's not going to call a timeout. Uh, three seconds, two seconds, one second, and there is a timeout with one second left. Saban calls the timeout with one second on the clock. Isn't this interesting? That's I guess a little so. bizarre. Maybe somebody simply changed his mind. Well, I no, I, mean, wait, I don't know why you wait to take it to one second. Though is my point. Well, because uh, Michigan's got two timeouts, I suppose if they knocked off a big run and there was some time left on the clock, Saban, you know, you wouldn't want to give them that extra time. You're either yeah. going to get a stop here or you're not. You've got one timeout left, right? You're either going to force the safety but or you're not. They both had timeouts, right? Alabama could have taken a couple of timeouts and forced Michigan to Alabama's snap. Alabama's only got one timeout, Don. That's what I'm saying. Only one. So okay. th- this was their only timeout. So this is why Saban, I think, I don't know why the uh, Michigan punt returner tried to field the ball inside the five. It makes zero sense whatsoever. And he nearly got canned for a safety because that ball bounced backwards. That would have been the game. In fact, no, he, actually like, muffed, he actually muffed the punt. Had he to muffed recover. The punt. He wow. muffed the punt. So now they're at their own two yard line. And now they put 12, they put 12 seconds on the clock and uh, Michigan goes to a quick kneel. And it looks like we're headed to overtime. So they were able to, to get the kneel down. Uh, in the uh, field of play, and we're headed to overtime in the uh, college football semifinals. Um, <laughs> who's who has deserved the win more than the other team right now? Would you maybe you haven't had enough chance to see it? I guess who's that played here? I'm keeping my eye on it, but I, I, yeah, I couldn't tell you. Is this the uh, first? Is this the first overtime game in the final four? I think it might be. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I wouldn't be an authority on that, but I think you're right. Let's get through our last few calls so we can get move on. We've been on here for four hours long. We'll go to Tom. We'll go to Parker. We'll go to Kyle. We'll go to Lemansky. We'll go with Tom first, and we'll try to keep this relatively speedy. Good to see you, Tom. 
I'll make it short. Hey, Corey, I called in uh, probably six weeks ago. Finally got StreamYard figured out. Had to wait for my brother-in-law to show, or my son-in-law to figure it out. But we're well, on. So we're did. ready for basketball season. Good deal. Hey, I was in and out watching the game. Didn't pay much attention after it was 14 nothing. Um, we're still farming. We're in the field tonight. Um, but I just wanted to call in. Corey, Don. Corey, if you have a problem getting Don signed and it's money or something, just call me or send me a text message because he All needs right. to be on next year. Sounds good. And I'll keep you. I'll keep you. On, you I'll make keep you, on you make my fall. I'm not going to complain about the Hawks tonight. We made it to a New Year's Bowl game. We were in a Big Ten championship. I'm not going to complain about anything tonight. So, uh, good season. Yeah, disappointing, but we've had them before, and I'm glad we at least got here. The Big Ten has been disappointing. Ohio State and uh, and Mich Michigan's probably going to get beat. But Penn State looked horrible. You know, I mean, I granted, I understand they didn't have players, but that's probably been in every bowl game. So, um, Big Ten, it looks tough on the Big Ten. Doesn't look good. So, keep it up, keep it short, and I'll, I'll listen on. Okay, hey, Tom and Corey. I got uh, Sandy brought me tickets to a girls basketball game. Good for you. Be the first girls basketball game I've been to in about 12 years. Which one are you going to? Penn State. Okay. Well, it, it, they'll all be February packed. February 8th. So, uh, so it, it'll be I'll, have to, I'll have to call in on the way home, you know. So, Please but, do. Uh, so we're, we're going to go to a girls game. We'll catch you later. Okay. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Tom. Have a happy New Year. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Good, Tom. Be safe out in the fields. Um, let's go to Parker, who's been on hold. Parker's a Tennessee fan. Welcome, Parker. Appreciate the super chat earlier and for jumping on and being patient with us. What's up, guys? Uh, I just want to say respect to you, Don. Uh, I don't know when you've uh, coached Iowa, but you do seem really knowledgeable of the game. I've a uh, I've been listening for about an hour at least, and I listened to y'all's pregame show a little bit. So, yeah, I've, I've actually really enjoyed uh, listening to y'all's perspective on everything and whatnot. But, uh, I am I mean, I'm not, like, tooting my own horn at all, but I'm, I'm pretty knowledgeable about uh, Tennessee and our players and everything going on there. And I was just wondering if y'all had any questions about – Things. And also, before that, I I wanted to say um, our D-line versus y'all's O-line, I wanted to say y'all's O-line put up a better fight than quite a few uh, SEC teams that we faced this year. And and I know I know some people earlier were talking about, you know, it was it was a bad O-line play on Iowa's end and all this and that. But. I really liked the way y'all's y'all's whole team really was just physical, especially on the defensive side. But that O line was physical. They 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 didn't give up as much as I thought they would. James Pierce, who got the interception, got maybe a sack or something something else. That guy has the second most sacks in the SEC as a sophomore. That guy is the most um, twitchiest player I have ever seen in the trenches, ever. I've never seen a twitchier player than that guy. Other than other than Reggie White, I'll give Reggie White that. But uh, yeah, I just want to say respect to y'all. Also, also, um, there's another point I was going to bring up. Oh, y'all were talking about your your offensive, trying to hire an offensive uh, guy trying to hire, seeing what schemes would fit y'all's best. I do want to bring this point up. When Hypo got here, so we had just we had just gotten out of a uh, – Jeremy Pruitt was our head coach, and there was a recruiting scandal, all that happened. We lost over 40 guys of our roster to the transfer portal. Our entire starters, all of our playmakers, everything – in our in Heupel's first year trying to put puzzle pieces back together for Tennessee, he ended up uh he ended up going, I think, seven and six seven and six. 
maybe maybe yeah, seven and six and in the regular season and then went seven and seven after the bowl game. No, yeah, that's wrong. Seven and six. Uh we lost to Purdue off of a messed up uh we ran the ball in, the ball crossed the plane, and then they called it back and they, they said it, it wasn't a touchdown, but it Music was. But anyways, Music City Bowl. Music City Bowl. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That was very controversial. But anyways, my point is Heupel's offense has led us. We aren't the most talented, but we beat Alabama last year because we had – Decent O-line. I say decent. We had one tackle who was a top 10 pick in the draft. But the rest of them were kind of pedestrian, like mid-level SEC players. We had a decent O-line, but we had a solid quarterback, and we had two wide receivers out of the three that were really good, and we had a good blocking tight end. And it's because of his system, his system, got us that far it we we would not have won that game unless it was for his offense and those two wide receivers and that one quarterback and the o-line being at least pedestrian and giving us a chance and and i just want to say if if y'all could find someone like that um who has an offense that that could bridge the gap maybe maybe y'all aren't getting quite the talent that the Michigans and the the Ohio states are getting but y'all have a guy y'all have one guy who's speedy and one guy who's six five and can go up and catch a jump ball whenever you need him to if y'all could get two guys on the edge a quarterback that was that was I'm not gonna say hen and hooker level even just a guy who can who can pass and who can break out of the pocket like y'all need to. Y'all's backup, he couldn't pass, but he he knew when he needed to tuck the ball and run today. Yeah, and if he could get that – And again, go ahead. Like, keep in mind, as you know, you know, we keep saying he didn't pass well. He had seven attempts, and he was put in an impossible position where your guys were able right. to tee off on him late in the game. Absolutely. Down so let's give the guy an opportunity when the game's in doubt like Deacon Hill has been given. Right, and and I I I wasn't impressed at all with the the Deacon Hill. I I, I wish that y'all would have put that other guy in a little bit quicker because let's face it, in today's game, when you have a quarterback that can, when he has to break out of the pocket and go get that third down uh, conversion, whether it be third and eight, third and five, you know where you're you're passing, but you have that option to hit hit up the field real quick and get that first down. You need guys like that and and you have to surround them with players that will that will keep, continue to play blockers that as they know if we give him a chance, he can get it done. You have to give him that that chance. And Parker, how impressed were you with Marco from a Tennessee perspective? How imp- impressed were you with his mobility when he came into the game at quarterback? I I he looked he okay. I'm not going to say he looked like Jalen Milrow because I'm watching him right now. He just ran 15 yards, and it took two seconds to get there. But he he absolutely tucked the ball and ran when he needed to. There, he, he kept his eyes downfield until he realized, all right, I've got to make a play. And he, there was no – there was no um, – Joe Milton – which was our quarterback that didn't start today, played all season. Joe Milton, he would he would wait. He would be like, ah, I don't want to run. Okay, now I'll run. And he'd come up short two or three yards. Yeah. Your guy today, he showed, you know, I have the confidence. I'm going to tuck it and run. I'm going to choose what I want to do right here, right now, and I'm going to do it. And that's what he did. And I, I, was I, I really like that. Escapability, but I was impressed, Don, with what Parker's saying, his composure in the pocket. And uh, he just chose the right times. He seemed, at least in the little bit of time that we watched him, he seems to have a much better internal clock than Deacon. Small sample size, but like Deacon just holds the ball forever. That's why he fumbles the ball so much because he holds the ball forever. He's got no internal clock, 
Marco realizes, okay, my internal clock's going off. Time to find some space. And he's shifty, and he's got speed, and he's got athleticism. So I agree. Parker, my one question to you as a Tennessee fan, and we can let you go, but uh, my one question to you would be, what difference did you see at your quarterback position between Nico and, and Joe Milton? Do you think quarterback play was better today than you'd seen throughout the season with a more experienced Milton? It was way better. It was way better. The The decisiveness – the accuracy, the legs. I mean, this this dude, I don't know if y'all – y'all may not know too much about him, but he really – he was the number one quarterback in on three. He was the number one player coming out of on three last year. He come to us, and he's he's getting paid $8 million. Now that, that, now that you're an 18-year-old getting paid $8 million, and you come in and you don't – you played 53 snaps out of 12 games leading up to this game, 53 snaps. And a, a quarterback above you was not playing playing near as good as this guy did today. And uh, he, he was average. Joe Milton was average. But but you see flashes of why this guy's paid $8 million And he comes in humble and he comes in just hungry to show off his confidence, but it's a quiet confidence. So I, I think his mobility and his accuracy and his decisiveness of when to tuck and run, when to all right, read, 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 throw. He he doesn't he doesn't question himself mm-hmm. at all. He, he just makes the decision and goes with it. And and you can see the difference between that and Joe Milton that we've had all year. And uh and uh, I definitely think he, he helped us this game. And uh, I do want to compliment y'all's defense on – I don't want to take anything away from y'all's D-line because y'all's D-line did play a really good game. Um, and also, I, I think y'all – y'all a little bit of the problem why we even put up 35 on y'all is because um, y'all were – let me get the right words. Y'all were trying to stop the big plays. You know, y'all were trying to stop the big plays, but our we used the big plays with our running backs. We had big plays with our running backs because y'all were trying to stop the air big plays. We didn't have one big play through there the whole game. Well, real quick, go before, ahead. Before, yeah. before I let you go, Parker, just want to let everybody know Michigan scored a touchdown in overtime. It's 27-20, fourth and goal for Alabama with an opportunity to tie it and send it to a second overtime. If Michigan gets the stop, game is over. Michigan advances to the championship game. We've got a timeout for Michigan. So it's fourth. <laughs> uh, appreciate you calling in, sir, and uh, best wishes to your, your Vols moving forward. And I got a lot of respect for Heupel and company. Parker, right. I do have one question for you. Go, go ahead. Don. Yeah. One question, Parker. How concerned were you – Realizing you had an inexperienced corner out there, how concerned were you that we weren't going to go after him? Um, I really, I really wasn't too concerned. Okay, I I knew we had patchwork O line. We only had three out of our five starting linemen, and one was playing out of position. He was playing left tackle when he normally plays right tackle. I we. I was a bit concerned, and in the early part of the game, when y'all were getting multiple sacks, that <clears> – I mean, throughout the game, y'all got multiple sacks, but I was very concerned. But with the elite level of our quarterback being able to tuck it and run, make decisions quickly and decisively, that – it was a concern into leading into the game, but once we saw a couple drives, we we were a lot happier with – with what we saw and a lot more confident that this guy's going to be able to run the offense at an elite level. Thank you for the call, Parker. Appreciate your, your take. Do appreciate hearing from a Vol and a respectful Vol at that. So um, thank you for that, Parker. And appreciate you being patient as well. Another timeout now, Alabama calls for time. It's uh, still fourth and goal. So we'll see what happens here. DC Hawk, I appreciate the super chat. Don't believe much change occurs until Kirk retires. He was responsible for all of this. All of it. 
Thank you for the super chat, DC Hawkeye. Very much appreciated. Erica, thank you for the super chat. Hoping new OC brings some new receivers, O-lineman, quarterback, wide receiver, coach, etc. Barnett and Copeland need to go. That said, can't wait to hear a Hayden story tonight. We'll get that in as well. And Erica, yes, uh, she was talking about Drew Tate as a quarterback's coach, not as an OC. So appreciate that super chat as well. Here comes maybe the final play of the game, Don. Jalen Milrow and Alabama. Uh, can a Big Ten team make it to the national title game? Milrow at the three-yard line. It's fourth and goal. Goal, a man in motion. Milrow will run up the middle and will not get there, and the game is over. Michigan advances to the national championship. Uh, interesting play call and a QB draw from the uh, four-yard line on fourth and goal. And um, all those uh, very respectful Michigan fans are, I'm sure, very happy. Let's go to uh, – <laughs> Don agrees with that. <laughs> All right, it's let's my job easier because I've already broken down most of the Michigan games. Yeah, there you go. All right, uh, let's go to our final caller of the night. We're at the four minute ten or four hour ten minute mark. Let's go to uh, let's go to Kyle. Kyle's been waiting here for literally four hours. Thank you, Kyle, for being patient. Um, yeah, you never know how many people are going to be calling in and uh, you know doing what they do. So thank you for for moderating and for being patient. I was uh, calling in right as the Alabama Michigan game was about getting ready to to get underway. <laughs> <You're done. laughs> and now we're done. The whole game happened while you well, the whole game happened while we were on the air. So that makes yeah, sense. I, I, I was thinking, you know, I might call in and maybe catch the second half, but <laughs> whatever. It's Michigan. We don't uh, care. Yeah, we'll we'll all be watching Texas Washington. I think that's fair. Absolutely, so. we will. Could be Big Ten against Big Ten uh for next year if Washington can yeah. pull it off. Yeah, how about that would be a good representation for I mean, I know they're not in the Big Ten yet, but that would be a, a representation. Yeah. Um, but by the way, before you uh, before you comment, Kyle, I just want to before I forget, Don, um, it, I see this comment from Larry in the chat. Bama with the Brian like bonehead play call. Um, so I, I didn't there wasn't any necessarily particular play that I thought was a huge bonehead play call. But I did think what Kyle said earlier in the private chat was fair running the ball on third and 17. Um, handing the ball off on third and 17 there doesn't make any sense, Don. It doesn't no. make any sense. You're in four down territory. Running the ball for two yards, for three yards, for four yards doesn't do anything. It's a stupid play call. If you're gonna if you're gonna run the ball, maybe go Q draw, maybe go halfback draw, but I'd be more apt to let Marco create on his own in a pass formation. And um, you know, there's not much of a difference between fourth and fifteen and fourth and seventeen. <laughs> So, so just right. try to get a chunky yard just four down territory. Right. I would have certainly, you know, nothing wrong if you want to. You, obviously, you're going for a fourth down. But to think you're going to bust a simple dive play or an inside zone, if you will, not likely at all. No, mis, you know, no, no misdirection. You know, I mean, by misdirection, I mean, even if you show pass and run a draw play, of course, there's a chance you're going to going to gash them up front and, and maybe gain, maybe not 17, but gain half or more of it. And um, we gained a couple of yards, and now we're fourth and 15. And amazingly enough, uh, Marco converted anyway on fourth and 15. But we were we were fortunate that we converted on that play, of course. Um, that was a dumb call. I said, why are we running the ball on third and 17? But – uh, there were other times, for sure, when there was a good play called. I like this, the fly sweep on third and three. That's a good call early in the game. That made sense. Um, but there are any number of other plays, of course, that might not have made as much sense as you hoped. Don, how uh, about this quote from Dave Fleming, the play-by-play -play guy? Hawkeye fans have watched the same game over and over again. Brock Osweiler adds, they just can't generate points. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Those are pretty straightforward comments. I didn't think I actually enjoyed the commentary because I didn't think Dave Fleming or Brock Osweiler held back at all. Like there's no sympathy for this being, oh, it's Brian's final game. Let's all shed tears. Like it was just, hey, this offense sucks. <laughs> yeah. It sucked all year. It sucked all year, boys and girls. And boy, hit the nail on the head as far as analysis, they scored zero. True. <laughs> you know, uh, I because I'm I'm I've got some stuff here. I was just looking through while I was waiting to get on, but I think we need to we need to make one edit to the show here, Corey. You've got a nice bottom ticker there. 
What I want you to do, because I'm going to be a little critical of Kirk Ferentz here, I want you to delete everything off of it and put, to be clear, Kirk is a great man, great father, great coach, just so that I have, you know, people's, you know, as a qualifier for if I'm critical of him because, you know, we can't attack him, right? So we have to, we might have to put some qualifiers in while, while I read this stuff off. Okay. Uh, I'm putting that on the bottom ticker right now. So there you go. <laughs> I didn't think it'd be that quick. Great. Um, so, and first thing I want to say too, that's just hilarious is this team is so wacky and weird that they were one like just pathetic, horrible, terrible officiating call from being 11 and 0 in games that they scored points. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's one way to look at it. I, I get that, but they could have tacked on a field goal today. They, they could have easily scored three points on that Marco Linez drive, but they could have, but it's, it's just another, you know, just another fun. They would have, they would have been 11 and 0 in games that they scored and 0 and three in games. They didn't. Yeah. Uh, can I just say real quick before you go on, because things flash out of my mind too quickly, Don, I actually was really pleasantly, I was happy when I saw Marco Linez when he missed that throw on the run. It was a bad throw at his receiver's feet. I think it was at Addison Estringa's feet. You saw Marco. Yeah, I think he said something probably a little naughty to himself, but he was right. upset. He, you could see he was he was ticked at himself. Right. That's what you want to see out of a quarterback. You don't want to see ah crap. Ah darn it. Ah crap. That, let's we'll move on. Ah, go 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 get him next time, Donnie. Yeah, <laughs> like I feel like what, that's what we had to deal with for like three years, and it was just good to see emotion, frustration towards himself because, you know, I don't think he's got a confidence issue, but I think that's part of being a leader, right? Is is being frustrated. There's nothing wrong with being frustrated when when you do something when you fail in some way, and I think the fans need to see that too. Yeah, nothing wrong with being mad as yourself. For what just happened. Absolutely. Go ahead, Kyle. So, yeah, so a couple, couple things that I thought would, was interesting. So talking about the end of the season here, just first of all, funny that that Marshall meter field goal was, was our last points of the year. But also it's been 15 quarters since Iowa had a touchdown drive longer than 60 yards. Um, so they just, I mean, they just can't drive the field. They can't. If they, if they don't get the ball in basically opponent's territory, they can't they can't score a touchdown. Um, and I, I saw the stat earlier that you brought up, Corey, that was on Twitter that was 92-0 to zero in the last three games against ranked opponents for this year. Um, they also have seven straight losses against ranked opponents, and the last win was that 21 Penn State team that went on to finish 7-6. and six. That was their last ranked win. Um, Yikes. That's, but those – yeah. That's the, uh, that's a scary stat. It's pathetic. Yeah. Seven straight and their last win was a team well, that's that more of a really to the weak. You can't really blame Iowa a ton for some of that, but that's more of a testament to the the crap that has been the Big Ten West these last two seasons because Iowa's won games throughout that stretch. Yeah. Uh, but they just, and, and they have not won the, the games against great opponents, but they haven't had as many opportunities as they should playing in this conference. Yeah. Yeah. So those uh those last three games that were kind of highlighted for this year, they had um they had 404 total yards in those three games and 404 yards for reference would barely crack the top 50 in total offense for one game. They would rank 404 yards would rank 49th in total offense in the country. And they got that in three games. Uh, and in those three games, they had 10 turnovers. They were four or nine of 46 on critical downs and they averaged 1.9 yards a carry. The offense actually didn't score zero points. That's, that's incorrect. The offense scored negative 34 points, in my opinion, because that's the number of points that the offense gave up either on defensive scores or on turnovers that resulted in a scoring drive of less than 10 yards by the opponent. 34 wow. points were given up by uh, <laughs> drives of less than 10 yards after after the uh, the turnover. So, Which supports the idea of us just punting on early downs, I guess you're going to say. Well, that's why it's so pathetic that they lose by 35, but – you could argue Deacon Hill cost them 21 points at minimum. Absolutely. He cost them 17 because they had a, is you just throw the ball out of the back of the end zone. They have a chip shot field goal to get three. He throws a pick six that ends up in seven and he fumbles at his own two yard line. Right. <laughs> You're just like, just here you go. Here's points. Just, oh, yeah. just gift wrapping points for the, for the opponent. 
Yeah, they, there was a there was some advanced analytical account, and I don't know how they do this, but they take the the turnovers and the yards gained off the turnovers and all that stuff, and they factor all that in, and they come up with like an average uh, yards per play for a quarterback. Uh, so while Deacon was in the game, Iowa they they factoring in the turnovers. They said that um, if if they took the turnovers out, it would would have been the equivalent of Iowa just taking like a three and a half yard loss on each play. So according to their analytics, Iowa would have had a better chance to win the game just kneeling the ball literally every single down, um, which is just <laughs> crazy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. this isn't all analytics for the game. There were four things I talked about. And I thought we had a good chance to do any number of those four things. We were 0 for 4. We didn't do any of them. Yeah. Is it any wonder it was one-sided? Not yeah. at all. Yeah. But they uh, – in so in, in, in Deacon's uh, – I think it was – was it nine games that he played in? Michigan State was week five, right? So first four games he – so I guess he played ten games. He started nine. Um, he had 19 tur- turnovers. I think that's been pretty widely talked about. Uh, he averaged 80 net yards per game with sacks included in that, I think. Um, and in, in his uh, possessions as quarterback, Iowa went three and out in over 60% of them, um, which is just nuts. Um, they are over 40 total yards now behind the second worst offense in the country, which is Kent State. Um, per game. Per game, yep. Well, by um, the way, real quick, real quick timeout. Did you know? Heading into this game, Iowa had the fourth worst pass offense. In other words, total pass yards per game. Fourth worst pass offense in the country. Don, do you want to take a stab at who the three teams below them are? I got it. <laughs> Don? Army. Navy. <laughs> not Air Force. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw that too. It was the three service academies. Isn't that interesting? And none of those teams took more than 200 attempts. Had more than 200 attempts. <laughs> they run they run triple option. <laughs> I had well over 300 attempts. Can, can we honestly say we wouldn't have been better off running triple option with Caleb Brown and LaShawn Williams beside Marco Linez today? <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of things we've been better off uh, doing, Kyle. Okay. But uh yeah, I mean I it's it again, they're just those are a bunch of stats they don't really matter at this point just to show how bad it is. And I, I, I just don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on the get Brian out of here train, but I just don't think this is one person. Like I, this is Kirk's got to wear this. It's not one person, Kyle, but yeah. Can we agree that this is the biggest issue? Yes, I can agree. It's the biggest issue besides maybe the bigger issue being Kirk allowing it to happen. If you want to argue that, but yeah, I mean, but it doesn't matter if he allowed it to happen now because he's being forced to yeah. not continue to allow it to happen. Yeah. Um, would I acknowledge that I think it, it would probably serve the offense well if Kirk wasn't here anymore? Yes. But the problem is it would hurt the defense. It would hurt the special teams. It would hurt the team culture in general. He's really exceptional at what he does as a head coach. But you're right about the blind spot. And the hope now is if they get Paul Christ or if they get someone else that's a big name, that that offensive coordinator will be allowed to work his system to an extent. And, Don, you've made the comment, if a good offensive coordinator, an, an adept offensive coordinator, could be given the personnel that Iowa has and just some leeway with play calling, you could do a lot better. It, it's possible to do a lot better than what we've seen here in the last three years. Is that fair? A lot better. Yes. There you go. It's going to require the right person to do it. Someone with a, a lot of experience that's coached football more than just a little while. Because I promise you, and a good example we talked about was Andy Reid. You know, Andy Reid's got a wealth of knowledge. So Andy Reid's sitting here thinking, you know what, we got to get back on track. Let's go back and use a play we used last year. Hadn't run it this year at all. Put it in the game at a critical time, and it produced the winning points. That's what good coaches can do. And and I, I don't doubt that Kirk's been contacted by some people that have very impressive resumes and that have coached long enough to operate within certain constraints, such as Kirk saying, I want this formation to be part of what we're doing. And, oh, by the way, I want to run the ball more than half the time out of this formation. Can you help me with that? Yes, I can. 
Um, we have difficulty versus this particular defensive alignment versus that formation. Can you help us to solve that? Yes, I can. Uh, not to be talking any way other than honestly. Yes, I have a good idea of how to attack that that defensive alignment. There have been things we've done to that particular alignment that will work. And, yes, I have an awareness that it, it also still fits your personnel. I think Kirk will find a guy that can do that. And it's not going to be a radical change. And All those fans that are worried about us making a radical change on offense, that's not going to happen. Kirk's not going to allow it to happen. Who's worried about who's worried about a radical change, Don? I think, I think <laughs> Probably not a worried. single soul out there. I think people are worried that there won't be a radical change. Right. Well, I can let them know right now. It's not going to be radical. Uh, but can we make an improvement with what we're doing out of any and all formations? I think the, yeah. the point yes, needs to be that the point needs to be that if if there is somebody dynamic brought in or somebody that's really, really good at what they do, the compromise between their offensive system and coaches, the coach Kirk's philosophy, the compromise can't all be on the new offensive coordinator. Kirk has got to let go in some ways. Would I be right in that? Like the, the compromise can't all be on the new guy to, to just fit in. Kirk has also got to cater what he does to yeah, a new guy who's already give and take. Yeah, there should be some give and take. Absolutely. Because, yeah. they, I mean, they've, they they when, when was the last time you think Iowa had a top 60 offense? I don't know. Been, uh, I can tell you it would have been 2005. 10. They had it once in 2010. They were 58th and – 2005 was the previous time, I believe, in total in total yards. 2010, they were 58. So that's weird because they trying they to didn't, remember. They didn't have a great year in 2010 either. That was the year that there was a lot of hype heading in. You got Adrian Claiborne back. You got DJK back. And I, I'm just trying to figure out what happened. I know they had the close loss on the fake punt from Brett Bielema's Badgers, and I'm just trying to figure out what happened that year. They had some some close losses and won their bowl game to finish the year, but uh, didn't didn't hit expectations. Yeah, but 14, I mean, 14 or 13 consecutive years, I guess, without a top 60 offense and eight of the last 12, they've been out of the top 90. Um, and we we went through it last year, too. I think if you remember coordinator by coordinator last year um, from the bottom 25 in the country in total offense and 22, I went back and looked at it, 22 of the bottom 25 last year got fired of the bottom offensive coordinators in total total yardage. 22 of those 25 got fired. So and Brian survived three years in a row of being one of the nine worst in the country in total offense. Um, and he also survived being a bottom 20 offense in what? Not this year in total offense, this century in total offense. Out of the 3,000 teams that have been put forth in Division one or in FBS football, he was a bottom 20 offense this year out of 3,000, um, which is just astounding. And he's the other, the other stat I saw that was interesting, too, is he's almost – Iowa is almost 60 yards worse per game than the worst-ranked team this century. I think it was an 05 team, maybe West Virginia 05 or something. Wow. That was They had like 290-something yards per game, and they're the, that's the worst total offense of a team that finished ranked in the AP poll this, this century. Let me so if there's, any, if there's any good news that relates to all that, really what you're kind of suggesting, Kyle, if we could just be in the middle of the pack in terms of scoring offense, we should have a chance to really make our mark even next year. If oh, we could yeah. just be 65th. I Which, mean, 133 right now, I guess. Yeah. So 67 would be right in the middle, right? Yeah. Let me just share – Real quick, this is a, a tweet from Chad Lightstico, the Des Moines Register. Um, I like this quote because uh, I think it tells a lot. Uh, he says, Iowa linebacker Nick Jackson says that Marco Linez has steadily improved since being on the scout team in August. Linez only played the final two drives but led Iowa in rushing today. He was cooking. He's a heck of a football player. His mobility is insane, and he just works on his craft a lot. He's always there working after practice for him to go out and compete like he did as a true freshman hats off to him. I'm really proud of him and I'm excited for him. And uh, let me just say this. I, I had a discussion. I won't drop a name, but I had a discussion with uh, an Iowa football player who is a starter and starts on defense. And this was maybe a couple months ago. It was during the season. 
And this was off the air. I asked him the question. I said, hey, how's Marco Linez looking? And he said, well, you know, we, you know, we don't get a great look out of him during the season. But one thing he did say, Don, was, you know, during fall camp, Marco Linez was insane as far as making people run around, making linemen work their tails off. Like he made the comment, he's different than any quarterback we've had here that yeah. I can remember, that I've been a part of since I've been here. And um, he's like, yeah, I don't know where he's at as far as his passing ability. Um, and sure, he's going to continue to work on that. But boy, uh, athletically, he's a different different type of cat. Yeah, That's man. a lot of, re- lot of reason for optimism going forward. I was going to say, Corey, do you have any indication from those type of people that have said anything about his passing game? Because obviously we didn't get a great look at it today. But is there any anything you've heard about that? Uh, no, I haven't really asked. I mean, that was the only thing that was was said to me was, you know, I don't really know where he's at as a, as a passer, but I can tell you he's mobile as all get out. Um, you know, again, Don, you looked at some high school film. You can only tell so much uh, from high school film, but he showed to be have a good arm uh, on film. Um, and I don't think Iowa, I don't think Ken O'Keefe would have recruited him if he didn't have a good arm. Like we always talk about well, Spencer Peters has a big arm and Deacon Hill has a big arm. Well, there's more than quarterback with just having a big arm right don uh we talk about groove throwing motion um you know foot mechanics just everything involved with being a, a big 10 quarterback um hard to evaluate marco based on seven play seven passes and you know uh a defensive unit that could tee off on him up 28-0 right so right the one the one constant in general with our quarterbacks is they all have ne- the necessary arm strength. The one variable that sometimes has not shown up is escapability. Some have had it and some have not. And um, I think you very really definitely need both to be effective as a quarterback. Marco has both. Um, anything else, Kyle? I know that the Washington, Texas game just now got underway. So uh, Lomanski says you're making him sick with stats. <laughs> So, uh, well, uh, then, if you if you listen to it with your ears and it makes you sick, then it probably made you sick to watch it with your eyes, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> Al, appreciate the time, sir, and we'll we'll chat soon. Yep. Thank you guys for a great season. Hope to hope to have you back next year. But if not, Coach Don, we're we're dragging Corey out to Finkbine this year. Hey, I'm I'm I agree. We need to get that done. We do. I'll be there all year. Thanks, Al. Uh, Jason in the chat, Corey, any further info on the secret candidate that's been thrown out there in the last week or so? Uh, No, I don't have anything to share and won't have anything to share. If Kirk decides to go with this other candidate that has not been named publicly, then we'll know, right? Well, it'll be public, but uh, I was told that that's being kept close to the vest by Kirk and by the individuals involved with that process, including the individual who reached out to Kirk about the job. Uh, But, you know, will Kirk be willing to make that type of a big name decision and kind of go away from some of his philosophy and, and, you know, I don't know, uh, it'd be going out of his comfort zone if, if he were to to go that direction, but I I can't share any more on here. Let Uh, me suggest to you one reason maybe that he might be willing to do that is precisely how the game played out today. That matter of fact, just thinking a little bit, you've always heard me use the expression, drastic times call for drastic measures. Well, the fact that we were shut out in our last two games, maybe he's a little more inclined to think outside the box in terms of his comfort level, a little more inclined to consider someone maybe that he hadn't considered in the past. Lomansky, it says, uh, my phone died. I have three Hayden stories that will hold for another day. So I, Lomansky was on hold, I think, for like over an hour. Thank you for being a trooper, Lomansky. I do appreciate that. I was trying to get to you, and I saw you hung up. But uh, thank you for your support, all your support. And we'll have you back for, for basketball, I'm sure, tomorrow. Chris Bacon with the Super Chat. Thank you, Chris, or Super Sticker, I should say. Thank you, Chris. Do appreciate that and uh, for being here, for your support, etc. Um, Let's see. uh 
Jason wants to know if the secret candidate is college or NFL. I, I'm telling I don't have any more information to share, Jason. I probably don't have any more information to share. I know everybody wants to know. I get it. I don't have any more to share, but um, just know there's a possibility that it's not someone that we've heard of or someone that, that has been out there publicly. That's been publicly named. Let's just say that. Uh, Jared, uh, Don is the secret candidate. Um, not anymore. Not anymore. I'm not. Patrick says, pay defense and special teams coaches more. Offensive coaches, not so much. Thank you for being a, a premium subscriber, Patrick. Do appreciate that. Brandon, but Corey, he's good in practice. Give us a break, Kirk. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. Uh, David Bryan, what do you guys think about Bill Bryan as a potential OC? Yeah, I was impressed with him with what he did at, at Penn State. He went but into a he, he he was in some hot water this week because of some comments apparently that he made directed toward Jalen Milrow when he was the OC there. Apparently he was advocating for Milrow to change positions. Right. So but but I mean I, I have no doubt that he's he'd be qualified for the job. I think Bill O'Brien knows a lot about football. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um Joey O. Appreciate your outstanding insight. Thank you so much. Highlight of the season. Grateful. Thanks much. Thank you, Joey O. Thank you, Joey. Parker, thank you for the super chat, Parker, our Tennessee fan that was on with us a little bit ago. Y'all were you're cool. Thanks for putting for letting me on. Go Vols and Hawkeyes. Thank you, Parker. Do appreciate that. He says, uh, fun fact, Michael Penix Jr. was actually committed to Tennessee. Jeremy Pruitt turned him away when he got hired as the OC, or the, excuse me, as the head coach. Interesting. And Penix, of course, uh, playing for National semifinalist uh, Washington Huskies, as we speak. T. Hank, Corey, do you think this year was a success? I don't think the offense. I don't. The offense was absolutely disgraceful. Didn't put up any fight in the games they were ranked. Went ninety-two and zero this year. Got shut out in all three games. I wouldn't say this year was a success. Uh, you won the, the Big Ten West, but you didn't compete at all. I think the only way that I would have said with this level of offense that hey, this year was a success is if you could have showed well against a really good SEC team in the in the uh, bowl game and or went to the Big Ten Championship game and at least competed. And the defense competed, but 26-0 was not competing. So right. that's what I'd say. Uh, Washington just scored a touchdown, Don. They're on the board 7-0. So we'll uh, we'll get off here so we can enjoy some, some football, Don. Tennessee defeating Iowa 35-0 in the Citrus Bowl. And just a quick uh, rundown of some significant stats in this game. Deacon Hill uh, really struggled. 7 of 18. Through the air, two interceptions for Deacon, no touchdowns. One of those interceptions came in the end zone. The other one was a pick six, also fumbled at his own goal line. 56 yards, took four sacks. Marco Linez was just two of seven through the air. He came in leg, took just one sack, though, and actually ran for 51 yards on the ground. So a breath of fresh air for a young guy who's got tremendous upside as a true freshman. Caleb Johnson was held to 34 yards on seven carries did average just about five yards per carry LeSean Williams struggled 17 yards uh, on six carries Terrell Washington Jr. six uh, excuse me two carries for 16 yards and a little bit concerning that Jazz Patterson got just two carries Don I, I sure hope we don't see him enter the portal here in the next few days I, I just think that that is not a great sign for a young guy that I'm high on um, Kamari Moulton actually got more carries than Jazz Moulton four carries for just two yards. Um, as far as receptions, Addison Estringa had just two care, excuse me, two catches for Addison, 14 yards. Caleb Brown, three receptions on six targets, had a couple drops, 39 total yards for Caleb Brown on the day. Steven Silianos had a catch for four yards. LaShawn Williams had one catch and that was it. No catches for, uh, or excuse me, two yard, two catches for Nico as well. Three yards total. No catches for Zach Ortworth, who did play, got a target. Jacob Bostic played, had a target. Kamari Moulton got a target. Caleb Johnson had a target as well. Nothing for Caden Weijin in the return game. That continues to be, uh, I mean, he he had, I think, one good return late in the game to like a 35-yard line, but it's been a struggle. The return game has been a struggle since Caden Weijin went down. Kickoff returns really are just a thing of the past. I wish more teams would advance the ball, but I understand why they don't. Um. Tennessee outgained Iowa 25 first downs to 11, 232 rushing yards for the Vols to Iowa's 113, 60 pass yards for Iowa, 151 for Tennessee. Uh, penalties were going to be a story heading into the game. Five penalties against the Hawks for 41 total yards, just three against the Vols for 30 yards. Give Tim, uh, or excuse me, Coach Heupel, 
uh, some credit for cleaning that up during bowl prep. And on critical downs, Iowa was actually two of 15 on third down, uh, four of 19 in total. So horrendous numbers. Tennessee wasn't much better. They were five of 14, three of 12 on third downs. Certainly better, but not all that, but not that much better. Didn't really matter because they didn't have as many critical downs. And, you know, they were given short fields and given points off turnovers, et cetera. So uh, it is what it is there. Um, no field goals today, Don. How about that? No field goal attempts for either team. So one of Iowa's best weapons, Drew Stevens, was not able to be used, and uh, that hurts as well. Um, Iowa's defense did not create any turnovers, especially with a true freshman at quarterback. You expected maybe a little bit better showing there. Jay Higgins had a tremendous day, 16 tackles. We'll get him back next year. That's huge news, including a sack. Nick Jackson had nine tackles, excuse me, 11 tackles total, nine of which were solo. We're awaiting a decision on his future. We're also awaiting a decision from Sebastian Castro and Quinn Schulte. Those guys had 11 tackles combined. Ethan Herkett did not play today. Max Llewellyn filled in admirably. Five tackles for Max. Deontay Craig, three tackles. Aaron Graves with three. Jamari Harris with three. Logan Lee with three. And then Xavier Wampa, John Nestor, Deshaun Lee, Cohen Intringer, Jackson Rexroth, Devin Hilson, and Chris Reams all had a tackle. Uh, Chris got to see some time, I think, with with Herkett being out. Remember, he missed some time earlier in the year due to suspension with the whole gambling thing. So I'm thinking this is his final uh, final game as a Hawkeye. So it was good to see him back uh, out on the field. And uh, our RTI Threads player of the game, Don, uh, as we stated earlier, was none other than Joe Evans, the Ames native, five tackles, four sacks. Uh, best wishes to Joe. I hope uh, he gets a shot at the next level of whatever position that may be. Um, and uh, I got nothing else, Don. Uh, it's been a pleasure. We still got just about three. We actually went down to like 250 people watching for a while. And then when that first semifinal game ended, we, our numbers went back up by like a hundred. So we're at about 350 people watching right now between the two channels. So uh, I don't know what to say. It's just been a pleasure. I'm, I'm honored to do this show with you, Don, and you are a, a great friend and a great uh, co-host. So uh, I, I just really appreciate this I, as much as our fans appreciate you and your insight. And um, I'll, I'll be the first to say, I, I hope we can do this again moving forward and, you know, through spring practice and heading into fall camp. And uh, we'll hope we have some good news via some announcements here in the coming weeks. And I'm sure you and I will talk about the uh, OC hire that's coming. Yeah. If you want to do a show uh, going forward about the OC hire, we can certainly do that too. Parker, one final uh, super chat before I go, would I will look at Alex Golesh for head coach. Uh, is he mean OC? Who's Alex Golesh? Fill me in, Don. I forget. I'm not sure. I don't know him personally. He is the, let's see, uh, according to Google, he is the head football coach at USF. He was previously the OC and tight ends coach at Tennessee. Um, he does not have a history coaching quarterbacks based on what I'm seeing. He's a tight ends guy, it appears. Um, and he is the head coach at South Florida. I don't, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Don, but he's probably not leaving South Florida as a head coach to be an OC at Iowa, right? Is that fair? I wouldn't think. And I don't know what his background is. I don't know that he would be very qualified to be the OC anyway. Well, he wasn't. So, so this is something I didn't realize. He was actually the tight ends coach at Iowa State from 2016 to 2019. I did not realize that. Um, so he was involved with the Matt Campbell tenure, and uh, let's see. so he was involved with the tight end success they had there. Charlie Kolar, Chase Allen, and those guys. So he's got Iowa connections, but uh, he was tight ends coach at Iowa State. So how long has he been a play caller then? Uh, it looks like he was the OC at Tennessee from 21 to 22. And now he's at, at South Florida. That's about the extent of his play calling. I think. Okay. Oh. Well, let's back up. You said 21 and 22 at Tennessee. Yep. And he was I also, thought Josh, he was, he I, thought was Josh Hyper was, I thought Hyper was the play caller. Oh, you could be, you're probably right. If, if, if Hyper was a play caller, then, you're probably right on that, that uh, yeah. Alex was probably not calling plays, but he was the OC during that two-year stint. He was co-OC at Central Florida in 2020, um, and now he's at South Florida. So is he calling plays down there? Probably not. He's not a, a former quarterbacks coach. He is a tight ends guy, and he played – see, where did he play? 
Um, I don't see where he played. Um, it says his alma mater was Ohio State, but I, I don't remember him. Is he a coaching coach? No, no offense to Parker. He's a guy that's worthy of consideration, but he wouldn't be on my final list. He's simply not very proven as a play caller. He was born in Moscow, though, Don. Moscow, Idaho? <laughs> Moscow, Russia, Don. <laughs> so, anyways, does that help us, cause? Um, Erica says, uh, Hayden Fry, or excuse me, a Hayden Hawkeye hangout to talk about Fry's legacy. We'll have to do that at some point. And, Don, uh, Erica reminds me, we, we need to get a story about Hayden. Can we get one final uh, Hayden story before we log off? I'll give you one quick story. Okay. This is um, a game at Minnesota. Might have been year one. I can't recall if it was year one, year two. It was early. Uh, the head coach for Minnesota was a guy named Joe Salem. Smokey Joe Salem, they called him. And um, it's either in 79 or 80, I would think. But after we won that game, to our surprise, Coach Fry showed up for the press conference afterward dressing as a farmer would dress. He had on a flannel shirt and um, – some overalls and a straw hat with a, with a straw in his mouth. Uh, just to prove, I think maybe they'd suggested that we were a bunch of hayseeds from Iowa. And uh, Hayden accepted Floyd of Rosedale dressed like um, uh, Mr. Green Jeans or, or Farmer in the Dell or whatever. Old something. McDonald. <laughs> Old McDonald. There you go. Old McDonald. Uh, and the media thought it was pretty funny, but that just proves – Hayden did have a sense of humor, and he uh, he demonstrated it that night when we beat the Gophers and captured the pig, or recaptured the pig, whatever the case might be. Uh, so I think that was pretty neat that he would show that kind of uh, humor. Hayden always did say, never let a day go by where you don't find something to laugh about. And Hayden did a good job of subscribing to that philosophy, and I like to think I've gotten that done too. Absolutely. And I think I got everybody's thanks. If I put you up on the screen, that's my way of saying uh, thank you for the compliments, the the kind words. Um, I know everybody really appreciative of, of you being here, Don. And, uh, um, you know, I hope that uh, I offer something to the show, but but you are the star here. Parker adds uh, he called plays for 20. He says he called plays uh, okay. 22 and 23 for USF at the number one offense with Heupel's offense in uh, 22 took. USF from one eleven to seven and six in year one, using Heupel's offense as the play con playbook. I'm guessing. Um, yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't discount it. I just you know Iowa does need somebody that can coach quarterbacks. I think. yeah, I don't know. Again, like you say, if he's the head coach at South Florida, what are the odds we can attract him anyway? Uh, it sounds like yeah, it might he, left, be. he left Tennessee to be the. <laughs> He left Tennessee to be the head coach at USF. So uh, he's making two point five million. Um, see he's not going. I don't see him going to Iowa and, and being an OC. But whatever, worth considering. <laughs> Salu Kim, thank you for being here. Um, same thing with Fred. Fred uh, ends this nicely for us. Thanks for being part of the from the Hawkeye of the Storm family, Coach P. See you next season. Um, Donna, good. thank you. I would uh, I give you my farewells, but uh, you and I are friends, and so where it's not like this is going to end our our relationship. But uh, um, I'll miss doing these shows with you. So don't be a stranger. We hope that we'll do a show uh, once you get an offensive coordinator hire. I'm sure people want to get your perspective on the hire, whoever that is. We'll look forward to doing that and uh, stay well. Get some soup or whatever you got in the burner tonight, and uh, enjoy some football. Enjoy the the semifinal game, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. That sounds good, Corey. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, folks, for Coach Don Patterson, I'm Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Reminder, if you're interested in sponsoring our postgame coverage with Coach Gary Close, email me from the eye of the storm at outlook.com. You can also donate to this show in the description. There are links for PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, etc. And please, on your way out, hit the like button. It does help. Have a great night.